I'll discuss about now monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And for the interest, uh, you know, we'll revise these definitions. What do we mean when we say monomorphic ventricular tachycardia? Beat to beat, the QRS morphology is same in a given lead. Polymorphic VT, Yash showed uh, good examples. Beat to beat, QRS morphology varies in a given lead. In that particular lead, it keeps on varying. There is another terminology which we've been using pleomorphic VT. Pleomorphic VT is a term used when you have monomorphic VT, but multiple different morphologies of monomorphic VT. So they're essentially monomorphic VT, but not one, multiple of them. Uh, recurrent ventricular tachycardia. So we talk of recurrent ventricular tachycardia because it's recurring and it may happen either with or without uh, treatment that has been given. Incisant ventricular tachycardia is a continuous VT going on, and that may go on in some patients for hours, days, and weeks altogether. And finally, the term VT storm. VT storm is used when you have two or more VTs in 24-hour period, which are hemodynamically unstable, and often they would require electric cardioversion. So this is a, a, a classic ECG of a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. The, Rate is very, very rapid. It's more than 220 beats a minute. But if you look any given lead, if you look in lead one, uh, the QRS morphology from beat to beat remains the same, and the same is the case in different leads. So don't compare between leads, but in a given lead, if the morphology is the same uh, for a long period of time. And that's what Yash said, that sometimes polymorphic VT and monomorphic VT are confusing. So you don't need to see only three, four beats, but you see a longer period of time and you'll realize that this is polymorphic as opposed to monomorphic, which will not change over a longer period of time also. I think the best way of managing these uh, tachycardias is to understand the clinical scenarios in which it can occur. So Monomorphic VT, the clinical scenario would be either it can occur in patients with structural heart disease, without structural heart disease, we call it the idiopathic variety, and there are certain specific uh, type of VTs. The most common being structural heart disease, ischemic heart disease tops the list, so those who have scarred myocardium, old infarction, a monomorphic VT arising from that scarred myocardium is most common. Non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy also tend to have scars and lead to monomorphic VT. We have had good discussion about how to identify, and I'll uh, talk about it on the basis of the ECG presentation also, the infiltrative variety of cardiomyopathy, sarcoid and tuberculosis, uh, they also present with monomorphic VT, and often they are the ones, they may have multiple varieties of monomorphic, and they have pleomorphic ventricular tachycardia hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy. Now, in absence of structural heart disease, when you have ruled out structural heart disease, not only by an echocardiogram, and often these days in doubtful cases, we do a cardiac MR to rule out structural heart disease. And if none were present, then outflow tract VT, uh, either from the right ventricle, which is well known, but uncommonly also from the left ventricle, uh, these VTs can be monomorphic in nature. The fascicular VT or idiopathic left ventricular tachycardia, and then there are newer varieties which we are learning now, papillary muscle VT or a mitral annular VT. The specific variety being the bundle branch uh, VT, etc. Now, in terms of drug therapy of uh, acute uh, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, obviously we use amiodarone, and if that's not effective or hemodynamically unstable, we'll do cardio over these patients. And when you have recurrence of these monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, don't forget about using overdrive pacing. So you are giving drug, but there's a recurrence of the tachycardia happening. Uh, you can, in your small nursing home, ICU setting, also use overdrive pacing. I think one important concept in terms of uh, recurrence of ventricular tachycardia or a drug failure when amiodarone is being used is that amiodarone takes time to act. So you may give a 150 milligram bolus over 10 minutes, you may repeat the bolus in a person with ventricular tachycardia, but yet the VT may slow down but not terminate, or even if it terminates after a few hours or a day or two, it may recur. So that does not mean that amiodarone is ineffective. 
this is a recurrent vt but not because of an ineffective amiodarone but inadequate amiodaronization so there is this concept of amiodaronization which needs to be understood that means in an adult patient nearly 6 to 8 grams of amiodarone needs to go in the system for it to have its full effect on a long lasting basis and therefore you may have recurrences in the acute phases when you are uh, loading the patient with amiodarone because in a day up to 1.2 grams to 1.6 grams is the max which you can use uh, to avoid the side effects now what is the role of lignocaine as far as you know recurrences of these uh, 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 monomorphic ventricular tachycardia happening now lignocaine is a good drug for acute termination when vt occurs in the setting of acute ischemia but most often in acute ischemia it is going to be polymorphic in nature only 30% of monomorphic ventricular tachycardia will respond to lignocaine so unfortunately as far as intravenous drugs for ventricular tachycardia is concerned we have very limited uh, number of drugs we use uh, either amiodarone or lignocaine procainamide is a good drug unfortunately not available to us so uh, only few of them will respond to lignocaine i think uh, in terms of recurrent monomorphic ventricular tachycardia when amiodarone is also being used adding lignocaine to amiodarone does make sense and is effective in some of these patients so often a combination of amiodarone lignocaine may be used in these recurrent monomorphic ventricular tachycardia often we use also beta blocker as a earlier choice now this is what i wanted to show you that you have a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia going on and if on amiodarone on drugs there are these recurrences happening in the acute setting you should consider in terms of overdrive pacing so when you have a monomorphic vt which because of the antiarrhythmic drug because of the amiodarone has now slowed down a bit so slower monomorphic ventricular tachycardia do respond very well to overdrive pacing so you can pace the ventricle at a rate faster than the uh, vt rate and it will terminate and get into sinus rhythm so this is, allows you time for the drug to build up and have a complete efficacy by which time you can solve the primary problem also if there's any so uh, amiodarone tends to be the most uh, default drug especially when you have recurrences of uh, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia is most uh, superior to uh, as compared to other antiarrhythmic drugs limited tool we have lignocaine and when lignocaine works mexilitine is a oral analog of uh, lignocaine so to say and therefore you could use mexilitine beta blockers should be used more or less in all patients with ventricular tachycardia because most of them are with structural heart disease and uh, lv dysfunction ischemic heart disease and it works very well uh, in the long run to have a reduction in mortality but yes acutely also it in combination with amiodarone and lignocaine it helps to cool down the arrhythmias sotlol is another drug that could be used but uh, you need to be very careful in terms of monitoring it because qt prolongation is a problem so sotlol is underutilized but uh, you need to be careful i think the specific use of sotlol would be in patients with arrhythmogenic rv cardiomyopathy where it's been studied to be more effective and uh, a combination of all these drugs are often have to be used but in this combination don't use a combination of amiodarone and sotlol together together they can be lethal in terms of qt prolongation and bradycardia and may promote proarrhythmias and of course i'll discuss a little bit more about the disease specific drug so i think underlying reason for the monomorphic vt is equally important to identify what sort of therapy you should be using and uh, often what happens is when you have this ventricular tachycardia the first question comes up that let's do an angiogram would it require revascularization so few uh, thoughts about it one is that it is a reasonable thing to work up for ischemia in all abnormal hearts and poor ejection fraction and when you have especially polymorphic vt acute ischemia causing the vt is very likely in such situation clinical scenario of uh, acute coronary syndrome unstable angina understood but when vt terminates or you have terminated the vt and then you start getting t wave inversion and to use those t wave inversion as a marker of ischemia is wrong often it's a memory sign and not a sign of ischemia the other thing is monomorphic vt ashish spoke about it in the morning that monomorphic vt 
you may do an angiogram you may find coronary artery disease which is significant you may consider doing a revascularization but the revascularization is not going to correct the monomorphic vt because monomorphic vt comes from a scar polymorphic vt comes from ischemia revascularization helps polymorphic vt revascularization will not help monomorphic vt if he requires revascularization go ahead and do it because the long term outcome of that patient will be good and better but that monomorphic vt will require treatment so often they will require icd and uh, revascularization let me uh, give you some examples of uh, patients so this is a, a relatively young pediatrician who had a early mi had cabg ef is known to be 30% or so and has monomorphic ventricular tachycardia was put on amiodarone and beta blockers uh, as a drug of uh, this and had been looked into his coronary status and everything was okay and he comes with recurrence of ventricular tachycardia despite being on amiodarone and beta blockers so these are the drugs which often we use monomorphic ventricular tachycardia has come with recurrence what choices do we have are we going to increase the dose of amiodarone most are maintenance is 200 mg in the western world often between 2 to 400 mg they used to use as a maintenance dose should we increase amiodarone should we add another antiarrhythmic drug like sotlol we said whether that can be done or should we consider an icd implant or should it be radio frequency ablation so these are the options we have and as i told you a combination of amiodarone and sotlol is lethal it can cause significant qt prolongation should be avoided uh, in all circumstances and therefore i think the logical choice in a person with low ef is that he should have an icd implant we know that he has a recurrence vt he knew he's on antiarrhythmic drugs icd would be the correct choice not during the vt storm if a person has a vt storm you have to definitely quieten the storm and then consider but otherwise icd is your default choice and more and more we have realized that radio frequency ablation in these monomorphic vt which are relatively slow hemodynamically tolerated can be effectively controlled by our ablation tools and techniques uh 3d mapping electroanatomic mapping being able to go into the scar area identify those uh, live cells within these scarred myocardium by various uh, electrophysiological techniques do help us to eliminate these sorts of vt so we have a low threshold of doing rf ablation for such kind of monomorphic vt and narsimhan gave an entire overview on recurrent icd shocks so i won't spend time there but yes uh, when you have recurrent icd shocks the most important thing is to probably program the icd appropriately that is the key program the icd properly then get into appropriate medications amiodarone mexalidine beta blocker these are the commonest combination you have to uh, take care of the underlying ischemia or any other trigger there is and then we have a low threshold for performing radio frequency ablation in this patients let me show you an example of a patient who is uh, middle aged and has uh, near uh, just hypertension so mild lvh uh, normal ejection fraction on a stress test he had a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia he was extensively investigated his angiogram was normal his uh, normal angio presentation is a ventricular tachycardia and therefore he got a cardiac mr also done and at that time didn't pick up anything cardiac mr was normal so we thought of doing an ep study and in the ep study we could clearly induce uh, a monomorphic vt so some of these monomorphic vts in the initial phases of the disease are really hard to give a diagnosis or a label but we could find multiple morphologies of very rapid hemodynamically unstable monomorphic ventricular tachycardia we decided to implant an icd he gets a single chamber icd implanted a few weeks later he comes with recurrent icd shocks when he comes with recurrent icd shocks an ecg is taken and this is what it shows it shows this small polymorphic runs that is happening the device is detecting it appropriately and shocking uh, and getting back to sinus rhythm but there are these recurrence of icd shocks happening and therefore you need to find out why is this recurrence happening and that becomes very important uh, to manage this patient and uh, unfortunately he came with 15 shocks in 2 hours time and the choice was uh, 
to step up the dose of amiodarone, use another antiasthmic drug, is there a role of radio frequency ablation? But simple things, looking at the ECG, he, he was already on amiodarone. On the ECG, you see QT prolongation, could be because of amiodarone, but you need to work up further. We found that the serum potassium was significantly low, triggering the PVCs and the ventricular tachycardia. And in fact, on a further workup, found that urinary potassium was high and there was uh, serum aldosterone was raised. He had probably something like an hyperaldosteronism happening, and that was probably because of some interstitial nephritis. On putting him on a higher dose of aldactone and getting his potassium between 4.5 and 5 did the trick and he did not have arrhythmias for uh, many years altogether. So there is an underlying substrate, but there was this trigger which happened, which led to recurrences of VT. We should always look at these triggers and try to address them appropriately. So this is an example of a young lady who actually presented to the gastroenterologist with ascites and edema feet and was being worked up. And that's where the resident saw that the pulse is too rapid. So they decided to do an ECG. And this is what the ECG shows. ECG shows heart rate of almost 150, 160, uh, wide QRS, and the question kept on happening whether it's a SVT versus VT. But uh, obviously when you have a right bundle branch block like morphology, but a left axis deviation and not a typical RBBB pattern, you should think in terms of VT and you could even identify the AV dissociation here. So it was a monomorphic VT. Uh, the patient was given IV amiodarone. It slowed down the rate. The monomorphic VT became more uh, hemodynamically tolerable. But uh, eventually, uh, cardioversion did help to convert into sinus rhythm, but the QT had got markedly prolonged and the amiodarone had to be withdrawn. As soon as the amiodarone was withdrawn, the VT would recur back. So then what was our option? And uh, just to show that this patient was in this VT for almost a couple of months, that's how it presented with right ventricular failure, right heart failure. And if you look at the ECG more carefully, you would realize I spoke about the VT morphology and uh, this VT morphology, RBBB looking like left axis deviation, you know, pattern recognition is important. So this could be an idiopathic left ventricular fascicular VT, which responds very well to uh, radio frequency ablation. We took up for ablation, one week post ablation, sinus rhythm completely normal, and this was a tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy because of a ventricular tachycardia. So tachycardiomyopathy can occur with atrial fibrillation and rapid VR most common, but many of the VTs, not only atrial arrhythmias, but many of the VTs also can cause tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. Post-MI, again, we had had a discussion uh, about post-MI, revascularization is most important, but in some patients, a scar happens frequently. Again, to revise, if you have a tachycardia of this nature, monomorphic VT, scar-related. If you have a polymorphic related arrhythmia, sh short QT, ischemia related or it electrolyte imbalance related, management strategy would differ in these two things. For physicians, you know, when VT and LV dysfunction, hypotension, often inotropes are being used. And there is a study being done, what inotrope to use to maintain the blood pressure and clearly between norepinephrine and dopamine, noradrenaline is a better choice than dopamine because it's more arrhythmogenic and the VTs tend to recur. So borderline hemodynamics, you need to use a, a drug for maintaining blood pressure, norad would be a better choice. Often these post-MI patients will require ICD or RF ablation. In the acute phases, why is this moratorium period of 30 days, 40 days post-MI? Uh, and that's because you have not only arrhythmic deaths, but myocardial rupture. Shantanu showed some ventricular septal rupture, but you can have myocardial rupture and sudden death happening in that early period also. So you need to allow those things to cool down. But yes, in early recurrent monomorphic VT, radio frequency ablation can be done. I think I'll sum up with this last example uh, of a patient who presents with a 
uh, ventricular tachycardia. And if you look at the QRS morphology, he is not known to have any structural heart disease, does not fit into a, any typical idiopathic variety of ventricular tachycardia. One would think outflow tract VT, but the 2-3 AVF are not tall R waves. So it's not a RVOT outflow tract VT. Clearly, after amiodron, he converts. There are a few PVCs being there. And what would you do? His echo is completely normal. He has no cardiovascular coronary risk factors as such. Uh, would you, uh, all these things are thought of. And as I said, that off late, we have a low threshold for subjecting these patients who on echo appear to be normal, no coronary risk factors, no ECG changes of ischemia to subject for cardiac MR or CT. And the cardiac MR and PET CT clearly showed that he had sarcoidosis. There was a sarcoid and on the EP study, we could even see multiple morphologies. So this is a classic example. One morphology of monomorphic VT moving on to another morphology of monomorphic VT. So this is what we club together as a pleomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And often we knew the biopsy of the lymph node needs to be done to identify whether it's tuberculosis or sarcoid. Both are uh, equally common in our country. And then uh, immunosuppressants help uh, sarcoid patients and anti-tubercular treatment helps tuberculosis patient. And this is uh, a large uh, granulomatous cardiomyopathy registry which we published in IPEJ just a few months ago telling us uh, their presentations. And fortunately, all of them had presented with ventricular tachycardia, but uh, there were equal number of patients with sarcoid and few uh, with tuberculosis also. This group of patients improved with anti-tubercular treatment and these required immunosuppressive therapy. And... Uh, they tend to have multiple recurrences of VT. They tend to have multiple morphologies of VT. And in the time course of uh, suppression of their VT, after starting the disease-specific drugs, so in the acute phase, you need the immunosuppressants. You need prednisolone. You need methylprednisolone and cyclophosphamide and azathioprine often being used uh, to quieten down the storm and eventually get, along with antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, reasonable control. So to sum up, uh, I think uh, recurrence of uh, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, amiodarone beta blocker, lignocaine, mexilitine, common combination, use in the acute setting overdrive pacing, appropriate programming of ICD is required, disease-specific drugs may be required in the infiltrative variety of VTs, putting them into deep sedation, uh, sympathetic drives, blunting is important. RF ablation is the next step which needs to be thought of in those recurrent monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. has a good result when you have a single morphology, idiopathic variety of VTs, and an ischemic scar VT. And those who continue to have recurrence of VTs and uh, significantly compromise LV function, sympathetic denervation, or even a cardiac transplant may be uh, th thought of. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Now... You know, these, these are not very common diseases. Sarcoid is much more common than we think about, think of, but, but they are not very common. How, is there any clinical difference between the presentation of tuberculosis versus sarcoid? That is one. I mean, and, and number two, um, if there are no lymph nodes anywhere, um, do you do myocardial biopsy or just empirically treat them with drugs? So, I, as you know, in our large series, which we reported of 55 patients, actually uh, they presented with ventricular tachycardia. And that's how we saw. So, if you see the systemic involvement of the granulomatous nature was not there in most of the patients. So, th they did not clinically manifest as any clinic other um, uh, non-cardiac uh, symptoms at all. It is only when these uh, imaging was done, there are few patients where we found that there was a uh, extra cardiac involvement also. So as far as tuberculosis is concerned, we had 15 patients with, uh, you know, tuberculosis as the diagnosis and the diagnosis was obtained histologically. So this was all biopsy patients. So we did not do endomyocardial biopsy. I mean, it's technically difficult and challenging to do the endomyocardial biopsy. So our Protocol has been that if a person with presence with ventricular tachycardia and it looks like an atypical morphology and a normal, near normal echo, we do cardiac MR which tells us that this could be an infiltrative pattern and often it is complemented by a chest CT or a PET CT which picks up lymph nodes anywhere in the body. And that's how it becomes easy to do a lymph node biopsy. So most of the diagnosis which we achieved was from a lymph node biopsy. Some of them were media channel, but 
the others were from elsewhere also. So axillary and neck cervical lymph nodes were very common. So as far as the tubercular patients were concerned, they did not have any extra cardiac symptom. Their only presentation was ventricular tachycardia. Maybe these are very filtered patients, but the, the tubercular granuloma was only in the myocardium. And then they did very well. So anti-tubercular treatment starting in them helped to reduce the VT recurrences over a period of time that many of these patients eventually after the course of anti-tubercular treatment, we used to do earlier only stress test and a holter to see the recurrence in absence of the clinical uh, recurrence. But even in some EP study to identify whether the VT was inducible because they presented with VT and they were not inducible. So the tubercular patients did well. So, so most of these patients presented with VT. That's present very important to remember. Yeah. So if you see a patient with sustained monomorphic VT who has the normal echo, before labeling him as a case of primary electrical disease, yes. get some imaging, yes. either MR or FDG PET. What do you prefer, MR or FDG so PET? So the, 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 you know, as was discussed very rightly, that these two tests are complementary. Uh, MR generally is able to tell us more about the scarring business. Now, if you have picked up a patient in the acute phases and acute inflammation is what you want to look at, then you probably consider doing a PET CT. So we often in these patients, when they are in that atypical uh, VT morphology, we do CRP, we do ESR, and if, try to find out are there inflammatory, active inflammation going on. If there's any suggestion of an active inflammation, we would prefer a PET CT to be done first. But otherwise, most would get a cardiac MR. Scar burden is identified. The fact they have VT, they probably have a scar. They already have formed a scar. But there are few in the active phase of granuloma, not much scarring, but also present with ventricular tachycardia. So that's the way we approach it. Yeah. I am a physician practice, practicing at a remote area. I am treating a lot of snake bites, scorpion stings. In after vascular toxic snake bite, we have seen VT, VF, infarction, sudden cardiac arrest, tachybrady. Recently, one great bite patient had a torsic. I took help of Dr. Ajit Bhagwat sir. She was treated with uh, treatment is antidote plus magnesium. Such kind of fatal arrhythmias can occur after scorpion sting also because of channelopathies. So in rural setting, so the cause of uh, such fetal arrhythmia can be a toxin, just an addition. So my question to both of cardiologists is, I had a one patient, he was 50, he had a Russell Viper bite, he had a coagulopathy, he was bleeding, we poured ASV, had a massive anaphylaxis, was treated, he developed infarction, he had a VF, he was a defibrillated. There was no question of thrombolysis. Not a single cardiologist was ready to touch the patient. What should be done? I also need to learn uh, from you that Aj because Ajit, you, sir. you are the one who managed no, actually, Dr. Dilip Punde has probably the maximum experience of treating snake bite patients in the entire country. He probably wow. must have treated how many patients? 8,000. About wow. 8,000 patients. So, I mean, we need to call him whenever, and he can now diagnose which snake it is from <laughs> just history and looking at the, the bite mark. I mean, he's, a different, he's in a different league, but, but the case he, which he's alluding to was a great bite. Yes. And there was a sustained, uh, you know, recurrent. Yes. Polymorphic VT. And, uh, you know, <laughs> doing pacing at his place was difficult. Not so possible. Huh? What were not possible. So we, I just said, you know, potassium and magnesium, only two things. And we gave him very high dose magnesium. Yes, yes. Sir. And after high dose magnesium, surprisingly, uh, it, just, it just stopped. I don't know whether it's just coincidence or so magnesium. So generally with uh, sir, score, That score is a toxin related. That is because of toxin. Yeah. So but toxinology can be a cause for this fatal arrhythmias. Probably, yes, yes. No, no, I think that's very true. So drive is very, very high. And uh, the high sympathetic drive leads to, you know, there might be some underlying uh, 
we don't know silent uh, genetic problem which makes some of them prone to developing these problems but in i think the lesson of the story is that if you have uh, polymorphic vt uncontrolled vt empirically use of magnesium trying to correct the potassium and keep it at five level uh, seeing to it that acidosis is corrected these are the gross principles sometimes i have uh, considered using lignocaine i think pacing is uh, probably the next thing but pacing generally is when there is associated bradycardia most of these poisoning patients have tachycardia so that also may not be required yes, sir. Just, okay just yeah a, just a, just a comment in decide drugs and few months back we had after covid there were many patients in pediatrics adults cough 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 where adenovirus was suspected in those cases also we started using adenovirus genomics and that is available and in critical care setup nowadays uh, before culture also they are giving pathogen uh, on genomics so just an addition if uh, slowly it, it, it is being used to many critical set care setups in cardiology also if you have atypical infections or differentiation from you know sarcoid like or something like you can use of uh, genomics thank you Thank you. Pepper is a very rare in Maharashtra. It is very common, but in Bhima Shankar area, there yes. are some patches where you have malaria and pit vipers. And this pit viper venom is supposed to be very cardiotoxic. It leads to a myocarditis and a VT storm. We have seen few cases in Sasun when I was doing my residency, and also crate poisoning also has certain amount of pit uh, viper is not in Maratwada. That is in hmm. some part of that Sahyadri. Yes, Sahyadri, correct. But that is a more common in Himachal. And, and, and there is a no anti snake venom for pit viper, Absolutely but Russell not. viper itself can cause a lot of arrhythmias yes. because venom contains cardiotoxin, neurotoxin, vasculotoxin, lot hundred toxins. Thank you. We'll go to the next talk yeah. now. Yeah. I think we'll move on to the next talk. Uh, this next talk is by Dr. Rajesh Dopeshwarkar sir from Pune uh, about uh, mitral valve prolapse and early repolarization. For this really nice session, and uh, with all those really lovely lectures and ECGs, uh, which bring in kindle that interest in ECG and entire electrocardiology in us, so I'm very happy to be here. Do I have a slide changer? This one. Okay. So I have I have a mixed topic. One is a structural topic, and other is a electrical topic, but both of them are very common. So, uh, both mitral valve prolapse as well as early repolarization syndrome is something which uh, we see almost every day. And uh, most of the times we pass them off as another normal entity and really don't worry about it. So, the question here is, huh. question is, are they really benign? That's, that's the topic. Moves from here. Huh. So, MVP we all know was basically a term coined in 1966 by Barlow. It was also known as Barlow syndrome or floppy mitral valve. So earlier days I remember when everybody would get a diagnosis of MVP. Anybody who comes in for echo, they'll get a diagnosis of MVP. So any mitral leaflet which gets pushed a little bit backwards or a concavity it would be labeled as MVP. But later on as MVP diagnosis and diagnostic criteria were established, then we found that the real prevalence of MVP in general population is not so much, maybe about 2 or 3 percent and that to really market MVP is even lesser than that. So how do we classify or diagnose MVP is the most important thing which all echocardiographers must, must know is that the mitral valve should cross the annular plane by 2 millimeters. So whatever uh, concavity is there, it should be more than 2 millimeters beyond the mitral valve annulus towards the atrium. And then you classify it as classic or non-classic depending upon the thickness of the mitral valve leaflets, whether it is single leaflet or bi-leaflet. And then finally, rarely we get flail mitral valve leaflets also. And then mitral valve prolapse syndrome where you get symptoms which are very atypical. This is a very common thing, palpitations, chest pain, dyspnea, exercise intolerance, dizziness, they're all lean body habitus. So some of them do also have MVP and the symptoms may be related to MVP. But in a real sense, most of the times this MVP stays benign. 
and a real problem with NV MVP happens only when there is mitral regurgitation that is of a severe entity. So whenever there is severe MR, then severe MR and severe MR related problems are bound to be there and that forms a major chunk of morbidity and mortality related to MVP. That, let us clarify that for the first. And then there is a low risk of ventricular arrhythmias or sudden cardiac death. The main issues with mitral uh, valve prolapse is if there is MR, then we should not forget advising them infective endocarditis prophylaxis. And there's not much evidence about increased stroke also with mitral valve prolapse. Now, what kind of arrhythmias do we get? We get all kinds of arrhythmias. You get atrial ectopics, ventricular ectopics, sometimes couplets, and even ventricular or complex ventricular ectopics also. And it is especially common if these uh, patients have more of mitral regurgitation. So more the mitral regurgitation, it is said that P, uh, MVP with moderate to severe MR, the incidence of atrial fibrillation is about 10 to 15 percent also. So the entire arrhythmia spectrum changes as the mitral regurgitation increases. Now this is what actually brought in, uh, attention to sudden cardiac arrest in the setting of mitral valve prolapse where people thought that oh, why is somebody dying suddenly and in a series of autopsy patients they found that the incidence of mitral valve prolapse was anywhere from 2% to 25%. So huge difference and whether that was responsible was being thought. So how is it that mitral valve prolapse can lead to ventricular premature beats or ventricular arrhythmias? This is a thought which would come to anybody's mind. So generally thought about pathophysiology is what whenever the valve strains there will be a strain or a physical pull of the uh, on the papillary muscles and that mechanical strain can lead to a lot of electrical changes which can give rise to ectopics. So structurally if you see that there is if there is bileaflet mitral valve prolapse or if the uh, there is an elongated valve, if the cord are stretched or there is cordal rupture, especially if there is flail valves, then the mortality is very high. There is a very new term which probably a lot of us have heard only recently which is called mitral annular dis disjunction and which we will we'll look at it shortly and a uh, term which goes along with that mitral annular disjunction is mitral annular hypermobility or curling in which the annulus itself moves a lot during systole. Now, it is said that uh, on the ventricular part with mitral regurgitation the ventricles will dilate and that itself can give rise to ventricular arrhythmias. If there is ventricular dysfunction we all know that sudden death risk is also more. And that forms the prior, uh, predominant reason why MVP related MRs can have sudden cardiac arrest. So the question here is really not that subset but that subset where MVP is mild there is not uh, sorry, MVP is not so much, the MR is not so much and yet is there any risk for sudden cardiac death? And here the question comes is where there is mechanical stress on papillary muscle and a marked mitral valve prolapse can produce so much stress that it has been found that inferobasal papillary muscles there is a lot of fibrosis that is seen at the base of the papillary muscles and in the myocardium as well. So this is an example of how uh, mitral valve prolapse both on MRI and autopsy would show that there is delayed enhancement on MRI with wherever the papillary muscle is inserted and around that papillary muscle area in the inferobasal region. And it is verified on autopsy specimens, histopathology specimens of the myocardium as well. Now we come to this next terminology which is mitral annular dis disjunction. So we all, there is an observation that MVP is associated with uh, sudden cardiac arrest in whatever observational autopsy studies. There is also a very clear association of fibrosis that is there in the myocardium, in the inferior myocardium where the posterior leaflet is attached. So ha having said that now this term called mitral annular disjunction has come in which uh, we have a pointer here. Ah, yeah. So you can see that generally this is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle and you have a mitral valve here. And all the three will actually combine at one point. Whereas wherever there is mitral annular disjunction, you will find that you can see on the right side of the picture, there is a white arrow which shows that there is a gap between the mitral valve and the ventricle. That is called mitral annular disjunction. And that particular gap will lead to excessive mobility of the mitral valve which is called curling. And that itself can give rise to a lot of mechanical stress 
both on the mitral valve apparatus and the papillary muscle. This leads to two things and that is what this is on echocardiographically also where on the left side there is no mitral valve disjunction and on the right side there is mitral valve disjunction. So this is a new term for us to understand and uh, how do you diagnose it uh, on a echo as well as on MRI. And it is said that the prevalence of mitral valve disjunction in patients who have MVP is variable anywhere from 5-10% to 90% depending upon which studies we are looking at. Now this mitral valve disjunction has been thought to be a contributor to ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death in patients who have uh, mitral valve prolapse. And how does that happen is that that excessive strain on that mitral valve apparatus which often gives rise to that mid-systolic click. So whenever we get mitral valve prolapse and we hear that click, it is essentially that strain that is happening on the mitral valve apparatus. It leads to mechanical strain as well as degeneration of the mitral valve apparatus. That degeneration of mitral valve apparatus leads to progressive MR and eventually will need, need to be addressed on a longer term basis. But on a short term, term basis, the hypertrophy and fibrosis that forms that can be a structural substrate for ventricular arrhythmias. And there is also some evidence that, like the Purkinje fiber ectopics that we see in and around ischemia or peri ischemia, the Purkinje fiber ectopy also has been postulated to be causing sudden cardiac death in this particular subset of patients. And there is an echocardiographic or tissue Doppler sign, which is called a Pickelhop sign, which has been uh, used to diagnose more malignant form of mitral valve prolapse. For all those echocardiographers who do it regularly, you can do a um, uh, tissue Doppler on the lateral, lateral mitral annulus and look for the peak velocity. And if that peak velocity is high, then it is said to be Pickelhoff sign. Now, this is a very interesting uh, study which has come off only a couple of years back. Uh, observational study of over 10 years. And why is it interesting is that it has looked at about 600 patients out of which uh, 200 patients who had mitral valve prolapse and the rest of them were controls. And they found that over a period of 10 years, the incidence of mitral valve uh, uh, prolapse in the presence of mitral annular disjunction, the ventricular arrhythmias were high. But the survival was no different with the presence of mitral annular disjunction. So at least over a 10 year period, we just need to counsel, observe these people, who, even if they have mitral valve, uh, mitral annular disjunction, although the ventricular arrhythmia incidence is high. So this study found that the overall prevalence of mitral annular disjunction was 31%. So about 168 or 170 of this population of 600 had mitral annular disjunction. They found that the myxomatous degeneration was more severe in this subset. There were more arrhythmic events though. The survival over a 10 year period was not di uh, different. That is a little reassuring for us. They had larger uh, left ventricular size though similar levels of mitral regurgitation. So a very, very important study. So once in a while we may find patients who actually present in with syncopal symptoms, pre-syncopal symptoms and have mitral valve prolapse along with mitral annular disjunction. And what do we do for these people? So if they have sustained ventricular arrhythmias, then they definitely need treatment with ICDs. So any sustained ventricular arrhythmias giving rise to syncope in association with mitral valve prolapse need uh, defibrillator treatment as a secondary prophylaxis, although just frequent ecto ectopy right now the only treatment is symptomatic management with beta blockers. So the general way in which we risk stratify remains the same. You do clinical examination, you do physical examination. If there is a click then that would point out to a more stronger mitral valve prolapse or mitral annular disjunction. You look at 12 lead ECG now we find that a lot of these people will have non-specific STT changes which do not really mean anything and can be found in normal population also. Anybody who gets PVCs maybe has to be evaluated on a holter to check if there are more complex PVCs and need to be really monitored more carefully. Obviously echocardiography to specifically look for mitral annular disjunction now that we know is very very important and uh, all these patients who really have a lot of ectopy should be evaluated with my uh, uh, MRI, cardiac MR. There is very little role of EP study in this particular setting where you have mitral valve prolapse, mitral annular disjunction because the ability to reproduce sustained arrhythmias in non-sustained arrhythmias is very low in published studies. Management, as I said, is symptomatic. Give beta blockers and ICD for primary prevention. There is no real data for that. 
Catheter ablation, again, there is no solid data, only uh, case studies or case reports are there. And um, now there, there is always a thought whether mitral valve surgery, whether it is repair or replacement and what you would do if they have mitral annular disjunction, which one is better. Again, there is no, no published data on that, whether mitral valve replacement or mitral valve repair is better and whether they would have a real impact on arrhythmias. So this is as much about uh, summary about mitral valve prolapse. What we should remember is that atrial, both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias are prevalent in the presence of mitral valve prolapse. The risk of sudden death appears to be vary in severity in relation to the mitral regurgitation itself. There is not much role for EP study in this setting. And secondary prevention ICD is definitely indicated in this subset of patients. So if there is any question I like to take questions on this and then I'll just go quickly for the other topic because they, they are quite distinct topics. So any questions I'd like to take it. Yeah, it was an interesting topic, a nice talk. Uh, just a comment on this, you know, many times in practice what you see is patient comes to a cardiologist or a physician with PVCs. Then the reflex reaction is, well, let me do his echo whether he has PVC, whether he has MVP. And then he does an echo and gives a diagnosis of mitral valve prolapse. Then the patient runs from post to pillar, thinking that he has rhythm problem, not only rhythm problem, but he has one problem also. <laughs> when in fact, both the problems are not really significant. Mm. So I think this entity is important, there is no question, but it is sometimes blown out of proportion. Uh, in clinical practice, both for its ability to produce arrhythmias and death and its significance as well disease also. The, the thing is, when, when I reviewed the, for, for this meeting, I reviewed the autopsy series for my talk of sudden death and there was not a single case of mitral valve prolapse which was reported. Now, there is an argument that you cannot diagnose mitral valve prolapse at autopsy because it has to be diagnosed in a live patient in a contracting heart. So maybe you are missing it. You cannot, uh, so you cannot comment you know, with certainty so on patho that. Pathologic diagnosis, the pathologist, cardiac pathologists are fairly good, like Dr. Yeah. Pradeep Vaideshwar. So would you may not be able to probably look at the valve morphology, thickness, correct, and correct. based Redu on that. Redundancy of the valve, the myxomatous valve. But even that has not been reported. You know, another pathology which has never been reported any autopsy series in sudden death is coronary aneurysms. Now we, if, even if you see a 2 millimeter, 3 millimeter coronary aneurysm, people tend to stent it with a covered stent. I always question the wisdom of doing it because you, I don't know whether they really rupture and cause death because no autopsy series has shown even one case of a ruptured coronary aneurysm, unless it's a huge football-like, tennis ball-like aneurysm. So I think these are certain things which we, we have to you know, take into proper perspective, consider in proper perspective. So that the message, the yeah, the message is don't take it too seriously. Usually nothing would happen. Correct. Unless the person comes with primary arrhythmic symptoms and then you have an associated mitral annular disjunction, then it is very important if they have family history, if uh, there is a structural problem associated with sustained arrhythmias, then it is very important that we would obviously pay primary importance to the arrhythmia and associated disease will just point us to it that maybe it is contributing to that illness. So we'll quickly, I'll just quickly take the next topic. I think that next topic which is... Uh, have a pseudo, you need to really look at mitral valve prolapse. prolapse, truly it is there, I think that's the key yes. message that yes. identify it true because most of them, once you're labeled, they'll keep on roaming around and everywhere during fitnesses they'll have a chance. And like that study which has shown that over a 10 year period in the absence of major arrhythmias, the prognosis is really the same and sometimes even the arrhythmia burden is higher with mitral annular disjunction but not survival. So even that arrhythmia is not really driving your survival which is quite reassuring for most of us because we would find doctors who would be even more, what do you say, uh, worried about once you start reading about it. Doctors and doctors relatives, they would be more concerned. A lot of people would probably not bother about it also. So I'll quickly do the second topic in a couple of minutes also as we are short of time <clears throat> and I'll just bring out a couple of important things in this topic. One is this is early repolarization syndrome and uh, death, sudden death associated with early repolarization syndrome. And what is early repolarization syndrome? First of all, we should know what is J-point. J-point is the end of the QRS and the beginning of the point where the QRS ends and the ST segment begins is the J-point. Okay, so it will be variable in various QRS morphologies. 
So like this is an example of an ECG which we very common call as it as young patients who come in with some non-specific symptoms and they have uh, concavity upward ST elevations which, which with J point elevation which we call it as early repolarization. So what exactly is er early repolarization? Previously that ST segment elevation was also a part of diagnosis but now it is very clear based on criteria that we only look for J point elevation. So a 2 millimeter J point elevation is diagnostic of early repolarization. So obviously if you are using only one point you could get two or three different variants of this early repolarization syndrome depending upon how that slow of that ST segment is after that J point elevation. So then we, when we describe early repolarization it would be of different kinds of early repolarization depending upon that slope of that ST segment depending upon the extent of the early repolarization seen in the 12 lead QRS. So previously it was ST segment elevation was also included now we just look at J point elevation. So whenever there is J point elevation you can see bottom left you can see that there is just some slurring of the QRS towards the end. In that case, the J point is where that sharp QRS ends and the slur where it starts, it is called a J point. That is where you measure that 2 millimeter. And there are times when you get actually a notch also in which you get a nice hump which comes up as a J point. So two different variants where you can see. In the first variant, you can see that the slope is downwards and the left side it is slope is upwards. And that is what is important when we look at these syndromes. How much is the prevalence? 5 to 8 percent in general population, but higher in athletes, higher whenever the vagal tone is high. That would itself mean it must be healthy, isn't it? <laughs> Early repolarization must be healthy. So it is more frequent in blacks, men and in younger individuals. Although there is, this is the first time when Hasegar published it in NEGM 2008 where he published a series of patients with idiopathic ventricular fibrillation and he found that people who had idiopathic ventricular fibrillation, there was early repolarization. That early repolarization was more prominent whenever idiopathic VF used to happen. So just before idiopathic EF, EF, that early repolarization would become prominent on the ECGs. He found that the prevalence was 31% in patients who have idiopathic VF versus 5% in normal control. So ER early repolarization was common in this subset. Ectopic origin was seen in LV. This pattern was accentuated during ectopics which made people think that oh whether this early repolarization is actually giving rise to arrhythmias and there were incriminating PVCs originating from the inferior wall wherever the early repolarization was normal. And that is where people started looking at in 2008 and that is why it was it is also often called as Hasegger syndrome also. And quinidine and isoprenol just like it would help in Brugada syndrome would attenuate this early repolarization also. So different J-wave syndromes are there, we are not going to look at it right now. The patterns that we looked at already is either a notch or a slur along with J-point elevation and a narrow QRS is what is diagnostic of <coughs> early repolarization pattern. And when it is associated with ventricular arrhythmias that is a sustained or polymorphic uh, VT or VF, then it is called as early repolarization syndrome or it is a resuscitated sudden death or a sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death on autopsy, then it is called as early repolarization syndrome. So essentially a diagno the diagnosis is a diagnosis of exclusion. We have to exclude a lot of other diseases before we come to this diagnosis. As I said, it is classified depending upon the type as well as the extent on ECG and it does affect the prognosis. We won't look too much into the mechanisms or the electrical aspect of early repolarization syndrome but just to bring it to you a very important fact that although it is uh, a, a thing is commonly seen prevalent in our population the presence itself sometimes increases the mortality in uh, in general population also per presence of early repolarization so whether every, all early repolarization is bad is what we should look at and that is not so and based on the character of early repolarization that is that what we look at if the early repolarization, which is the commonest one which you see at the bottom in the anterolateral leads with ascending changes just like we saw on the first ECG, that is the most prevalent one and the least uh, problem uh, creating one. Whereas somebody who has resuscitated cardiac arrest, who has family history of sudden cardiac arrest, who has dynamic augmentation of J waves, who have short coupled PVCs, who has this prominent J waves with down sloping ST depressions or slur, they are the worser kind of early repolarization syndrome when we look at.
Now, not only does it become an entity for sudden cardiac death in a normal heart, but even those patients who get ventricular fibrillation after myocardial infarction, it is often thought that this electrical abnormality may be contributing to VF in patients who develop myocardial infarction. So that may be contributing, and that is always a question, like Sir said, why somebody develops VF and somebody does not develop VF with a very similar electrical <coughs> anatomy, uh, coronary anatomy. And this may be the reason. Now, as I said, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. I'll quickly go to treatment. Treatment of early repolarization is basically nothing unless somebody has uh, resuscitated sudden cardiac arrest in, and when all other causes are ruled out, then we need to make, uh, give them ICDs. All other causes would meet toxins, Ayurvedic drugs, snake bites, and all, all of you, whatever you look at, all physicians look at, all small, small things you look at, you rule all of them out. Any reversible cause is not there. And you get a very prominent atypical looking early repolarization with the resuscitated sudden cardiac arrest. Then we need to do give an ICD. <clears throat> Thank you so much. In the interest of time, we can 2010, me, Dr. Yash, Charles Anzelevich, we actually reported a case where we presented a progression of J waves into an ST elevation. So uh, that particular thing, what you mentioned, that Japanese paper actually has cited our paper, wherein J waves have shown to be the difference between the epicardial and myocardial uh, action potential difference, and they are also shown to be the precursor for future ST elevations to come. Maybe this is relevant to that paper, I don't know. Thank you, Dr. Dupesh Parker, for your excellent talk. Would you go to the next talk? Next talk is by Dr. Rati Parashinde on uh, deep fibrillation. Okay. So, coming to this particular talk. Excuse me. Can you hear me? So, at the outset, let me thank Dr. Rajit Bhagwat sir to uh, invite me for giving this topic. This is a very, this topic is very close to me, my heart. Uh, I'll explain to you later on why. It's a very simple thing. In all, everybody's life, we defibrillate everybody sometimes, but sometimes we do get into trouble. So, let's see. We have been hearing about sudden cardiac death. So right from the morning in many lectures, it's a leading cause of death worldwide and it, after the prevalence of uh, COVID, I think the prevalence of sudden cardiac death is also increasing. Looking at the history of defibrillation, it all started with Paul Claude Beck in 1947, followed by Paul Zoll in 1956, first closed uh, defibrillation. And now we are in the era of uh, implantable defibrillators, extravascular defibrillators, subcutaneous defibrillators, and so on and so forth. So coming to certain basics, absolute basics of defibrillation, how do we do defibrillation? Earlier, we used to be using pedals, but more and more we are using pads for defibrillation, and these pad placements are very, very important. In fact, there is very limited evidence to show that the pad placement choices in VT and pulseless VT could actually translate into success of defibrillation. We recommend usually the anterolateral position, which is the most common position. One pad is placed over the mid axial line in the sixth intercostal space on the left hand side, and the other pad on the right side in the second intercostal space. It's a very classic defibrillation uh, position. In fact, it is also marked on the pads to put it like that. Other options include antero posterior, that is, one pad in the front and one pad at the back posteriorly so that the vector of shocking changes will come to that later. The third option, more or less practical, is using two different defibrillators with two pads each. We'll get into that later on. We also have to consider whenever there are a lot of hair involved with a hairy male or a woman with big breasts, then you have to put the pads accordingly. How about the pad size? The pad size or the pedal size has to be big enough to transfer more energy. What are the guidelines say that it has to be more than 8 centimeters squares minimum for an adult male or a female? How about shocking a patient with pacemaker and an ICD if it is there? It can be very well be done, very easily be done. Only thing you have to be careful that you have to stay at least 8 to 10 centimeters away from the pulse generator. As long as your pads are away, like eight centi minimum 8 centimeters from the pulse generator, you can safely shock these people even in presence of an ICD or a pacemaker. 
the skin must be dry and clean. You should avoid contacts with other equipment such as ECG leads. If there are some ECG leads, please try to remove them fast. If there are patches like uh, uh, nitroglycerin patches and all, they will prevent the contact, so please remove them. Oxygen lines, oxygen lines can continue like that in except if the patient is on high flow oxygen you have to make sure that that is doesn't come into the way currently we do not recommend stopping compressions during uh, 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 continuing compressions during defibrillation you have to stop for a while and give the shock so that you know the person who is giving shock is safe after identifying a non shockable rhythm if the rhythm is non shockable please disarm the defibrillator immediately we have seen accidents happening, we have seen mishaps happening because somebody has kept the defibrillator uh, armed and then uh, somebody else has got the shock. Care has to be taken to ensure all people are away while delivering the shock and the pads must be well adhered to the chest wall. Not necessarily every time you can use the jelly, If there is, just make sure that the contact is good so that sparking is not there. This particular graphic shows us standard defibrillation pad positions. This is the standard one. Lower right side corner, we have the anteroposterior ones, which is more efficacious as compared to the standard defibrillation as far as successful defibrillation is concerned. And this is what is called as dual uh, sequential external defibrillation, where we use two defibrillators with two pads, one in the classic position and the other one in the anteroposterior position. And these two defibrillators give almost simultaneous shocks. One shock is delivered and within seconds the other shock is delivered. This gives more energy transfer to the myocardium and the yield of successful defibrillation is much more with the DSED. We'll get into the evidence later on. How much time, I mean how early it has to be done. Earlier the defibrillation, more is the survival, that is the motto. Interruptions to effective good compressions should be avoided. That means just because you want to give shocks, do not stop the in, uh, compressions for a long time. Continue the CPR. In cardiac arrest, after you have started CPR, the first priority is to attach the defibrillator and prepare for the defibrillation. As soon as the pads are on, you have to make sure you have to analyze in few seconds the rhythm and please deliver the shock. The only exception being non-shockable rhythms where you have to disarm the pads fast. What kind of energy you should give? Normally I see people starting with 50 joules, then going on to 100 joules, then 150 joules. Please do not, at least in the case of ventricular fibrillation, go with the maximum energy. We now, Nowadays we have a lot of biphasic defibrillators around, but yes, in rural areas and everywhere we have to do with sometimes monophasic. If it's a monophasic defibrillator, you have to go with 300 or 360 joules, whichever is maximum. If you have a biphasic defibrillator, the guidelines say that you have to go with 200 joules. Some old biphasic defibrillators have maximum 150 joules. You can go with that. Don't start with 50, 100. Go with the maximum intensity because the time is muscle in these patients. How do we remember that a safe defibrillation has to be done? And the safe, simple mnemonic is there, coached. C means compressions have to continue, oxygen has to be pushed away, all others have to be cleared. You have to charge the defibrillator, hands off, evaluate the rhythm and defibrillate. This is how you remember how do we safely defibrillate these patients and instruct your team to continue CPR if the shock is delivered and yet it is not reverted back. This is so on and so forth for basics of defibrillation, but then not always after giving one or two shocks you successfully come back to sinus rhythm. And that is where a refractory ventricular fibrillation comes into the picture. We'll just understand this with the help of a case scenario. A 60-year-old health professional suffers a cardiac arrest while he's working in his clinic outside the hospital. Luckily, there was an anesthetist around. He sees him, confirms the pulselessness, initiates CPR, calls for an ambulance. He intubates the patient, gets him uh, an AED which is around or a defibrillator around and gives him shocks. Couple of shocks, we, uh, the VF continues. At the same time, CPR also continues. Subsequently, EMS people arrive. They also give three shocks, but then still it does not revert back. Now what do we do? Five shocks, no reversion of ventricular fibrillation. You have used even medicines what are at your disposals. 
CPR continues. What do we do? And this is a form first case of refractory ventricular fibrillation. In fact, few months back, there was a beautiful article in New England Journal of Medicine which described various strategies and there was a trial which actually compared various defibrillation strategies head to head in this particular study, that is dose VF. In this, there were three strategies, same thing like standard single defibrillation therapy, vector change, that is anteroposterior and pad, uh, pad displacement, and double sequential external defibrillation. I'll not get into the details. You know how the pads are placed. We have already uh, talked about this. Remember, these sort of trials to do are very difficult because you are talking about people with refractory ventricular fibrillation. You cannot really have a control arm. You cannot have, I mean, I mean, it's very difficult to recruit the patients for such trials. And that is why the number, N number, is very low in such patients. Now we look at the results. Termination, successful termination of ventricular fibrillation in classical defibrillation is around 67%, whereas in DSED group, it is close to 85%. So almost 20 units absolute increase in the success rate. Same is with the return of spontaneous circulation and other parameters. So clearly, this, this trial showed us that changes in the technique of your defibrillation will definitely go a long way in having a successful defibrillation. There were certain uh, controversies regarding this trial because this trial had to be stopped early due to the pandemic and then there were some statistical issues because of that. But then this trial has actually showed us that these new techniques of defibrillation are always better and if possible, not at the roadside, but at least in the setting of critical care uh, unit, you have to start implementing these kind of uh, um, techniques so that the chances of survival are much higher. So what, does hap what, uh, what happens to our patient? So this patient comes to, uh, uh, they get, they change the position of the pads, anteroposterior pads are posed, and voila, this particular patient reverts back to normal sinus rhythm. And what is the clinical application? The clinical application is simple, that you please start implementing these alternative strategies in your clinic, in your ICU. Implementing them at the level of ER and ambulances and roadside is the next step. It will take some time because, again, that would entail that every ambulance should have two defibrillators. Here in India, getting one defibrillator is a luxury. So from this particular techniques of defibrillation, let's come to something which is very, very important, and that is public access defibrillation. In fact, the answer to out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is not ICDs, it is not uh, different types of defibrillation. It lies in bystander or on-site defibrillation. So if you see the red line, which is survival, the more you go towards the ER, the later you go towards the ER, the survival goes on decreasing. The biggest survival is when somebody gets a out-of-hospital cardiac arrest next to AED. That is very ideal, you know. But then that has to be the case. Then you have volunteer responder defibrillation. So this volunteer de responder defibrillation is a very novel concept. But for that, we require a huge cohort of at least semi-skilled AED operators. And the AED have to be very much widespread. In fact, I will get on to that later on. The efforts are on towards that. Then there are some mobile AED defibrillators. There are some professional first responders. So these professional first responders are not medicos. They are police. They are firefighters. They are taxi drivers. These sort of people, they reach the site before medicos. So if these people are trained in uh, at least operating AED, giving basic CPR, it will go a long way in increasing the survival of an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And that is where we require real co uh, cooperation from the society at large, doctors, and the dispatch mechanism, something which we lack in this country. In fact, if we see data, you can see EMS survival rates versus bystander survival, uh, shock survival rates. Bystander shock survival rates are far better as compared to the EMS. In fact, that means the patients do not survive till they reach EMS. Now, what is public access defibrillation? It's not a new concept. 
It's pretty old concept. It started in uh, Western countries in 1990s. They kept the 80s in places like airports, sporting grounds, casinos. But the problem, the actually seal of this public access defibrillation is, if you see the amount of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, the 50% of our cardiac arrests happen at home, and there are no AEDs at home. There are no community AEDs. So what, when you are talking about public access defibrillation, you are only considering public medical facility, sports facility office. I'll ask one question. All of us are doctors. How many of you have an AED or a defibrillator in your clinic? Very few. Very few. So at least after this lecture, you should please request your pharma guy or yourself that I should have an AED in my clinic. Because there will be patients which will be coming to your clinic and they'll have someday cardiac arrest. That time you cannot go back and get an AED. In fact, in my clinic itself, I have a biophysic defibrillator and we have so far resuscitated successfully three patients who came walking with a ventricular tachycardia in my clinic. And this is not government compulsion. This is our moral responsibility. The charity starts at home. When we are lecturing people about public access defibrillation, we have to first have an AED in our clinic, in our home, in our society. And that is very important. Because unless and until we have AEDs which are accessible at home, this menace of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is not going to get control. So what are the issues plaguing public access defibrillators? We just dwell upon the first thing, that homes are not covered. Secondly, innovative technologies are there to cover this. Now, Everybody of us have smart watches. These smart watches are equipped with various sensors. Three of them being one, first heart rate sensor. Every um, Apple watch or Samsung watch has got a heart rate monitor. Secondly, they have a thing called as gyroscope and accelerometer. Plus they have GPS and calling ability. So these all taken together, whenever somebody gets a cardiac arrest, it senses that there is a flat line on ECG or heart rate is very slow. Secondly, the fall is sensed by the accelerometer and gyroscope. Immediately with these three, the algorithm diagnoses this as a cardiac arrest, calls the 911 from the watch or whatever emergency number with GPS coordinates of that person so that the, your EAS, EMS system can actually send dispatch for defibrillation or further emergency management. This is how the technology will go future. This is the future of um, uh, OHCA management. And this will be there slowly. Then people tried various things. If you see in literature, various novel things are tried. When we are talking about network and other things, which is, which is the first thing which comes to your mind is Uber or Ola. They have the biggest network and the quickest network. You go onto their app and you get the cab between, within a few minutes. They are at times quicker than your ambulances. So why not give an AED to every taxi driver, train them in uh, the resuscitation, and put a small thing that instead of taxi, please send an emergency. You can charge for that. And people have done. There have been trials in Denmark and uh, Sweden about giving AEDs to the cabbies. This can be very well be uh, implemented in India. Now, the second problem with public access defibrillation in India may if you put an AED in public place, next day it will be stolen and sold to Juna Bajar. So what do we do? So you can have a barrier to that. The codes to access of these AEDs couldn't, can be given by the EMS system to the people who are trained. So this particular app will call for people in the, say, one kilometer periphery of that particular alarm and give them those codes and go pick up that AED and go to that person. And last but not the least, for doing this, we require a huge cohort of people who are trained in at least hands-only CPR and basic management of uh, handling of AED. And that comes, the biggest cohort we have is school children. In fact, it's at the policy level, government has to make compulsory that every person who's passing 10th grade has to be trained in basic life support and uh, CPR. In fact, I will show you, I on my own, I'm doing some, you can uh, say a Kharisa Vata, we are trying to teach some school children. So we'll come to that later. These are some papers which have come recently on mobile phone dispatch of laypersons, various apps which will get you help for cardiac arrest. 
So this is the future of public access defibrillation. This is the future of OHCA management and not ICDs. So these are various things which people, we, we can have AD signages, we can have optimized AD availability. Government can do uh, subsidies on AEDs. The duties can be abolished. Nowadays, you know how much an AED cost? 1.5 lakh rupees. Even NASA ones and some other ones are available around 1 lakh rupees. It's not a big amount by any chance. I mean, a pharma can donate, a, a CSR people can donate, everybody can donate an AED. In fact, government can make a simple rule that the houses are like in crores. Rather than giving free ACs, you make it compulsory to have one AED per house or per building or per floor at least. Like they have made it compulsory to have airbags in cars. Cars cost you 30, 40, 50 lakh rupees nowadays. Why can't we have a government resolution that give one AED? Every house or at least one per building or per, one per floor. And those sort of policy decisions need to be made if we want to control these minutes of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. In the next two minutes or so, I'll show you. This is one of my very own initiative where I have bought 15 dummies from the United States with my own money, no pharma, nothing. I don't go for any photo ops. I don't go for any clubs or anybody. We have talked to the Municipal Commission of Pune, and he's given me the responsibility of teaching CPR and training them uh, for all school children in Pune Municipal Corporation. Why Pune Municipal Corporation? Because these are poor kids. Nobody teaches them. The big schools can offer any kind of training. So we, it's my mission to uh, at least teach one lakh people by the end of this year. I have unfortunately uh, achieved at least 20, 21,000 till now. Long time to go, but then definitely we'll go ahead. Plus we are also training people like metros, police, corporates, and this is all we, have, we are doing without taking a single penny. I have made a small team of uh, students and physiotherapists, and they come with me, and everybody comes and gets our 10, 15 dummies. Everybody gets hands-on. I have seen people doing uh, CPR workshop with one dummy, standing here, showing that does not help. That's just a photo op. You have to give everybody hands-on how CPR is to be done. This is the only time you will get to press a uh, chest of somebody who is not dead. And that is how it has to be done. These children are your future lifesavers. Because tomorrow, that OHCA can happen to your mom, your dad, your loved one. So it's our duty to teach these people. Last thing, I will show you one video. This is a very dramatic video. This is from Denmark. And this is the future of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. I hope this comes to India in the next few years to come. Please watch this carefully. So this to the people are allowed to GPS coordinates collects the AD. The problem moved in the past of the year, and in the end, the end of the day, the end of the day, the end of the day, the end of the day. Before even the ambulance reaches, this guy reaches there with an AD. And Next. This is the future of management of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. We have to do our own bit, train people for CPR and increase availability and training for AEDs. Thank you very much. Yes. For energy selection, for VFVT, you told 360. If patient has a SVT, PP is not recordable in such cases. No, for SVT, the criteria for defibrillation are different. SVT, you can go with a smaller energy. But for VF, when the, it's a life and death, you have to go with the maximum energy available. That is for VF and VT. Yep. My second question is, sir. So witness cardiac arrest and cardiac which is not witnessed, what is, what is the termination point when to stop? 
No, usually the uh, CPR has to continue till medical help arises. You are in rural setup. Yes. Remote area. Generally, roughly with, around 40, 30, 40 years. It are has there been... any clinical criteria to stop CPR? Any guidelines? When to stop? Stop. 45. Cardiac arrest, as he had shown earlier, uh, in terms of the timing of the arrest and timing of the resuscitation, in fact, in 10 minutes, almost everybody will die. Every one minute the person is in cardiac arrest, is a 10 percent chance of loss of life. So in 10 minutes, most people will lose their life if they are not attended to. Let's assume a situation when he is attended to within those 10 minutes. In the 10 minutes you have started attending, as he says that you continue resuscitation, most often in 20 to 30 minutes you will have an ambulance or an AED available. You give a shock and see the resuscitation to normal spontaneous circulation and breathing. If by that time it doesn't happen, you may give up. Of course, you may give up based on the comorbidities which a person has. On and average 30 minutes. Sir, to I for congratulate 30. for your mission CPR. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Last month, I was in Kedarnath on helipad. One staff had a cardiac arrest. I was there and one ENT doctor, we too resuscitated that fellow. It was at 12,000 feet Thank height. You. Thank you, sir. But I really appreciate your mission. Yes. Thank you, sir. It's very, very important. So what we'll be discussing in brief is secondary, primary prevention, 1.5 prevention, case studies, and a rational approach. So to start off, we need to understand secondary prevention is very crisp and clear that somebody who has had an event which is there, either a VT or a VF or a resuscitated cardiac arrest, very clearly, and if the ejection fraction is below 35%, an ICD is recommended. And all these three trials clearly tell you that almost 30 to 35 percent relative risk reduction, which gives you an absolute benefit of almost 7 to 8 percent, which is pretty good and cost effective. When we talk of ICD's cost benefit analysis, when we look at, it tells you that survival, mean survival in these two trials was almost two and a half to three months. And this is important that, you know, 1.27, 1 lakh 27 thousand dollars and 2.13. This at those times when the trials were published in 98 to 2000 was considered to be cost effective. But over a period of time, we'll tell you that ideally if the cost of an ICD implant, if your lives saved, if it is around 50,000 or so, that is when that becomes cost effective and that is proportional to the survival of the patient, the number of years. Now why that magic figure of 35% EF was considered came from the, this trial, which told us that if somebody has an EF of below 35% versus above 35%, your ICD and drug therapy act nearly simultaneously over a period of, let's say, four or five years follow-up. And that is the reason we have a cutoff of that 35%, though it is not very, very absolute, but relatively this is what we think. Now I'll start off with this case. He's a young boy whom I had probably done an angioplasty, 30-year-old, when he was 24, presented with evolved anterior wall MI, large EF was almost very low, angioplasty done his EF remained to be 20-25, large anterior wall scar, and he's been following up. Now he's basically a, you know, an aeronautic engineer working in Delhi. Last year had come to me for follow-up, and this was his ejection fraction, 20 to 25 percent. Absolutely asymptomatic, walks for six kilometers, anti-pro BNP normal, no presyncope, nothing. So this... Just keep it in your mind. We'll probably come back to it by the time I end it. So now the discussion comes. He clearly fits into the primary prevention criteria according to the MADID 2 criteria that a person whose EF is below or equal to 30% and the patient has got an old anterior MI and a scar probably is a true candidate. No pulmonary hypertension, RV size, everything fine. Okay. So now let's talk about the role of ICDs for primary prevention in sudden ischemic group and the dilated cardiomyopathy separate where there were different trials. So what we need to understand on the left bar is the NYHA class, right bar is EF between 30 to 40 percent. The first trial, MADID 2, below or equal to 35 percent, 
the blue bar is most of these patients underwent an electrophysiology study that is important second must trial they include it up to 40 but class was between 1 to 3 they also underwent an ep study made it 2 they made it little more stringent ef made it 5% lesser but only ejection fraction nothing else to be included if they have it straight away go for an icd scud have trial had class 2 and 3 but they increased it by 5% and only ejection fraction was the inclusion criteria and companion trial basically why because it had a crt d and a crt both the arms because your qrs interval was looked, looked into so for all practical purposes let's take away companion only madit madit 2 and must is what it is non uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy what trials we have definite trial below 35 percent class 1 2 3 they looked at ps pvcs and non-sustained ventricular tachycardia scudeft looked only fef because scudeft had both 50 50 percent nearly ischemic and the non-ischemic group and companion similar as we discussed so the most important part is look at the two-year mortality in the MADIT and the MUST. Take away the CABG patch trial which was excluded because it was a negative trial. Almost a 28% risk reduction in MADIT 2 but when it comes to MADIT and MUST, 56 to 59%. So why this difference of relative risk reduction between all the primary prevention trials because in addition to ejection fraction, EP study and other parameters were looked into. They were EP guided therapy. Here also non-sustained VT and inducible. Here in MADIT 2, nothing more than one month of an MI and EF below 30%, whatever may be the NYHA class you put in. And that was the basic challenge, I think, which all people in 2000 when the trial was published two decades ago, it was very difficult to accept that. And, you know, if we have to do this, Almost 80% of our OPD patients will require an ICD. And if you tell them that the cost is going to be 4 5 lakh rupees, probably they will even stop their medical treatment or stop your doctor seeing you again. Okay, so MADIT 1, I'm not going to go in view of time. There was one interesting part that was the Frankfurt ICD result where they looked at T-wave alternance and the EP study. And it turned out to be that in EP study, whether it's inducible or non-deducible, it did not have any impact. But if you look at T-wave alternance, the ones which had it definitely had better benefit than the ones who did not have this particular thing. Types of death, we already know that primarily arrhythmic death in people, the moment ejection fraction goes down, your arrhythmic death which is going to be there is around 9.4, 7.7 and 3.2%. So that is the reason why ejection fraction of 40% was chosen or 35% was chosen was and again there was a it was just a random figure mind you as I think Dr. Vora and Dr. Uh, uh, the morning speakers has mentioned EF is just a figure it is a range as well as the symptoms that you look into clinically that will decide whether what to do with this particular patient and when we look at the primary reduction in the mortalities were 50 50 and 30 percent and what we come to is sorry number needed to treat if you just look at the MADIT 2, the number needed to treat is almost 11 and MUST and MADIT is 3 and 4. When you talk of drug therapy, you need a little, little larger number of drugs, uh, number of patients to be treated. So that is the primary reason that if you want to say one premature death in two years, the numbers were very high and thereby it looks that probably the cost effectivity of this particular device may not be appropriate. New SCADEFT cost effectivity analysis came to a figure of almost $33,000 per life year saved as almost a cutoff where you may say that this is economical. So this is very important. ICD cost effectiveness is relative to a life year related to placebo was 38. So this cost varied depending on the survival time. So let's say a five-year survival gives a 1.27 lakh cost effectiveness. At eight years, it is 88 and at 12 years, it is 58. So it tells you that at least a patient has to survive an episode after an ICD implant. If he survives beyond eight years, then probably I would say that this therapy is going to be beneficial. 
Most of the times that is the reason you need to look at the survival, less than one year, more than one year, five years, what is your comorbidities, elderly, non-elderly, frailty, lot of other factors play a role. And that is why the cost effective ratio was a benchmark to identify therapies that provide good value and ratio above one lakh or more is typically considered poor value for money. And that is the reason we probably do not think it to be beneficial. Electrical storm, inappropriate shocks has already been covered so we will not spend time on that. Now, dilated cardiomyopathy, two interesting facets have come. If you look at DCMP with EF below 35% class 2 and 3, in 2015 guidelines it was a class 1 indication, 2022 it straight away became a class 2A indication. But another interesting asset, if their EF is between 36 to 50, 2015 there were no recommendations obviously, but now there is a class 2A recommendation primarily because you should have associated factors of late gadolinium enhancement, so scarring on MRI, inducible sustained VT, unexplained syncope, or some varieties of pathogenic mutations which in the morning we were talking about in hypertrophic or a dilated cardiomyopathy. Now there is one very interesting trial that we need to understand was the amio word trial, amiodarone versus ICD in non-ischemic dilated and a asymptomatic non-sustained VT. So what does it tell you that mortality and quality of life treated with amio or an ICD are not different, there is a trend towards a more beneficial cost profile and improved arrhythmia-free survival with amiodarone therapy, mind you, published just two decades ago. And obviously the nail in the coffin for the DCMP was the Danish trial, so dilated cardiomyopathy, you probably there is no mortality benefit with an ICD. You look at the rejection fractions are around 25%. They are on pretty good medical therapy with almost 90% and 60% on beta blockers and MRA. And you can see hardly any difference in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, sudden death. And only thing was younger, sterile, below 68 years had a little benefit, above 68, no benefit. So this primarily you need to understand that using, because the pathophysiology is a little different, there is no scar, there is a different mechanism and that is the reason in a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, unless there is not a heart failure indication just to put in an ICD for a primary prevention is difficult. And that's what we come to this start, that primary prevention ICD time to put the toothpaste back into the tube. Now this dis has already been discussed since morning, but we need to understand that primary prevention, we, people cannot be advised, and even if I advise a person may not afford, secondary prevention, the number is too less. And those patients, anyway, we have been implanting ICD. If somebody gets a VTVF, resuscitated cardiac arrest, we probably are putting ICDs. So why do we, what do we feel? Is there anything a better way? And that's where one and a half between primary and secondary, we have something which we need to do for our patients. And what is it? is you look at these three parameters, your frequent PVCs, syncope or pre-syncope, and non-sustained VT on a holter or maybe extended loop recorders, but primarily look at this, their ejection fraction should be around 25, it is not now 35%. So you're getting down the EF, getting more sicker population along with one of these parameters together. And that is how this entire presentation comes that you look at all these patients and if one of these, if any one or more of the following is present, you probably advise them an ICD. Do we have any literature for it that I'll come to? So can we target more effectively? That's where the heart rate variability, signal averaged ECGs, T-wave alternance, QRS fractionation, genetic analysis, multiple profilers like maybe you have biomarkers like ST2 and NT-proBNP which probably can be used. Now, this is a very simple thing that somebody has EF below 40 and repetitive arrhythmias together, the risk is 16 times and it is four times. So it's not additive, it is multiplicative. Signal average ECGs we can probably identify. This is also a very interesting paper of MADID2 sub-analysis. Microvolt T-wave alternance, they classified 600 patients into each arm. The ones who did not have T-wave 97% negative predictive value like a D-dimer. If it is negative, your PE is absolutely excluded. You don't need to worry. And here, if in, even if they are positive, event occurred only in 150 patients versus 450 where it didn't occur, suggesting that only 25% positive predictive value. Maybe, unluckily, we do not have this particular thing with us being used. 
and that is how the trial which was on basis of which we probably now look at 1.5 is the improved SCA trial where probably even India was a part of this and only Southeast Asian countries all of them participated and it tells you very clear that 1.5 prevention is very close to secondary prevention and much better than the primary prevention arm. If you look at 1.0 is primary is the green, orange, yellow, blue and grey are very close to each other. So anybody who has either EF low, NSVT, PVC, syncope along with a low EF definitely fared better as for the SCD benefit and that was superior. And look at the 1.5 prevention not implanted, only look at the dark blue bar. 34% sudden death and 12% once it's implanted and non-implanted in primary also it was less but with 1.5 the difference became much better because we were able to and this is what it was group 1.5 versus secondary 1922 so the difference is hardly nearly similar between your one and a half prevention so thereby in an Indian population this is very very worthwhile if we want to really select the patients amongst the high risk the highest risk can be selected by this particular. So whoever is the highest risk is post MI, post CABG, post PTCA, irrespective of etiology 30 to 35 percent. Biomarkers like ST2 is more prognostic than the NT pro BNP because ST2 is a marker of fibrosis and remodeling where NT pro BNP is a stretch. If imagine a person just has a pulmonary hypertension, RV dilatation, your NT pro BNP may increase even though person doesn't have a LV dysfunction. Additional risk factors we've already discussed. Now this couple, uh, one case who is a 65-year-old male, post-CABG, EF 35%, had only syncope, and if you see he was asymptomatic, this is what was his baseline ECG. On this basis, what we will do, EF is 30-35%, post-CABG, right bundle brand, he is not into even the classical LBBB morphologies where you are going to really look about, and NYHA is class 2. So this is a dilemma that any person who has a syncope with an LV dysfunction, two take-home messages, number one, just don't come out with a brady pacing in this patient because a VT or a VF could be present in 35% of these group of patients. And this is what we did. We just took him up in the EP lab and we could induce a hemodynamically unstable stable VT, had to be deceverted on table, converted to sinus rhythm and we put in an ICD in this patient. Other disorders we already, these are completely different subsets which are there which I think already has been discussed by previous speakers which we need to really talk of ICD implant in these group of patients. Coming to my last case which was there, that young boy had he, in Delhi had a monomorphic VT, stable and probably he was admitted, given amidrone, stabilized and he is discharged now. So the primary prevention fellow who was following up for six years with me in just a six months time has now become a clear cut secondary prevention. So he has a monomorphic VT, EF is 2025 and now he directly fits into, I had already advised him last year that please probably because you're too young, EF is pretty low, kindly think about an ICD but probably now is the time that we probably should implant an ICD. Now Indian context what is relevant is we need to understand medical therapy also since we are clinicians. Post CABG and PTCA, please give them beta blockers as many as possible. Amiodarone does not reduce cardiovascular mortality. Beta blockers does reduce. Amio is only for a VT suppression, not for mortality benefit. Statins, we already know that they definitely have plaque benefits and also help in SCD reduction. If EF remains below 35%, please discuss the option of an ICD to them. If not affordable, these are the four drugs. In a poor man's country, maybe I may take a step further, though may not be appropriate. Now we have left bundle pacing, we have this. You can probably really up titrate the beta blockers, give them a dual chamber pacemaker in case, in a very, very, if you're pushed to the wall and a patient is really that bad and you're not able to escalate the beta blocker because the mortality with the beta blockers is also pretty good. This I'll for want of time leave it. So in ICD in heart failure conclusion, no discussion about its value in secondary prevention fine-tuning required for indication for primary prevention in ischemic heart disease and no indication for implant for primary prevention in only non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. So guidelines are guidelines, but remember the individual, that's the key, and I think that's how we should proceed. Thank you very much for a patient here. Yeah, that was an excellent presentation. It's very practical. Um,
that also had a non ischemic good but period you can use them into it also so it it won't be wrong if you apply it to dcmp kinds yeah ischemic cardiomyopathy you can apply so if the ef is that's what it is the ef is lower 25% and if they have anybody has a syncope i think you can so put the so from the data in. it looks like 1.5 prevention is like poor man cp study almost you can say so because ep i didn't discuss it but one thing is very clear the trials which have been done with the ep why i didn't put them for the want of time was ep has a very very variable uh, presentation so we think ep as a you know a golden standard that you know we will do an ep and if i induce a vt if you don't induce an vt still the risk of scd may be because at that particular temporal time when i'm trying to induce vt maybe the refractoriness of the ventricles may be totally different i may not be able to even though the patient is at a high risk so that is the reason ep is not a very strong or a solid parameter yeah in my patient he had syncope and we already knew that this but somehow the patient was not convinced and i told them that let's do an ep and let us identify i was lucky to get a vt being induced but not all times i may be lucky enough i it think it may not be solid but is it better than one and a half no sir i wouldn't say because there you are looking at all aspects here i am looking at non sustained vt i am looking at syncope i am looking at other clinical parameters so so i think sir can give his view sir please so, uh, if i were to uh, you know the threshold for an icd when you're talking of primary prevention the threshold for an icd should be much lower in patient with ischemic heart disease and scar so ischemic heart disease and scar as he saw in his patient you will realize that most patients on a long term follow up will land up with ventricular tachycardia or sudden cardiac arrest and death so offering a primary prevention icd for an ischemic heart disease and scar is a reasonably good idea but that is not so in non ischemic cardiomyopathy non ischemic cardiomyopathy don't necessarily have a bad outcome that is what we realize in danish study and we also realize the limitation of ep study in those group of patients because they don't have a homogeneous uniform scar ep study is not very reliable and when you say non ischemic it includes many uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and all other varieties of cardiomyopathy which have gone into dilated phase so the one and a half prevention actually has a more meaningful value in the non ischemic subset there you should use this so apart from using uh, the non sustained vt syncope and also the uh, you know pvc burden and the lvef even the width of the qrs is used by many even a cardiac mr is used by some even a st2 marker is used so all these markers are used in the non ischemic group to decide who should be offered an icd in absence of an ep study because anyway the ep study is not reliable in ischemic heart disease offer an icd but offering an icd or discussing an icd is not practical and therefore doing an ep study in that group is all the more valuable because reliability of ep study is high and you will pick up the right candidate and give say one life for three patients as we know in madit 1 and must rather than in madit 2 yeah, those those numbers are really they are very important very powerful. so ep study has a strong role in ischemic heart disease subset thank you thank you dr padani for your very very uh, simple and we now move on to the next talk by dr saurabh deshpande on the rational of icd programming detection and therapies hi good evening everyone uh, i know this is the like second last lecture of the day and all of you are exhausted with the bombardment of knowledge that has been come <laughs> your way uh, my topic unfortunately is not a very mainstream topic i would say uh, it is more of a intricate uh, topic once you put an icd how to go about it so uh, if there is a problem uh, then how to go about it so can you go to the next slide so whenever we speak about or think about icd uh, these are the gentlemen that we know uh, they have been uh, uh, instrumental in giving us the first icd uh, we had already discussed the how the icd uh, evolved over the over these years the important thing is we didn't have 
uh, a programmable ICD right till 1988. So till the time the programming was either external or not very well done. So that is how the, pro the programming part is relatively new as compared to uh, when we talk about ICD per se. Now, uh, this has been discussed in the prior, uh, previous lecture. The only the important difference is whenever a patient has sudden cardiac arrest history, it will be say, uh, uh, secondary prevention, otherwise it is a primary prevention. And all the guidelines, as I've suggested, the patient should have a reasonable quality of life when we are considering in the implantation of an ICD in that particular patient. And these are the indications which have been uh, already discussed in the previous uh, talk. So whenever we speak about the ICD programming, ICD has two parts. It has a low energy output part, it has a high energy output part. So we have to program the low energy or the pacing part as well as the high energy part in that particular patient. We have to know whether the patient has some AV nodal conduction or SA nodal conduction. The pacing changes according to that. We have to have the arrhythmias uh, if we have any ECG or uh, details of arrhythmias there and we can actually program those ICDs. If possible, we should know whether those arrhythmias are being, had been treated with ATPs before, pacing before, so that we can program accordingly. And we should always and always focus on the ventricular arrhythmias in all these patients uh, other than all other arrhythmias. Whenever we discuss about arrhythmia programming for the ICDs, we should think about the appropriateness of therapy, as has been uh, very clearly uh, discussed by Narsimhan sir some time back, that we should not ever try to give uh, uh, non-inappropriate non therapy in any of the patients. So that is where the programming part of the ICD becomes very necessary in each and every patient that we implant ICD. Uh, this uh, has been covered in some part in previous study. Uh, there have been very good and uh, big studies in this particular reason, so in this particular area. So you have different effects of shock. So even a single shock in any patient can be deleterious in the form of increasing mortality, increasing uh, myocardial injury at that particular time, decreasing the cardiac index, which again is a part of uh, myocardial injury. Patient may have increased heart failure admissions. That is very important. Uh, we won't think that shock will particularly result in heart failure admission, but that has been what is seen. And the most debilitating part of any shock is something called as phantom shocks. So what does it mean is if the person has had shock in the past, they always feel, uh, you, you might have had some patients in your practice as well. The, actually, the ICD has not delivered shock, but because the patient has had that experience before, they experience it at the time when it is not there. So that is a very distressing and depressing uh, feeling for the patient. So the goals of ICD programming in any patient when we put ICD is we have to detect the high rate events properly. We have to avoid the treatments for NSVTs, which can be hemodynamically stable or very short, where we actually can uh, treat them with medications or leave them alone. We should discriminate properly with SVT and VT because, again, uh, as discussed before, we should not give inappropriate shocks. We should try to give a minimum shock. So I'll be coming to that, how to minimize the shock in a particular patient. We should all, uh, if it is possible, in some ICDs, there is a possibility of monitoring of other arrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation, or monitoring of heart failure as well. So if we have those type of ICDs at our disposal, we can use those uh, things as well for monitoring a particular patient. Now. Uh, as we had discussed some time back about the primary and secondary prevention ICD, there, has been, there have been some uh, population-based studies uh, regarding this. And what they have found is, in general, a particular patient, when we are considering for primary prevention ICD, they, have, they are found to have a higher NYHA functional class. They are found to have worse LVEF, found to have lower probability of first theory. Uh, first therapy and higher chances of subsequent shock uh, in the future. As against, if you think about the secondary prevention ICDs, they were relatively less symptomatic with a better EF and they had very high probability of uh, first appropriate therapy. So this is what has been found in the in all these studies which I have been uh, I have uh, written down. The earliest uh, registry is in 2021. So. Uh, whenever we are thinking about the programming, we should know what the underlying disease is, as was discussed some time back, the 1.5 prevention and the non-ischemic and ischemic cardiomyopathy. So we should know what is happening to the patient. We should know if the patient has the chances of higher defibrillation threshold. 
if you, we should think about the age again, the comorbidities and the, uh, the likely possibility of uh, uh, death in recent time. And we should think about the primary or the secondary prevention role before deciding uh, whether we are putting uh, how to program an ICD. Choice of device, I will not be dwelling because that is the next uh, speaker's job. I'll go into the arrhythmia detection and the termination of the VTVF and if, the, uh, if we have at the, our disposal some alerts, so I'll be discussing about those. Now, uh, coming to the arrhythmia detection, so uh, the, uh, any of you who have come across ICD, there is something called as zones. So th those zones have to be properly uh, programmed in a particular patient, depending on those things which we discussed before. So there is something called a single zone or VF, single VF zone monitoring uh, programming, or there is something called as dual or triple zone programming, that is a VT plus VF zone. So there has been a concept uh, that whenever you have a uh, channelopathy and uh, the chances of ventricular fibrillation is high and the patient does not have any evidence of structural uh, heart disease, even on MRI or whatever test you have done, then you are well off not putting the patient on a VT zone and keep the patient only on VF zone. So that is what is called a single zone programming. But most of the patients that we see in our practice are either ischemic cardiomyopathy or have had some VT in the past. So they fall into the second zone, that is the uh, VT plus VF zone programming. There, we should know whether the MMVT, the monomorphic VT, is responsive to ATP or not, and accordingly we program ATP. So what, what do you mean by ATP is anti-tachycardia pacing. At that point of time, when you program an ATP, the ICD delivers pacing at a particular programmed rate in the bursts of eight in most of the ICDs, and that is how uh, we try to terminate that particular event with that anti-tachycardia pacing. The advantage with that is the amount of energy required for anti-tachycardia pacing is far less as compared to shock, and the patient does not understand if the ATP has been given. Whenever patient receives shock, they will know that shock has been received, but it is not the case with ATP. So we should always try to look at those MMVTs if they are ATP sensitive and program those. There are some medicines that we use for uh, anti as antiarrhythmics, uh, which can decrease need for these therapies, and uh, some act in a, uh, in the completely opposite uh, manner. Now, uh, coming to the detection rate, whenever uh, we discuss about the zone programming, we should know what, how the heart rates that we want uh, to be programmed in a particular patient. So that is what is called as the detection rate. So how will you detect the arrhythmia? So the, this is the primary discriminator of arrhythmia dissection because that is how you change the zones. The zone will be based on the heart rate. The, we should know whether, we should understand whether SVT discrimination should be there in a particular zone at particular heart rate or not, whether it is required for a particular patient. So the general recommendations are, if you have a VF zone, it has to be at least 200 beat per minute, or in some uh, studies it has been seen to be 220 beats per minute, with or without SVT discrimination. Again, that change difference differs from company to company. If you have, we are programming a VT zone, either single or dual, now it depends on what are the arrhythmias that you have. So if you have a single VT morphology, you are well off programming single VT zone. If you have multiple morphology PVCs, uh, VTs, and some of those VTs are shorter, uh, that is higher cycle length, that is 150, 160 heart rate, and those are hemodynamically significant, you are well off programming a two zone VT uh, than a single zone of VT. Uh, this has been alluded to before in Dr. Narsimhan sir's uh, talk. So uh, this, this is how we can reduce the shocks. So that is, uh, there is something called as detection interval. So we, we discussed about the detection rate. Now we are coming to the detection interval. So the higher detection interval helps us decreasing therapies for NSVTs or hemodynamically stable, uh, stable VTs and overall reduction in shock. So there have been multiple studies. So there is something called as empiric study that tried it in a certain way. Again, that time they, were pro they had programmed it uh, delay of 16 and 24, as you can see here. If you go to the prepare study, they, they took slightly higher uh, beats to detect. So the, the, those were detected at 30 to 40 or up to 32 in that particular study. And what is uniform in all these studies, uh, this particular study, which is MADIT RIT, they tried to detect uh, VT slowly. So they gave time for the ICD to detect VT giving, uh, before giving the therapy. 
But what is uh, same in all these studies is all these studies have shown reduction in shock. So the message at, at the end of this particular um, uh, uh, section is we have to somehow reduce the shocks and try to prepare the patient with ATP therapy so that uh, the overall uh, mortality and morbidity will be less. So coming to the base, the first part of the programming, uh, there is not much difference between the primary and secondary uh, prevention ICD if the patient has structural heart disease. But if patient does not have structural heart disease, we, we are well off programming a single zone. Detection rates are standardized. There have been uh, very recent article and very recent guidelines to program the detection rates. And they have been uh, uh, like this as are shown. And we have to be as late as detecting, as delayed at detecting those VT and VF as possible so that to avoid therapy and shock in, a, uh, in patients who, uh, who have NSVTs or hemodynamically tolerated VTs. Now coming to the second part is sec SVT discrimination. So what does it mean is you have to see whether you are giving the shock properly in a particular patient. That is what is required when you talk about SVT discrimination. Now, most of our ICDs, because of the uh, like economic uh, burden, uh, are single chamber ICDs in our day-to-day uh, -day practice. So there, is, there are two types of discriminators available in those ICDs. The most commonly used is the single chamber discriminator. And the second part is a dual chamber discriminator. So when you talk about single chamber discriminator, we, we, th we see whether the patient has uh, where, uh, the, how, the arrhythmia has, how, how is the onset of the arrhythmia? It can be different in SVT and VT. How is the stability of the arrhythmia? So that is something, uh, if you, st what do you mean by stability is? The RR. So if you detect AF, uh, the patient, the ICD will, de uh, if it is the irregular RR, RR patient, uh, the ICD will tell it is AF and will not shock. And there is something called as morphology criteria, which can be there. So there are multiple companies which are available, out of which one of these, uh, the Sorin one is not available in India. But out of uh, other four, uh, four companies, we have to program these onset stability and morphology criteria as per the requirement of a particular patient just to avoid inappropriate shocks in that patient. Similar to coming to the dual chamber uh, type of ICDs, this can be used either in uh, two chamber lead, a three chamber, uh, two chamber device, three chamber device, or the uh, recent four chamber de four uh, lead device, which is the lot CRT or hot CRT. The criteria range from it compares the rate of atrial and ventricular uh, deflections which are seen by the ICD. It sees whether there is AV dissociation. It sees where the tachycardia started, whether it started in atria or the ventricle, it see, look at, looks at the atrial EGM and looks whether it is something called as PMT, that is retrograde activation from ventricle coming up. So, and there is something called as PR relationship. So, uh, it is not that every device and every company will give you all these discriminators, but whenever you get a patient and you have put uh, dual chamber ICD, you should look at May any of these parameters, if they are available, and program accordingly to again reduce uh, inappropriate shocks. So, uh, if SVT discrimination remains almost the same in primary versus secondary, the only difference will be uh, if it is a single VF zone, it can uh, put a single chamber, uh, single zone uh, ICD uh, discrimination. Now that uh, the, uh, the important part as I have written here, the SVT discrimination in single zone ICDs is, is currently available only in the devices by Medtronic and no other devices with single VF pro zone programming have uh, that particular uh, luxury at our hand. Now, VTVF termination is very important because that is why we are putting ICD. And uh, we should look at the VTs and fast VTs if they can be terminated by anti-tachycardia pacing. What has been found in many of these studies that there has been 70% of times that you, these monomorphic VTs actually can be terminated by uh, these um, uh, particular anti-tachycardia therapies. And here, the efficacy is maintained even at higher detection rates, which we had discussed before. But always, the physician tailored ATP is better than the predefined ATP, which is given by the company itself. 
Now, the, the, there has been, there have been few studies which tried to look at uh, longer ATPs versus shorter ATPs, but it has not, not been found uh, very useful. So, it is a standard protocol to, uh, by default, program all the ATPs or anti-tachycardia pacing as eight pulses. In bi pacing, now, there, 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 is, there is a chance that, uh, there is a lower chance of arrhythmia acceleration than RV only uh, ATP. That is important uh, in a particular patient. Sorry. Now, VF termination, again, is very important. Uh, always, whenever you have a, a tachycardia going on at the rate of two, more than 250, or in some ICDs, we put it at 220, you directly shock. You don't go for ATP, you directly shock the patient, because that will be completely uh, unjustified waiting for in such scenario. There are recent uh, advances in this particular thing. The, the charging times have been reduced. There have been uh, some studies where ATPs have been tried, but again, those are only during charging, and you should always have a backup shock in those particular, that particular patient. There is something called as programmability of shocking pathway. So as was discussed in uh, the defibrillation talk by uh, Dr. Shinde, that there are multiple types of uh, shocking pathways. You have a monophasic or biphasic, or sometimes you can program a triphasic. Uh, a pathway of shocking, but it, it is not there in every ICD that we see. Again, the dual coil ICD versus single coil is a very big debate. It has been going on since a long time, but uh, nowadays because of the uh, problems with lead extraction, most of the patients, we prefer single coil ICD than a dual coil ICD. Now, uh, coming to the ventricular arrhythmia termination in any situation, as I discussed, there is feasibility of ATP should be checked, and it has to be programmed whenever possible. Uh, th this, these two points, the device alert, the AF and HF alerts, may not be available in a particular ICD, uh, but they uh, can be used, and they can be programmed if possible, but most of these are non-programmable. Uh, the, the clinical alerts can be programmable with a limited uh, capacity, uh, so including the fast NSVT detection, AF detection, or the heart failure detection if you have a particular uh, uh, algorithm in place or uh, some um, uh, accelerometer in place which can actually detect the alerts uh, like that. So this is just um, uh, an overview of what I spoke till now, and th this is how uh, the ICD programming goes and differences between the primary and secondary prevention. There has been, this is a very recent uh, uh, guideline which is there, so if, if, if at all you don't want to remember any of the things which I spoke, just download these guidelines whenever you are in a doubt. Go to these guidelines, they have company-specific rates and detection rhythms and everything written there so that in a particular patient you can, uh, these can guide you and they can help us with proper detection and therapy for a particular patient. So uh, the, uh, to conclude, uh, ICD programming is essential. It is not very good to keep the ICD in the factory setting which we get most of the times, especially in cases where there are higher chances of inappropriate therapies and shocks. So we have to, our aim is to prevent shock, aim is to prevent inappropriate therapy. So that is where the uh, proper programmability of the programming of the ICD uh, comes into play. The programming should be individualized. It is very important, as we discussed before, the ischemic, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and multiple other comorbidities and other covariates which are there. So we should do it accordingly. And most of the times, the secondary prevention ICDs need more attention. You have to add more zones many a times based on the clinical arrhythmias that you have. The st uh, food for thought, uh, this is still in pipeline. So as I discussed before, the role of ATP and uh, the, the, the trialists and the, uh, the authors are trying to investigate whether it is possible to use uh, the ATP in a particular situation where you are putting a primary prevention ICD. This, the study results are still awaited, but this appraised ATP study might help us in further uh, refining our programming, especially in patients who have uh, primary prevention ICD. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Saurabh. I think if there are any questions, or we can move on to the last topic. Thank you. That is by Dr. Heyman Gokne. Thank you very much. Please. It's not good. Okay. Okay.
Okay, just going ahead. Okay, uh, myself, Dr. Hemant. Uh, I'm working as associate professor at JJ Hospital, Mumbai. I'll be talking on uh, rational use of intracardiac defibrillators. So basically, uh, now we are all through what is uh, ICD, how the ICD is programmed. Dr. Saurabh has greatly elaborated on the uh, device programming as well. So now let's see the point that he left is how to choose an ICD. There are various types of ICD. There are some three, four types which we are going to see. So. Okay, I don't have financial disclosures. Okay, so basically, uh, it is a we all know it is an implantable device which is used for treating life-threatening arrhythmias. So uh, there are there is a single chamber ICD, there is a dual chamber ICD, and there is a CRTD that is cardiac resynchronization therapy with a defibrillator lead. Okay, so uh, basically, this is what we normally see. This is a defibrillator. This is the uh, intracardiac defibrillator, it just fits on the size of the palm. It is actually a miniaturized version of this particular big device that you have in your hospitals, OTs, and ICUs. Then this particular device, this can, this is called as a can, and it is made up of these components. One of the most important component is a battery, and uh, then there is a capacitor, then there are, there are different ports, and it is almost like a mini computer in your body. So, uh, as uh, Dr. Saurabh told, there are two shocking coils. Now we have single coil, dual coil. So this is basically a lid which, which, is, which is implanted into the chamber and it goes around into a subcutaneous pocket through the subclavian vein and is attached to the intracardiac defibrillator. Okay, so this is single chamber, simple one lid placed in right ventricle. Dual chamber, two lids, one in right atrium, one in right ventricle. And bioventricular device, combo device, CRTD. What is what is this RA, right ventricle, and one lead which goes through coronary sinus and is placed on the left ventricle, posterior lateral aspect. Is this is called as a bioventricular device. So we'll I'll I'll just skip this part. Indications have been done uh, quite elaborately with, uh, by Dr. Rajesh as well, primary prevention, secondary prevention. Now let's come to the devices. So this is how a CRT looks, just as I have told. Uh, the venous, this is the left ventricular lead, this is the right ventricular lead, and this is the right atrial lead. Okay, now uh, CRTD indications are something which has not been covered. Uh, basically we should have a left bundle branch block with a QRS more than 150, chronic heart failure patients on medical management, NYHA class two to four, and patients are, uh, patient, uh, patient are on, already on optimal medical management. Despite that, they are functional. The functional class is two to four. Uh, this has class one level A evidence. Now, uh, QRS 120 to 150 milliseconds with rest same is also one B. Non-LBBB patients, two A is the uh, level of uh, class of indication. And it should, uh, non-LBB with QRS 120 to 150 is 2B. And most importantly, it is not to be done in normal QRS patients. And it is all, it is contraindicated. Uh, it is still controversial, but you can remember it is contraindicated. So what happens in CRT is there is a left bundle blanch block underlying. There is a wide QRS. Then uh, this is how the left ventricular conduction is there. There is a ventricular dyssynchrony. And there is, we can, we, have, we, we can pace from two points of ventricle. One is right ventricle subendocardium, and the other one is left ventricle posterior lateral aspect. So that when we pace both of the uh, aspects of the same chamber, dilated chamber, we get a uh, summated QRS complex, which is quite narrow, and this uh, eliminates the dyssynchrony that is present, thereby improving ejection fraction and thereby causing pulmonary decongestion. Okay, so basically NYJ class two to four, EF less than 35%, QRS more than 130 milliseconds is the, is the indication for CRTD. Uh, so any HFREF patients, LBB patients, and non-ischemic DCM, they all should fulfill these criteria to be posted for CRT procedure. It also, it, so ultimately, it basically is proven uh, therapy for heart failure. So what happens when you implant a CRT? 
it's uh, simple this is a normal uh, heart failure course natural history when the patient continues to deteriorate with repeated attacks of acute decongestive heart failure decompensated heart failure and but when a patient is posted for crt he is given a crt then there are following outcomes do change and we can have a full remission we can have a partial remission whatever happens it is always better than the original natural history of the patient okay so now this is how a single chamber icd looks on uh, x ray this is how a dual chamber icd looks on x ray ap view and lateral view okay now uh, uh, already the device interrogation part has been covered nicely by dr sora but only one uh, importance that why, what is the role of choosing single chamber dual chamber why do we do that so this is a tracing from a icd interrogation uh, done first a is from a single chamber uh, icd device so here the star shows there is a onset of arrhythmia that is supraventricular tachycardia the arrhythmia onset starts device thinks device is a single chamber icd okay this a is single chamber icd device what dr sourav also told that it it has for it has morphological criteria onset criteria so by onset criteria it thinks that it is a ventricular tachycardia since it is rapid since it is sudden and uh, it follows some of the morphological criteria so it gives atp which are totally unnecessary and it gives a shock now in atrial tachycardia a shock will rarely uh, cause termination of tachycardia and the tachycardia continues so this is how you the patient gets an inappropriate shock a patient of single chamber icd who who has a svt this is how he gets a shock but contrary if the if that patient has a dual chamber icd means he has one lead in right atrium one lead in right ventricle the svt starts then both of the leads read the arrhythmia well they see that the both a and v that is the atrial signal and ventricular signal are coinciding well and it does not give any therapy it does not give atp it does not give uh, shock and that patient's inappropriate shock is prevented so apart from device programming it has a great role in uh, in avoiding inappropriate shocks okay so it has it has been shown that uh, almost uh, with a current generation dual chamber detection enhancements there is a significantly re lower rate of inappropriate detection from 40% it has decreased to 30% okay so uh, why dual chamber is preferred over single chamber so it has enhanced diagnostic capabilities that we have just now seen it it helps us to have improved arrhythmia detection detection of supraventricular tachycardias atrial fibrillations v to a conduction a to v conduction in a temporal fashion it can be studied uh, it can optimize the therapy delivery uh, it can also when a patient that patient, particular patient requires pacing there is in a single chamber single chamber icd it will pace only right ventricle so if patient's ejection fraction is moderately compromised he can further worsen the uh, right ventricular function and it can cause it can cause rv cardiomyopathy with uh, with pacing also that will be non synchronized pacing so it will be not helpful for the patient so in this particular case in dual chamber icd patient will have benefits of a dual chamber pacemaker that is a will be followed by v so there is a maintenance of a to v synchrony and it will be good for the patient's myocardium okay so this is what we discussed now um some other types of icds that we are going to just overview this is called as a subcutaneous icd this is basically an icd which is implanted on the over the ribs in, under the skin and which uh, there is a lid which is tunneled and placed vertically or just besides the sternum this particular icd is uh, is lesser invasive we don't have to basically go into the intravascular structure it is placed over the uh, over the torso 
where do we, where is it used it is used when there is no any pacing requirement for the heart basically uh, healthy hearts channelopathies or if there is a congenital heart disease if there is a chamber problem chamber uh, tricuspid atresias or any other complex congenital heart disease uh, lv non compaction uh, venous occlusion thrombosis lid infection in such cases this particular icd can be used uh, th then the other one is wearable icd this is basically a vest and uh, it ha it has uh, uh, self gelling defibrillation electrodes over the back over the front there is a defibrillation uh, uh, battery and there is a button where you can record uh, the record the events and uh, it is a wearable icd now th this is this is used uh, particularly as a transit or a temporary method for uh, defibrillation uh, post mi severe compromise lv at risk comor multiple comorbidities or patient awaiting transplant patient just post transplant post bypass these are the candidates who are uh, considered for wearable icds costs for subcut icd and wearable icds remain high Uh, to be used in our country as yet okay so this is now coming up that is lot crt which is a lb left bundle branch optimized cardiac resynchronization therapy so as we know these days rv cardiomyopathy is coming up as a big concern for everyone especially patient requiring pacing uh, requiring pacemakers so his bundle pacing which is now uh, not much used but lb bundle pacing is uh, now a preferred pacing method for uh, pacemakers so this is a strategy which utilizes three lids that is right atrium the right ventricle and the third lid which is normally paced in coronary sinus in crt instead of that the his bundle that is left bundle lead is used and uh, it is uh, placed at the left bundle position on the interventricular septum just at the left bundle so what happens is this wide qrs is converted into this narrow qrs and uh, if uh, effect of crt is obtained because this will be the pacing lead for the uh, patient and since it is present at the conduction system there will be a synchronized pacing of the chamber thereby eliminating dyssynchrony so there will be no dyssynchrony and the icd lead will be help will be there which will be a df1 lead for uh, for protection patient for uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia or vf okay so uh, this is like a summary slide for this uh, particular uh, uh, presentation so uh, as a, as physicians you all, you all have patients who have been advised icd who come with arrhythmias uh, who have vts who have vfs who are survivor of cardiac arrest so just pulling all those patients what we need to do is we need to get a good ecg 12 led ecg and uh, we need to do a good echo Uh, echo mainly for ejection fraction and to see whether specifically to see whether there is a lv dyssynchrony or not so if the ejection fraction is down it's less than 30% percent and severely compromised lv function is there then we just have to look at the qrs if it is wide then the patient goes uh, patient needs to go for uh, crt that is a, a by we pacing so if it fulfills the criteria for crtd then uh, preparation can be given as see uh, by b pacing if he is not fulfilling criteria for crt means lv is down but the qrs is narrow lv is not severely down lv is partially down in all these situations and then we have to assess the patient for atrial disease now uh, as we uh, studied in the morning uh, role of imaging so in this here we can have help we can take help of imaging basically cardiac mri will give us a very good uh, picture of atria it can give us atrial infiltration lge can be can be uh, seen in uh, uh, seen in atria and if there is no atrial disease or, or uh, there is less likely need of pacing patient is young healthy and uh, he might not need pacing or he is one of the primary uh, prevention criteria then you can straight away give the patient single chamber icd if the patient is has atrial disease on mri or he has history of some svt he has some af intermittently at is going on or his av conduction av av node is showing pauses which 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 indicate that he might need pacemaker in future 
then in that particular case you need to go for dual chamber icd and uh, of these patients who have any technical issues that is then or they are young we can c consider them from sub for subcutaneous icd and in transit or temporary in this category only we can use it as variable icd these two icds will not have an option for pacing the pacing the heart these two will have option of pacing the heart this will be dyssynchronous pacing this will be a to v synchrony maintaining pacing and this particular segment is pacing in such a way that the heart failure takes takes care takes uh, is uh, issue is sorted out that is we have regaining the uh, synchrony of the left ventricle along with survival benefit given by the icd lead so also now lot crt that i have discussed can be used alternatively for crt by v pacing these days studies are yet to be i mean they are still in uh, process but it has also been it it it, it is an up upcoming alternative for failed crts abnormal cs and uh, cs anatomies um, or sometimes non responders um, lbb lot that is a hot or lot crt can be preferred this is still under uh, we have we are doing cases for presently we are doing lbb CR, uh, lot crt only for patients who are fulfilling crt criteria but the, there is a lot of research going on whether we can be the, whether we can take the patients who are not fitting in the crtd criteria so uh, so finally icds they are single dual crt single you can go ahead when there is an, uh, not much pacing need or no more no atrial arrhythmias dual for uh, atrial arrhythmias and uh, uh, any sinus node dysfunction av block dual chamber icd is to be preferred crtd is a totally different heart failure device with a specific uh, criteria for taking the patient for crtd and uh, lot crt subcut id variable icd are the alternatives that are available at present presently the issue is dual chamber icd cost it is quite expensive so although we have these advantages of uh, uh, the, uh, the advantage is on paper the cost is quite prohibitive right now thank you thank you thank you dr kokne just the last question uh, i think everybody is tired last session oh, oh. Um, but uh, last question uh, you have you, you showed in your slide that you have patients who are who qualify for an icd but sometimes cannot qualify for crt Uh, how often you see the other way around? Patients are qualifying for CRT, but they don't qualify for an ICD. How, how often does that happen? Uh, sir, in that case, we have option for CRT pacing. pacing. Which, which but, kind of patients are those? Sir, basically the patients who are, uh, uh, they have done a, what we are following right now is we get a cardiac MRI. We are using cardiac MRI extensively. No scarring. There is a history of myocarditis. There is a reversible component to that particular LV dysfunction, slightly. then maybe we can consider only pacing and patient is not managed uh, very well on medical management medical therapy is not maintaining apart from cost is there any downside of putting a crtd regardless of whether it icd is indicated or not uh, i didn't get sir uh, apart from cost yes sir uh, is there any downside of putting in a CR, putting in crtd instead of crtp sir crtd is to be preferred there is no downside of putting a crtd it has to it is preferred it is to be preferred because this question might arise in a patient of dilated cardiomyopathy in ischemic cardiomyopathy you have a low threshold for putting a crtd d but if the patient has dilated cardiomyopathy yes sir you know patient qualifies for biventricular pacing but as we just discussed that in, you know danish trial has shown that putting in icd in this patient may not help so maybe in such a patient crtp may be a better option yes yeah, yeah, no, i think this is a very valid question and yes. you know, partly answered it also by saying that in a non ischemic cardio so the, this question will be uh, only in non ischemic cardiomyopathy not in the ischemic cardiomyopathy group so in the non ischemic cardiomyopathy group you look at who are likely to be good responders because if they cross the threshold by your bioventricular pacing to more than 35 40% ef they are not going to use their icd at all so 
one of the things you do is a cardiac MR and see that there's no myocardial fibrosis. Fibrosis is a strong indicator of arrhythmic events happening later and a defibrillator is a good choice. Now the downside which you are talking, it's true that apart from the cause there is no downside, but let's not miss on the fact that the ICD lead is a bigger lead, stronger lead. I mean lead related complications are less than 1% but not that they are 0% also. So lead perforations, uh, extraction of lead, those things can be an issue. So I, in my practice, uh, when the question comes up of CRT P versus D in the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy group, I have more than 60-70% of patients being offered only CRT P based on the suggestion that there is no myocardial scarring and I think that they are likely to be responders. So who are likely to be responders and super responders? I think we can gauge on certain clinical criteria. If you have a typical left bundle branch block, if you have a female gender, if you have a hypertensive patient who has gone into a dilated phase, these are very likely to be responders and super responders. While doing the device, also if you find a good cardiac vein, if you've got good, good resynchronization, uh, you know, possible. Sometimes the cardiac vein is not good and you don't expect a good uh, kind of long-term outcome. You may at, on the table also decide that I will put in a, a CRT D rather than only a CRT P. So you can take that decision. But I and Yash have been conservative and we are proponents of CRT P equally as uh, defibrillator. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you very much, Dr. Kupne. Thank you, sir. I would like to conclude today's meeting now. I don't want to test your patience anymore. Uh, we're done. The, the, the panel discussion, uh, we, we'll, we'll just uh, cancel it. We, have, we had enough discussion after you know, every talk, and the, the discussion was very interesting. I thank particularly those who, are, who have stayed till the end of the conference. I, I, I really appreciate their patience and their uh, willingness to learn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending this meeting, the faculty, the audience, the sponsors, and people who helped me in this, in this meeting. Thanks, thanks all. Uh, for today's meeting on sudden cardiac death, uh, all of us read the news about sudden deaths involving a uh, lot of celebrities, a lot of doctors. And that is something which really disturbs us because most of them are leading a very productive life when such mishaps happen. Uh, so we decided to have a complete session on sudden cardiac death. Which would, which would uh, include an, an encompass uh, all possible aspects of sudden death. And fortunately, we could pick up an excellent faculty for uh, discussing this topic. Uh, there are about uh, 16 talks. Um, nine of them will be physical, that is the, the speakers will be present here, and eight of them are online. Uh, we have uh, got this uh, great uh, idea of doing offline lectures because of COVID pandemic and it has stuck on. So, uh, I will be the first speaker and uh, I will start with my uh, first talk on sudden cardiac death, who is at risk? We have the first slide.
so how do you say what was this all of you would be able to recall these cases these are all certain celebrities who have died suddenly uh, in last couple of years last two to three years most of them we are familiar most cases were familiar with because most of them are celebrities we see them all the time in public functions and on, on, in electronic media um, these are mainly from the entertainment industry now not only the celebrities from entertainment media but there are a number of uh, very prominent cardiologists who have died suddenly in their 40s and 50s and many of you may be knowing these people they were friends good colleagues and very renowned cardiologists um, so the question is why do these things happen can we predict who would die suddenly and in my uh, talk i'm just going to talk about uh, the what are the what are the uh, clinical features what are the uh, clinical parameters which can predict sudden death uh, now the problem is the most important predictor of sudden death is prior history of sudden death now if you have a prior history of sudden death you can predict that this patient is at a very high risk of dying suddenly but the problem is uh, first of all who die patients who have sudden death the chances of their survival even if get they get cpr are very small today if somebody dies suddenly on 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 the street the chances that uh, he will get help and be alive are less than 5% and this is not only in india even abroad this figures are little better but the overall the situation has a lot of scope for improvement now in mumbai there was there was a lot of uh, publicity given to certain important lives saved because of uh, automatic external defibrillators now at the center this is dr ajit desai uh, a renowned cardiologist happened to be my teacher at nair hospital he saved one life when he was playing badminton in mumbai and he was playing with him patient suddenly collapsed and because of uh, a very uh, uh, laudable activity which has been uh, created by people from mumbai which has been perpetuated by them and, and spread by them uh, there are number of aids which are now available in mumbai between bandra and santa cruz number of aids have been put and because of those that one of the aids this particular gentleman was saved he was shocked and his life was saved a similar uh, episode happened before that when a 77 year old architect who designed the rooftop restaurant at ambassador hotel and nehru planetarium suffered cardiac arrest and collapsed on the on the on carter road a businessman called samir firasta he was out on his morning walk he started giving him cpr firasta also asked a bystander to rush to the nearby potters club to get an aed and then he shocked him before the patient and, and after that the patient started breathing so these are some uh, you know heroic uh, things which people can do if you train them properly and if you have facilities of aed in the city now are we are we there yet i don't think we are there yet we we need to have more and more number of aeds available more and more people they, those need to be trained for this and we'll be talking about it in in the, in the symposium uh, today now incidence of sudden death in men and women increases with age now all of you know this i mean there is no rocket science here if you just go as the age advances from 55 65 75 the incidence of sudden death both in women and men goes up now if you really look at the cause of sudden death 70% of sudden deaths are caused by ischemic heart disease either acute coronary syndrome or acute myocardial infarction 
10% people have non-ischemic structural heart disease, 10% have channelopathies, and 10% have non-cardiac causes. Now, I don't, this is a busy slide, I don't think you will be able to read it from a distance, but these are the causes which are, uh, you know, broken down into different, uh, under different headings. Ischemic heart disease could be myocardial infarction, unstable angina, coronary artery dissection, coronary artery spasm. Non-ischemic heart disease could be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, uh, and so on. Uh, there are there are situations where it's don't, there is no structural heart disease, like primary electrical disease, Brugada syndrome, long QT syndrome, complete heart block, and certain non-cardiac non causes, that, like pulmonary embolism or intracranial hemorrhage, drowning, etc. Uh, we'll be focusing mainly on uh, the, the, the upper three. Now, this, uh, if you really look at what, uh, what is the pathology uh, in people who die suddenly? So this was a study published in 2011 in JAG where they studied non-traumatic sudden deaths in 900 subjects at autopsy. And their average age was 38 plus minus 11 years. So about average age was about 40. And what did the autopsy show? Uh, it shows, you can see here, you now you know the black bars are men, the grey bars are women, and the white bars, open bars, are those who had coronary artery disease as a cause of sudden death. And you can see here that there is a sudden jump in coronary artery disease after the age of 40, here. And not only the incidence, but the incidence of coronary artery disease as a cause of sudden death also takes a big jump after 40. Now, interest, it is interesting to see here that if you look at the females, the, the jump occurs from here to here. You know, the incidence of sudden deaths in females up to the age of 45, 49 for that matter is, is, is small, but there is a sudden jump from here to here. As against males, the jump is right at this point, around 40. So it tells you that women uh, are protected from sudden death because of you know, their hormonal status before the menopause. And coronary artery disease uh, takes uh, the big role here. Now, out of these um, deaths, you know, almost 68% were witnessed. And out of these, 361 were associated with exertion. Now, what was the activity which was being performed when the patients died suddenly? Now, you can see here that almost half of them were doing recreational sport. Running, 31%, basketball, 5%, and then walking, uh, sorry, walking, swimming, weightlifting, baseball, so all kind of recreational sport. Uh, about 38% of the total were during military training. So you can see that, uh, you know, 60% of people, 68%, I would say 70% of people died during some physical activity. Um, so that is important to, to, to be noted. Now, uh, causes of specific findings in 902 cases, you can see here that sudden unexplained death under the age of 35 was common. Where no cause could be found in 41%. While atherosclerotic coronary artery disease was seen in 73% of people who were above 35 years of age. So age is a clearly a very important factor. Beyond the age of 35-40, coronary artery disease takes uh, the cake, while here, less than when the age is less than 35, uh, most of the times the deaths remain unexplained. And then there are other important causes like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, anomalous coronaries, uh, hypertensive cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia. These are some other important causes. Now, coronary artery disease increases the risk of sudden death after the age of 40. Now, you can see here that I have already showed you in the previous slide that um, both in men and women, uh, the incidence of coronary artery disease increases, and then myocardial infarction uh, plays the biggest role here. 
Now, this is an interesting study which was published in 2007, where people who had unexplained sudden death, that they could not find anything at autopsy, they did their genetic, test, genetic testing. And this was a very interesting study, very interesting findings too. Uh, like here, you can see that there were total 49 cases, 31 males and 18 females. Now, when the genetic study was performed, post-mortem, you know, by taking their DNA, they found that about 8 of the males had abnormal mutation which could explain their sudden death. While almost 50% of females had that abnormal uh, genotype. And you can see these were the genotypes which were found. Uh, out of those total, you know, the cases which were positive, uh, 7 had RYR2 mutation which can cause polymorphic VT, catechol aminergic polymorphic VT. While KCNQ2, one mutation is seen in Roman Watt syndrome, which is an idiopathic long QT syndrome. This mutation, KCNH2, was seen in 6% short QT syndrome. And last mutation, which could explain Brugada, long QT, and dilated cardiomyopathy. So you can see here that, you know, almost 35% of the people who die suddenly without any abnormal finding at autopsy have some kind of genetic abnormality. Now, congestive heart failure. This is an extremely very, very important cause which predisposes to sudden death. And you can see here that both men and women, uh, when there is a history of uh, heart failure, the incidence of sudden death goes up very, very significantly as compared to those who do not have uh, history of congestive heart failure. Now, it is interesting that in heart failure, uh, the mode of death, the sudden death, is more common in less symptomatic people. So, who are NYHA class 1, NYHA class 2, are more likely to die with sudden death as compared to progressive heart failure and pump failure. And as the NYHA class progresses, uh, sudden death, the incidence of sudden death becomes less. Now, uh, probably, I mean, I, I don't know what, how it, what, what it means uh, in terms of treatment, uh, would, would that make our approach to treating these patients with ICDs, uh, will, it, will it differ in patients with higher NYHA class versus lower NYHA class? We'll discuss it during our sub subsequent uh, lectures. Now, what are the additional risk factors? Uh, this, is, I, I, this is a little busy slide, I don't know whether you are able to see it from a distance, but these, these are additive effects of risk factors on cardiovascular disease at 5 years. Now these patients are divided into four groups based on their systolic blood pressure. Now, systolic blood pressure of 110, 130, 150, 170. So, these, and then each uh, group is also divided based on their triglycerides, smoking, HDL, male, sex, diabetes, and 60 years old. Now, you can see here that for every group of high, you know, blood pressure, the higher the blood pressure, the higher the mortality, and higher the number of risk factors, the higher the mortality. So, for example, patient has diabetes, this group with diabetes. Now, this group with diabetes has not only diabetes, but they are males, they have, their HDL is also less than 39, they are smokers, and their total cholesterol is more than 270. So, more the number of risk factors, the higher the risk for every quartile of blood pressure you study. So, this is this becomes a constellation of risk factors. Uh, if you if you if you are a male with diabetes with one blood pressure of 170 or more, whose HDL is low, who smokes and his total cholesterol is high, then your risk of dying suddenly goes up very, very steeply. So it's not just one factor, but it's, it's, a, it's a continuum of risk which involves multiple risk factors. Now what are the transient 
or reversible causes of uh, sudden death. For that is also important to remember. One is acute myocardial infarction ischemia. All of us deal with this every day. Antiarrhythmic drugs. Now sometimes antiarrhythmic drugs can cause proarrhythmias and cause sudden death. Sometimes they get arrhythmias in spite of getting treatment because of antiarrhythmic drugs. Some medications which can produce long QT syndromes. Um, electrolyte abnormalities like hyper and hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia. Um, heart failure during the phase of decompensation. Sudden deaths are common. Severe acidosis and severe hypoxia. So these are certain other factors, acute reversible factors which can, which can contribute to sudden death. Now, this is my last slide, when, because you know, how to identify these uh, patients, what to do about it, that is going to be discussed during the day. Uh, I have just given you a broad overview of uh, the, the clinical features and the risk factors which predispose to sudden death. The most reliable predictor of sudden cardiac death is past history of sudden death. So if you have a past history of sudden death, and if fortunately the patient is alive, then you can give him an ICD and, and, and try to make sure that he, if, even if he gets sudden death again, he will be uh, uh, resuscitated. Females are at a substantially lower risk of sudden death than males. Uh, and, however, their, their sudden death risk increases steeply after the age of 50. The chance of getting resuscitated from sudden death is less than 5% in our country. There is a lot, lot of activity going on today in the country to increase the awareness about sudden death, increasing the awareness about the, the bystander CPR and how to use external defibrillators. Uh, and I hope this activity spreads uh, all across the country. Um, can we predict sudden death uh, who did not have prior sudden cardiac death? Now that is the million dollar question that we have to discuss today. Um, and that's most difficult and unfortunately our ability to predict sudden death in general population and in patients with heart disease is far from ideal. If today if a patient, you know, he, he reads in some, some news about uh, sudden death in a celebrity uh, two days ago, one day ago and he comes to you and asks you, you know, I'm, I'm scared, what's the risk of me dying suddenly? Now do we have uh, answer to this question? Can we satisfactorily answer those questions? I think uh, we'll have that discussion uh, in the course of uh, today's uh, seminar. But uh, I would uh, stop here. Um, I thank you for your uh, uh, attention. And if we have, if you have any questions, we can uh, discuss. Amit, you can come up on the stage. I think uh, this is a very important uh, aspect uh, and prevention of sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death is all. So I have a couple of comments uh, to make uh, over the years, what I've observed and my experience has been. The first is doctors, uh, we need to heal ourselves. Uh, unfortunately, the IMA data, the average lifespan of an Indian is almost 70 years now but the average lifespan of an Indian doctor is 10 years less than an average Indian. It's a, it's a very sad reflection on ourselves and we need to do something about it. And quite a few of these deaths in medicos is because of sudden cardiac arrest and we saw some examples. And therefore we need to, uh, I mean, as uh, Ajit said, we don't have a clue as to who is at risk of sudden cardiac arrest, but I think mental stress, we are unable to quantify the mental stress and the medicals undergoing mental stress is phenomenally high and we need to be able to take care of it. So I think we need to have a right lifestyle. All of us are going to have mental stress. Uh, every walk of life has mental stress, but in medicos probably it's much more. And to negate that mental stress, we need to have stress relieving activities or stress relieving factors which should be encouraged amongst all medicos. So this is in addition to uh, all the other conventional risk factors in us. 
so if we are hypertensive diabetic or have this lipidemia or a family history we cannot cannot smoke there can't be doctors smoking so i think those traditional risk factors we have to take care of it but in addition to negate the stress i would say that all of us need to encourage ourselves into getting into some of a, some form of yoga meditation 10 15 minutes a day so that we can withstand our stress through the day better and be able to judge our own symptoms i think some of the examples have been where we have neglected our own symptoms or not been able to gauge appropriately that we have some symptoms which we need to take care of it immediately so that's very important the second is about the uh, you know the entertainment industry person as having sudden cardiac arrest and that's where everybody starts questioning these people are so fit they are gymers they are bodybuilders they are very athletic in their look and yet they suffer sudden cardiac arrest i think in some of them i have a sense i i know uh, probably what could be the potential reason in vast majority i don't but smoking and substance abuse this is a problem so you cannot say that because i exercise regularly i do gymming regularly i have a good physique i can indulge in smoking no you can't do that so despite being very good in your diet and exercise if you indulge in other activities which can cause a plaque rupture and lead to sudden cardiac arrest it's useless because you see many people outside the gym finishing their workout and then smoking and you 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 know you land up into an arrest like situation so that's something which needs to be taken care of and finally a word about exercise now you know ajit very rightly pointed out that if you look at overall sudden cardiac arrest there are more cardiac arrest happening while exercising than cardiac arrest happening while not exercising that does not should not give a wrong signal that you should not be exercising believe me the incidence of coronary artery disease has gone down remarkably in the western world and in indian context the uh, incidence of coronary artery disease is rising now they have been able to do good work in terms of their lifestyle so both in terms of diet and in terms of exercise and we need to uh, learn from their example that if we want to reduce the incidence of coronary artery disease then we need to uh, definitely get into proper uh, diet and exercise and believe me 80% of cardiac arrest is because of uh, a plaque rupture and sudden cardiac death 20% might be uh, all other uh, you know cardiomyopathies and genetic issues so we need to focus primarily on coronary artery disease prevention and mainly prevention of those plaque ruptures insignificant plaques which even if you do a stress test is going to be negative so exercise is good for the heart the problem with exercise is that you cannot suddenly exercise you need to train yourself in exercise so whenever anybody starts exercise go slow and gradually build up your stamina is the goal is the key and you know no matter what you do there are going to be situations where you going to have cardiac arrest during exercise so our role is that to be able to identify a victim of cardiac arrest and give a good cpr and resuscitate from a cardiac arrest event so i would encourage that all schools all colleges all sporting events all marathon sessions you have to have a good medical team on standby with a defibrillator who can identify a victim of cardiac arrest do a proper cpr and prevent that sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death you have a, a nice example of a footballer in europe who had uh, you know a couple of years back he arrested on field but he got a cpr he got a defibrillator he is back on uh, pursuing his sport so that's the other message i wanted to give you that exercise is not bad the way we do it and how to prevent it and the last thing this is my own feeling is i would say that uh, statins are good in prevention of sudden cardiac arrest i think we need to be a little liberal in using statins is my uh, gut feeling the way we brought down goiter and you know iodine deficiency by fortifying salt with iodine i am almost uh, to another extreme which we which i think that we should fortify our uh, food with a little bit of statins because uh, statins 
in my opinion, help to stabilize the plaque. And uh, stabilization of the plaque will hopefully prevent uh, plaque rupture and a cardiac arrest. I, I think this is, uh, this is not something which you need to necessarily uh, follow, but question yourself, do a rant. Do, do a study. I think a population study is what is required. Do a population study wherever anybody can in terms of people who have been on statins. Because whatever retrospective information I get in terms of the middle-aged people who have died suddenly, uh, there are less number of people uh, have died suddenly who are on statins. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Amit, for your, those insightful comments. So, uh, if there are any... Uh, we have next talk ready. So uh, I think we'll, we'll take more comments and more questions as we progress uh, during the meeting. I think our uh, next talk is uh, on uh, its online talk by Dr. Uh, Kinjal Goyal uh, on bystander CPR for witnessed sudden cardiac arrest, a work in progress. Now, actually, Dr. Goyal is not a medical uh, professional. Uh, but she has done a lot of work. She continues to do a lot of work in uh, uh, teaching people uh, uh, these uh, by <coughs> bystander CPR, and he's very active in that field. Uh, let's move on to the next talk by Dr. Goel. Am I audible? Yes. Ma'am, you can start. Okay. Thank you so much. A very good morning to everyone present for the talk. Thank you, Dr. Bhagwat, for being kind enough to invite me for this. I looked through your brochure and I found out I was the only one from the non-medical field. And I'm glad I'm online. I'm safer this way. But anyway, my talk, uh, my title speaks for itself when it says that bystander CPR for witnessed SCA is a work in progress. We have been working uh, with the Revive Heart Foundation since many years. And I think we've just possibly made a chink in the armor now, and we have some progress to share, but still we are a work in progress. A quick recap of the years gone by. The origin of the idea was a very simple one. This happened during COVID, when I was having a conversation with Dr. Lokanwala. And we decided that as most countries have a particular week which is dedicated to sudden cardiac arrest awareness, we should have one in India as well. Although the Vaivar Foundation and various other organizations have been doing uh, cardiac arrest training, CPR training all year long, we wanted to consolidate this into a week-long campaign every year for various reasons. It gives us better optics. We have more media, we have more awareness raised suddenly, and it's easier for people to participate when it is just one week and not all year. Our initial steps were baby steps. We had started with very small groups. We were doing in-person training. And then, call it a boon or a bane, but COVID hit, and we had to take everything online. This gave us an impetus like nothing else would have because suddenly everybody was willing to learn online. And that's what took, took us to maximum people. The team, the founders of Revive Heart Foundation, as you probably know, are Dr. Yash Lokanwala, Dr. Brian Pinto, Dr. Manju Sinha. And uh, the national coordinators this year are Dr. Aditya Kapoor and myself. We have been running this uh, campaign with various other regional coordinators. Currently, we have 70 plus participating. The OC Awareness Campaign 2021 was run completely online. And 22 was run in a hybrid mode where we had online and offline participants. 
This was a very interesting slide for me to make. I had kept a lot of open space, a lot of area for me to fill up with statistics, with data on what is the percentage of survival in case of out of hospital cardiac arrest. There was a lot of discussion we found out from a lot of websites, but one thing was common. Nobody has data which is watertight. In fact, for the same country, if you uh, check online, you will find data varying between 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%. There is no real consensus. Maybe there are too many variable factors. Maybe there is a different process of logging in cardiac deaths. I have no idea. But the main thing that I found here, I'm sure if you're seeing this on a big screen, even before seeing the first uh, little bar to be as India, you've guessed it. We do have one of the lowest survival rates after sudden cardiac arrest. I'm not comparing this to the other underdeveloped countries, but I would like to think of our country as a developing one. And so we have a lot of, you know, this whole gap to bridge. So this gives us an idea of how far we still need to go and why we're still a work in progress. Being a psychologist, and as Dr. Amit Vera rightly pointed out, stress is a very important aspect, not just for doctors, for patients alike. And from the mental health perspective, the bystander effect is something which is very, very important to me. I feel it comes into play tremendously in various angles when we talk about cardiac arrest. Initially, I thought it was only about helping. So, right, you have a large crowd, you have a sudden cardiac arrest, somebody has collapsed, and everybody looks towards each other thinking, somebody else will help. Classic bystander effect in helping. I also noticed a very strong bystander effect in learning and organizing these uh, workshops. Whenever you tell somebody, you know, at least a few people in the family should do CPR, everyone thinks somebody else will do it. When you ask organizations to plan sessions, you know, for the HR department or for the entire employee base or for students, everybody thinks that somebody else will organize it. So this bystander effect seems to be at play at various levels in our society. Well, even today, everyone feels that this is somebody else's job. This was one of my major learnings when we started doing our large online sessions. Many people asked me, when you are conducting a session, even though it is with a cardiologist and with some very senior cardiologists, how sure are you that somebody will be CPR trained after that one hour of online demo and uh, some Q&A? And they said, isn't it more important to be CPR trained than just CPR aware? On the other hand, when we started doing smaller sessions with people in the room with a mannequin, with an AED machine, people said in a country as large as ours, how will we ever reach the tipping point if we only train 20 to 40 people at once? This actually made us think, and we realized that being CPR aware is just as important as being completely CPR trained. What happens in a large group, let's say a movie theater, if somebody were to have a sudden cardiac arrest, there is a collapse, somebody knows CPR, but the chances are that most people will not allow that person to help. They will say, let's take the patient to the hospital. They will say, let's just pick him up and you know, give him some water to drink. There will be a lot of things which will happen which will not be effective. By creating this kind of awareness at a very large scale, it helps the others to not hinder CPR attempts. So I think this awareness has really helped us. Also, one of the major feedbacks that I have received is that now people look at an AD machine in a public place and they register it in their mind. So far, they would walk past it, not even knowing what that little box is. But after these online sessions, people have started understanding that, oh, this is an AD machine, and this is where it's available. Of course, when you do an offline session, if you have people in front of you, the confidence level is definitely higher. It is not easy to touch somebody's body and start a medical procedure for a lay person. So practicing on a dummy or a mannequin definitely helps. So I think we must aim at doing hybrid sessions some online, some offline, both have their benefits and both have their role to play. The anesthesiology society, the anesthesiologists who have literally lent us their support for the last three years, they are unsung heroes. In fact, one of the founders of Revive Our Foundation, Dr. Manju Sinan herself is an anesthesiologist. I was speaking with her a couple of days ago, and I wanted her to give me some insight on why 
Anesthesiology should be a very, very important group that we uh, you know, kind of get together with when we do CPR trainings. And she said something very simple. She said that anesthesiologists are extremely well trained in sudden medical emergencies and they are trained to be very calm. Now, these two can be completely irreplaceable when we are uh, working with CPR and cardiac arrest. The Anesthesia Society, in fact, lent us so much support in the first two campaigns. We have anesthesiologists from different cities doing sessions on their own, bringing their own mannequins. It was amazing. I mean, we would not have had this kind of outreach had it, had it not been for them. So I would encourage anyone who is planning a large-scale CPR campaign in their own city or state, please connect with the anesthesiology departments. They are amazing and they can add a lot of value to the work that you are doing. A lot of uh, different organizations in different cities and different states have been doing smaller trainings for many years, I mean for decades now, where they have been uh, holding little workshops where people come in and get trained for CPR. Some are even providing certificate trainings, which is brilliant. The Baha Foundation was also doing the same, and it was having a very, very good impact. However, thanks to COVID, when we started doing this at a national level in a consolidated manner, we realized that things got a little better because we started streamlining the entire effort and have a standard format now. So initially, as Dr. Yash will also remember, we had a very scatterbrained kind of process where we just thought, okay, we need to do this, 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 and this. But as the years passed, we created a standard format. We realized how to scale up. We had some data to share. Also, now when somebody wants to run a CPI campaign, we have a lot of resources to give them in terms of videos, in terms of slides, in terms of how to, and you know, just the basic four steps. So I think making this the first nationwide campaign for SCA awareness has been a great impetus to us and to the others who wanted to do this, but who didn't have any resources to do so. Some of the biggest drawbacks that we have experienced being the first of a kind national level campaign is that we really had no base to build upon and we didn't have anybody else's mistakes to learn from. And trust me, we've made enough mistakes of our own. We had no precedent, we had no data. So when we were even connecting with higher government officials or celebrities, everybody would request data to get involved with us, but we had nothing really to present on a large scale. We had to start with a lot of time-consuming basics to get our website completely sorted for large-level uh, football, we had a lot of social media ads which we were not aware of how to do. But let's say the initial drawbacks were overcome and now the team is much stronger and much more aware of what we need to do at a national level. One of the challenges we faced and we continue to face, and I'm sure you will all face when you do run your own CPI campaigns, is this resistance from public. I've had people come up with the most bizarre ideas on why they do not want to learn CPI. First, people in our country believe that if you talk about death, you invite it. People believe that everything is written in stone. So if somebody's time has come, who are we to change it? There are others who say that for everybody who was given CPR, not everyone survived. There were still deaths. So why bother at all? So this kind of resistance needs to go again. Large online sessions help us to generate this awareness so that this resistance comes down and people take it onto themselves to start learning. The Vibha Foundation has always maintained that they will not charge a single rupee for any training program. If there is a large logistical expense involved, we always have a sponsor who steps in and picks up the expense. But the people who are being trained never have to pay. Now, the difference between priceless and worthless, it's been a tough one. Because have we had people register for sessions and not turn up, especially online? Because there is no investment, there is no commitment. So this is a problem we continue to face, but I think there is no, uh, I mean, there is no way around it unless people are aware of the importance of the whole campaign. Social media has been a challenge because uh, it was a new zone. We, we had not exploited it in the past, but I think we've overcome it with the help of certain celebrities, as I will talk about later. Reaching out to the government, like I said, was really difficult in the beginning because all they want is hard data, numbers, and like you can see, there are no numbers even on the international front. So the numbers that we can share with them are very hazy. Even today I wanted to use some numbers in our slides and I realized that 
the fact that i don't have any complete numbers means that we are now increasing our scope to a very large level which is a good thing that the government needs numbers so this has been a challenge for us sponsorships i'm sure you're all aware when something of such a large uh, scale is happening we need sponsorships for ad machines we need sponsorships for logistics sometimes sponsors are easy to come by at times sometimes they can be quite hard to convince so that has been a challenge as well my favorite slide where are the greatest achievements we have more than 6 lakh people trained or made aware at least from online and offline sessions the railway ministry of india in 2021 has given us a mandate to train every employee of indian railways in cpr this is one of the largest government mandates that we have received as revive my foundation and we are the largest employer in the world so it gives us a lot of impetus in doing what we are doing and it makes us feel that we are in the right track we have had really uh, hard running support from celebrities as you can see on this slide we have chota shetty karan johar um, abhishek bachchan and so many sports celebrities as well from kapil dev to neeraj chopra they have all lent their voice to the campaign what happened with their voice is people at least stood up and started taking notice when they said that learn cpr people turned around and said what is cpr so this has been uh, a great push our social media family got activated and people started getting more aware and also getting more and more inquiries now in fact not a single day goes by when people don't call up and say we need to do a session we need to organize a session this is so different from the first year of the campaign when we were calling up people and saying please learn please learn now in fact the university of pune has approached us directly saying we want to train the 2000 employees on campus which is great that means they know what is cpr they know what is the importance and they want to take the effort so i think the the whole cycle is now moving we have also managed to train massive police forces across the country as you can see at the top of this slide that's mr vishwas nagar patel who was the then joint commissioner of mumbai police he had helped us train almost 40000 uh, policemen in mumbai itself during covid in cpr we also were able to train uh, with dr aditya kapoor of course the up police we have trained haryana police there are many police forces which have already taken part and which will soon in this campaign the national uh, sch awareness campaign 2023 is the current one this year we are focusing mainly on police forces in india we wish to initiate this at the national level where every regional coordinator or every cardiologist who is participating from a different city they reach out to the police forces and during the week now the week is 24th september to 2nd october but it is a little flexible depending on if there is any kind of religious activity going on or ganpati festival like we have in maharashtra but when we focus on just one force just the police we hope that we will be able to reach their critical mass in training there have been some saves by the police on the roads which is very hard to win in fact in ahmedabad uh, there were two police personnel who saved the bus uh, saved a man's life and uh, we have news that they were trained by revive our foundation online two years ago which is amazing it means that even online trainings are effective we have more than 70 regional coordinators participating and i'm sure the number will just increase because there are so many more we haven't reached out to yet media coverage is planned in a large way this year because nothing hits home as hard as an article in the newspaper which says so and so trains in cpr so as long as people are talking about cpr talking about ad machines we just need to get the word out there this year we have mr ajay devgan as the face of the campaign we will soon upload this video instead of asking celebrities this year to uh, you know kind of help us tell people to learn cpr we requested mr devgan to teach cpr so this video is a sort of attempt in taking this from an end to end solution where anybody who watches the video should have a basic awareness of cardiac arrest and cpr by the time it's done so i'll just play this please let me know if the audio is playing in it namaskar main hu ajay dev aapne haal hi mein kitni baar suna hoga ki kisi ki mrityu achanak cardiac arrest se ho gayi agar kabhi aapke samne koi achanak collapse ho jaye या बेहोश हो जाए तो सबसे पहले आप चेक कीजिए कि वो सांस ले रहे हैं या नहीं 
अगर उनकी सांस बंद है और वो रिस्पॉन्स नहीं दे रहे तो ये एक कार्डिया अब आपको क्या करना चाहिए सबसे पहले नजदीकी हॉस्पिटल में फोन करें और एक कार्डिया एम्बुलेंस में पाए अगर भीड़ जमा हो गई है तो बोलिए कि आपको सी आता है और सबसे मदद की रिक्वेस्ट करें उस व्यक्ति को एक हार्ड सर्फेस पे लेट आए अगर आसपास कहीं एई मशीन हो तो मंगवा दें अब आप जल्द से जल्द इस पोजीशन में आकर अपने हाथ ऐसे जोड़ें पेशेंट के चेस्ट के बीचों बीच कंप्रेशन शुरू करें आपका यही कंप्रेशन उनके खून को ब्रेन तक पहुंचाने का काम करेगा याद रहे कंप्रेशन 100 या 120 बार प्रति मिनट की स्पीड से करें हर बार छाती को दो इंच तक दबाएं और ऊपर आने दें अगर एई मशीन आ जाए तो उसे चालू करें और पैड्स को पेशेंट पर लगाएं मशीन के इंस्ट्रक्शन को सुने ये मशीन गलत शॉक नहीं दी सकती आप चिंता ना करें पेशेंट को नुकसान नहीं होगा एम्बुलेंस के आने तक सीपीआर चालू रखें अगर पेशेंट को होश आ जाए तो सीपीआर देना रोक दे हमारे देश में रोक कितनी जाने कार्डिय कर से जा रही है सीपीआर से अगर इनमें से कुछ जाने भी बच जाए तो और क्या चाहिए इससे बड़ा पुण्य क्या हो सकता है So that was Mr. Devgan showing us how CPR is done. Let me share some tidbits about this video with you. This video will be released either today or by latest tonight in a large way on all of our social media handles. After which we will be able to share it freely. We are also hoping to take this video to theaters so that it can be shown before every movie. If we are able to do that, at least we'll be able to have this repeat impact, and people will finally be able to talk about CPR normally. Also, the script was written by a 15-year-old, which means that we need to have everybody over the age of 15 learn CPR, which is not difficult. And we are targeting high schools, junior colleges, amongst others, of course. We have tried to take this into the school curriculum, at least for the 10th and 12th standard. But the latest update is that there is a new education policy which will be implemented soon, which means that there will be a major overhaul, and so we need to wait for a year before we can attempt to put this in school curriculum. Well, that brings me to my last slide. The road ahead is a good one, at least for us. It is our time to learn. I think every single day during this campaign, we are learning from everybody around us. From the founders of Arvada Foundation, Dr. Kapoor has been a great source of learning and inspiration. The amount of work he is doing in Lucknow and beyond is amazing. I mean, just talking to him for ten minutes, and I know that okay, there is a lot more that I need to do. I would welcome suggestions and your experience with similar campaigns. If you have done something that we haven't tried yet, please do share, and we'll try and take it to the next campaign. Thank you. Well, for your excellent uh, talk, very enlightening. Um, it's it's very important to remember that. Uh, just have a comment first. That doing CPR is not some mindless compression of chest. Um, it is it is it is science, and I think it is very important for everybody to learn what that science is and how to do it properly. Um, I'm very happy to share with you that yesterday we could train. About 120 policemen uh, in our city at the at the commissioner's office uh, by using dummies and and and, and we, we taught them how to do proper uh, BCLS proper CPR. And I think um, I'm pretty sure that although we we are all doctors, um, you know we need to get trained in doing CPR. Uh, we need to have revisions of it. Even the American College of Cardiology is AHA does this every five years, and they modify uh, their own protocol. So I think it's very important to heed to this message. I have one question for Dr. Goel: That uh, when you try to install these AEDs in the city, um, you know, funding must be an issue. You you alluded to it in your one of your slides, but if uh, in a city like Aurangabad you have to initiate this. 
um, you know, funding would be a problem. And what is the number of AEDs you recommend per unit of population in, in any city? Um, so, the second half is a more technical answer, which I'm going to request Dr. Kapoor or Dr. Lokanwala to answer. But the first part about getting funding, what has really helped us is we have stopped asking people to be anonymous donors. We tell them that we will use their company logos, we will use their names, whatever it is on the banners or the man, you know, the flex that we put up across the city during the campaign. This kind of urges people to uh, participate from their marketing perspective and not just from a CSR angle. So if you approach a corporate, tell them that this is marketing and not just CSR, somehow it's easier to get the donation. Also, if it is for the police, uh, people are happier. In societies, what works is if you ask 20 people to donate a small amount and put it together, an AD machine is easier to install. So it may not be a single donor every time, it could be a group. Uh, do we have Dr. Kapoor or Dr. Lokanwala who can answer the next one? Yeah, I am there. I am Dr. Aditya. Hello, Dr. Bhagavad. Hello, hello. Uh, I think Dr. Priyash is also there online. So, I think your question is very valid that how many AEDs per unit area or uh, unit population. So, as you also mentioned in your comments, it would go by the population density. So, what we are trying over here is to place it with high public footfall. They should have an AED. I am, I am not aware of you know, how much population density it is, but we are going by high public footfall, so we are encouraging over here, you know, major government institutions like the uh, chief secretary office, the passport office, the road transport office, major shopping malls, big gyms. We have had about three, four installations in Lucknow, which is very, very gratifying. So all credit to RHA for launching this initiative. But I would say that places with high public footfall, they are the, you know, the first, first target. Maybe Dr. Amit or Dr. Yash would like to add to that. Yeah, first, uh, uh, thank you, Kinjal, for uh, you know doing this. Uh, I think it's a it's a it's a selfless service that you're doing and doing a good job. Uh, and thanks to Aditya and the entire team, I think phenomenal work has been done, and uh, it should be a motivation to all of us in our individual capacities to take this up to a much larger scale. Uh, so, so just to give a brief of you know, the density of the population and how many AEDs you need. Uh, in a city of Dubai, uh, which is which is populated, but not like many metros in India, they have 5,000 AEDs in the city of Dubai. So, uh, it all depends upon our individual motivation, but nonetheless, one would think that uh, if you have an idealistic goal in, 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 in terms of scientific data, Roughly 180 for 10,000 population would be the ideal goal. But I guess we are too far away from it, and one in few lakhs for our country is also good enough. But most important message would be that, you know, when you have a density of population, so all our malls should have an AED. All our airports do have an AED, but malls should have an AED. Large housing societies, as Kinjal said, the society can take it upon itself and have a AED. I would encourage that within the municipal corporations there needs to be some law where all gymnasiums should have an AED. I mean, the, the license to a gym should be given only if there's an AED and a CPR trained personnel because we often find these situations happening. Other than that, as far as the society is concerned, I think, you know, for all you practitioners, I would encourage you that you should have some time off with all your patients where in one day, you can probably meet up with all your patients, with their families, and educate them about CPR. You see, education is very important, and one of our, uh, you know, national education was in that if you educate a woman in a family, the whole family gets educated. Similarly, I would say, as far as the CPR is concerned, educating a teenage in a family would see to it that the CPR uh, is, you know, educated in all families because they are the ones who are highly motivated. They will feel a purpose and they will probably make, uh, be, be very active in terms of uh, uh, learning new things and doing new things. And I think one of the important uh, social consideration also, which uh, in fact Kajol, uh, 
the actress gave us an idea was that we should encourage all our patients in their families to have one family member take up into medical issues for the entire family. We still have families which, you know, minimum four or five people, but one person should be trained to take up all the medical issues. So one of the important things is to train them in all the first aids, whether it is burns, whether it is accidents, whether it is CPR, but that person should be responsible for the medical emergencies of the family. That kind of an encouragement should be there so as to uh, have penetration of these uh, uh, societal programs. Thank you, Kinder. Thank you, Dr. Goel, for your uh, enlightening talk. Uh, now we'll move to Thank the you, Dr. next talk. I think we can go to the next talk now by Dr. Brian Pinto. It's on uh, post return of spontaneous circulation, CAG for all, PCI for whom. So I think we can uh, have, we have this talk online. I request Dr. Pr uh, Brian Pinto to start this talk. Thank you, Ajit, and the organizers for having me here and, uh, you know, being a part of the Revive uh, Heart Foundation along with Yash, who two of us started it. I think it was very heartening to hear Kinjal tell, tell you so much about this. This we started. Uh, somewhere in 2016, 2017, and uh, it's really taken off. And I think, you know, we have had many saves in the city of Mumbai. Many of them we've done coronary angiograms in, and then the others we haven't. So I think I would be, you know, in a position to, uh, you know, take this uh, talk and, you know, possibly throw some light on this. Uh, as we go forward, uh, can you see my slide? No, we need to go to the first slide. Just give me a little time. Yeah. So uh, basically, does every person after the restoration of spontaneous uh, circulation need a coronary angiography? There's a tendency to do this in everybody, but I think clearly this is not required and there are papers that sub substantiate this. And the way that we go forward is possibly to look at uh, the chronology of sudden cardiac death. All of us know that in India, we have so many sudden cardiac deaths and almost 30 to 40% of patients who present with an acute myocardial infarction, whether it be an ST elevation myocardial infarction or a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction could present with sudden cardiac death. And this is a situation which we must all know. However, there are large groups of patients who really do not have ischemia as the presentation for sudden cardiac death. And we must be aware of this as well. So it is clear today that the signs and symptoms that we look at as clearly mentioned by the American Heart Association is just two, unconsciousness, so unresponsiveness. You tap on the patient and no respiratory movement. You just do not need to go and touch the pulse of the patient, look here and there. You must be able to identify this within seconds and respond. The response is basically, as Ajay Devgan said, clearly start the CPR quickly, call for some emergency services, ask somebody else to call for emergency services, and then you tell people to watch around you and start and continue. Because in a minute or two, you'll be tired with that 120, 100 to 120 uh, times you press down on the chest, you will be tired, so you must get people. And we've had people save people like that. Now, the annual incidence is quite high if you look at it. And you can see that almost 20% of these occur under the age of 20 years. So it's important to understand that Asians have it more often and that in myocardial infarction patients, there's a dual peak, one that occurs at the time of the, at the time of the myocardial infarction, another between 6 and 18 months, and the third is actually more like a triple peak between 2 to 5 years when you have re arrhythmia. So clearly ischemia forms a big part of patients who have sudden cardiac death and in India, we have a less than 1% resuscitation and therefore Revive Heart Foundation has put a lot of effort and we are beginning to see some results. Now, as you can see, that if you look at the general population, there may be a small number of people who have sudden cardiac death, but you will see that that's a larger number of people who have events because you're now talking about 1.4 billion people in our, in, in, in our country and that is the larger amount as you would see on the gray bars over here. 
However, in the high risk groups, in patients who have arrhythmic risk markers, patients who've had cardiac arrest before, those whose ejection fractions are less, and those who had prior coronary events, you will see that the percentage of patients is much higher, as you can see in the high risk subgroups, where the number of people are basically much more, but the percent the number of people are less but the number of events are much more. So therefore, you will see that though you're looking at events where the uh, incidence is much higher in smaller populations, but the total number are not so high. At the same time, we must look that the annual incidence of sudden cardiac arrest is large in, uh, in the Indian perspective, and this accounts for almost 50% of cardiovascular deaths in India. This is really large. And I would say the peak age is actually coming down. Uh, though we say it's between 45 and 75, we see a lot of patients now in their 30s and 40s, especially going to the gym after a period of, and, and as Amit mentioned out over there, we don't even have the uh, ADs. Many of our patients have lost their lives immediately after they have completed an exercise or during the peak of exercise. And the survival rate is, is, is abysmal at less than 1%. So let's look at uh, you know uh, the deaths that occurred in a South Asia in a South Indian population. You can see that you know we, we could recall some of these, and many of these deaths occurred in situations there was where there was a prior myocardial infarction, there was LV dysfunction, there was prior aborted SCD were found in these kind of populations. So clearly there can be a substrate over there, but sometimes this substrate is not recognized. I would uh, allude to that, uh, you know, to Christian uh, Eriksen, the, the Danish footballer who just fell on the field. He was completely tested by a friend of mine, Sanjay Sharma, who is a sports cardiologist in the UK, and still nothing was found. In spite of that, he had an event that occurred, and just because he was on a football field where people were aware, he could be. Now, does that a guy like him need a coronary adjunct? Certainly not. He, he was found out to have a different kind of condition, which we will allude to in the in the in the next few slides. And clearly, uh, we need to know, and therefore we divide these kind of situations into two groups. Now, these etiologies, as I as I go through, are not very very important uh, for you because this is not the thing of the talk. But you can see that there are many etiologies. Ischemic heart disease forms a large portion. portion. You have inherited channelopathies, cardiomyopathies, which need to be looked into, especially in younger patients, heart failure, valve disease, and congenital disease. Now, the most important way in which I would like all of us to look at this particular thing is age divided. And you may look at, it's, it's not like 35 is the cutoff point, because in Indians, you can get coronary artery disease before that. But approximately around the age of 35, you would see that in the left-hand side, it says greater than 35, but that is actually less than 35 mentioned over here, that, that is over here. You can see that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so basically an inherited condition forms a larger group of patients who would have sudden cardiac death. And these similarly patients who are hypertensive and have LVH, a small percentage, about 10%, of those who have coronary artery disease. On the other hand, look at the patients who have above the age of 35. Their coronary artery disease makes a big portion, a, a large percentage, almost 80% is coronary artery disease. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, on the other hand, forms about 5%. Unexplained is about 5%. Valvular heart disease also comes in a, in a, in a small way. But these is the, this is the big difference between those who are young. So if you have a patient who is a young patient, by and large, these patients, unless documented ischemia is there, would not need a coronary angiography. On the other hand, you would see that patients who have an establishment, that they present with an acute myocardial infarction, they present with an NSTEMI. Overall testing, you find out that they have ischemia. These are the patients that would require it. And this is similarly a slide to show you that what are the usual causes. And as you change the age, if you look past the age, you will see that coronary atherosclerosis tops the list, followed by dilated cardiomyopathy, which we see quite commonly, and valvular heart disease. On the other hand, look at the age group below 35. You would see different types of, of etiologies, myocarditis, especially post-COVID, which we have seen commonly, hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, long QT syndromes, 
right ventricular dysplasia, Brugada syndrome, and idiopathic VF. So we're looking at two different kinds of spectrum completely over here when we look at the age factor as we go forward. Now, the gender-related risk is also there. You can look that in men, there is more of atherosclerosis as compared to in women, which is also quite high, but not as high as in men. And you have more of dilated cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, so on and so forth. So just looking at the age and the gender, you get some, but there are other ways also to differentiate this. Now, genetic contributions, uh, you know, many of you know this already, but commonly we see now catecholamine polymorphic ventricular tachycardia occurring in patients. And this is something that we must be aware of, especially with the stress, stress factors that are coming up. The congenital QT syndromes, both initiated as pure congenital and those that are stimulated by drugs, so you get QT syndromes or by electrolyte imbalances. So these are things that we must clearly search for. We must look out for patients who have drug-related issues. Who, who you have to question this. They're taking any Ayurvedic medications. They're taking any antibiotics that are causing these problems. Are they taking any antifungal drugs? You must look into these issues and adjust and relate to them. So the clinical features, of course, all of you know that it usually sudden cardiac death occurs within an hour, and that is basically the program may be there earlier of chest pain, fatigue, palpitation, and a prior history of LV impairment. So if you get a patient who, who's a known EF, there's a scar or something of that sort, this is a very potent kind of reminder that these are the people who are at higher risk for, 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 heart, for coronary artery disease uh, or for sudden cardiac death, sorry. Coronary artery disease, these are the factors that would tell you that these are patients, for example, previous cardiac arrest, you studied them with echocardiography, EF is less than 30%, dilated cardiomyopathy once again, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which may not have been picked up in the past. These could have various other features like you know, your ECG shows you massive LV hypertrophy. There have been multiple bursts of unsustained or sustained ventricular tachycardia drop in systolic blood pressure on, on, on stress test. These are patients who are more likely to develop cardiac arrest. Then you have the valvular diseases, where you can also have uh, increased incidence, especially in the stenotic lesions, for example, aortic stenosis severe and mitral stenosis. These are more likely the stenotic lesions than the, than the regurgitant lesions. And then you can look at the long QT syndrome. So here are the Thompson and McAuliffe cardiac arrest score, and you can understand, this is only a score to tell you which are the patients which are likely to come out. And these patients would be likely to come out, those who are neurologically responsive, those whose blood pressure after you bring them out or you, you come, they come to you after they have had a restoration of the spontaneous circulation, their blood pressure is reasonable in the region of 90 or above, and they have not been resuscitated for such a long time. Though we have patients who have been resuscitated for longer than that and have survived. It's not that you have to give up at 25 minutes, but certainly these are the factors that can tell you that these patients will do well. I'm not going to stress too much on the investigations, but these investigations are important because these will be the investigations that will tell you whether you need to go for an angiogram or not if the patient does not have an evidence of ischemia. If the patient has an undeniable evidence of ischemia, either on the ECG, on the echocardiography, or whatever other testing, you do not need to do all the tests. However, these are a group of tests that you may need to do. So you may need to do a cardiac MRI in patients who have a dilated cardiomyopathy. You may need to do an MRI in patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Not may need to do, I think you have to do. And these are the various tests that are available to you. Now, these tests also take you through the availability of whether you need to clearly get ahead and do uh, coronary angiography. This is where you would have to do it. These are the you know various treatments. Uh, prevention is screening of family members, of course. Uh, avoid the cell is defective, which is causing and giving rise to the disease. And this, the, the understanding of this is very important. We have uh, all the information at our palm tops. We have artificial intelligence coming up, which will give us, you know, not, not, not only doctors, also to common people, many solutions. They will, you know, they type it out and they will give a differential, they will get a differential diagnosis. So what's in store for doctors is 
that we are in a, we have to be in a position now to understand pathophysiology of a disease from a molecular point of view. Because if you see this figure published in, a, in an article in Journal Cell, which is a very good journal for cellular pathophysiology and correlation of mole molecular uh, diagnostics, uh, the, you, uh, ca cardiomyopathy is a very, uh, um, very um, a good uh, chunk of uh, disorders which has been studied in great details to its genetic etiology. So this is a figure which explains, and this is a recent paper, where they are studying now transcriptome. I'll just, I'll just uh, give few uh, terminologies later. So uh, what they did is they took a, um, they, they did a septoctomy in healthy individuals and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and they are correlating the gene, how genes are expressing only in that part of that sec, you know, part of that septum, not only in the septum, part of that septum to cause a hypertrophy. So this is a recent article, 2022, which gives a gene expression studies in uh, normal people versus hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and why the genes are expressing in only th that part of um, septum where gene mutation present in over all of the cells in the body. So this is how uh, science has taken us into. And that is what is doctors and cardi uh, not only uh, you know specialties, but even general practitioners and physicians and every specialty needs to understand because and this is a recent stand, very recent by American Heart Association, and I'm sure that uh, every uh, national society, including India, would take it, that enhancing literacy in cardiovascular genetics, enhancing literacy in cancer genetics in its specialty, enhancing genetics as such for uh, even a common practitioner, because soon everybody, I'm sure, would get a report on their table given by the patient ki mala hai sanga mujhe ye samjha do doctor i have got the diagnosis now tell me the what what this report means and what is how it is applicable to me and my family so that these are the simple questions even coming will come to general practitioners table so we need to understand and enhancing literacy in genomics applications in medicine applications of genomics to human genetics research are wider but we want as a clinician to understand how it is applicable to clinical practice that's it so how uh, that literacy should be uh, you know that is the um, uh, that is the need of time in when when we when we come to sudden cardiac death <clears throat> as previous speakers and next speakers would also speak on, is sudden death sudden? Meaning, we, if we know the disease earlier in that patient, and we anticipate that this disease may cause sudden cardiac death in that patient. So how this anticipation, whether this anticipation or risk stratification would be helped by genetics, that is the first thing. The disease is already known in that patient, maybe in a milder form, you've already diagnosed. And in, like in CAD, you know, you already have the disease, and whether you expect sudden disease, if, yeah, the patient is doing well on treatment, prognosis is better, and still, if you can predict, <clears throat> are we doing post-mortem is really sudden cardiac death, and nothing is there, and you get a sudden cardiac death. So how post-mortem will help? Because not all our patients are undergoing post-mortem examination. And this is gaining importance because there's severe anxiety in the family about the cause. <clears throat> Because once the patient is gone, patient is gone, right? But now because we know much, whether it is any having any implications to family members, whether it will come to any of us now. So affected patients, patients who are there, patient, the asymptomatic uh, um, member, like, like we are talking about exercise induced, and patient is gone and still implications to family members. So the causes usually uh, age-related, then uh, CAD, then cardiomyopathy, channelomyopathies are usually highlighted, and there are a lot of, lot of N number of causes which are now coming up along with sudden deaths, and we, they may be labeled as sudden cardiac deaths, but then we need to differentiate about it. So what is the evaluation in a sudden cardiac death? Medical history, circumstances surrounding the death, autopsy findings, very, very important, and every disease, every diagnosis in cardiology, every disease and actually diagnosis in medicine has a defined phenotype, and that is getting very much importance. So fever trigger in Brugada syndrome. So this, even if, if this is, you know, we feel that this is trivial, this is so very important when we go ahead with genetic report. This is so very important. These details are so very important for a laboratory to interpret the gen genetic problems which are there. Because what we see, we do the sampling, we send the DNA to the laboratory blood sample, and the software data bioinformatics is generated, which is correlated against the DNA data. So clinician stand is very important. So genetic evaluation is usually seen important in unexplained sudden cardiac deaths. 
ਤੇ ਬਾਕੀ ਜੋ ਡਾਇਗਨੋਸਿਸ ਹੈ ਨਾ ਪੀਪਲ ਯੂ نو ਡਾਇਗਨੋਸ ਇਵਨ ਡਾਕਟਰਸ ਫੀਲ ਕਿ ਨਹੀਂ ਇਸਮੇ ਕੈਡ ਵੀ نو ਦੈਟ ਪੇਸ਼ੈਂਟ ਯੂ نو ਵੁੱਡ ਡਾਈ ਥਿਸ ਇਸ ਕਾਰਡੀਓਮਾਈ ਪੇਸ਼ੈਂਟ ਵੁੱਡ ਡਾਈ ਸੋ ਓਨਲੀ ਵੀ ਵਿਲ ਡੂ ਜੈਨੈਟਿਕਸ ਇਨ ਵੈਨ ਵੀ ਡੋਨਟ ਫਾਈਂਡ ਫਾਈਂਡ ਐਨੀਥਿੰਗ ਲੈਟ ਅਸ ਡੂ ਜੈਨੈਟਿਕਸ ਐਂਡ ਟ੍ਰਾਈ ਟੂ ਫਾਈਂਡ ਆਊਟ ਗੈਟ ਦ ਕਾਜ਼ نو ਸੋ ਨਾਊ ਵਾਈ ਵਾਟ ਵਾਟ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਟ੍ਰਾਈਂਗ ਟੂ ਡੂ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਟ੍ਰਾਈਂਗ ਟੂ ਡੂ ਜੈਨੈਟਿਕਸ ਕੋਰਿਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਇਨ ਏਵਰੀ ਡਿਜ਼ੀਜ਼ ਵੇਅਰ ਵਿਚ ਹੈਜ਼ ਅ ਜੈਨੈਟਿਕ ਪ੍ਰੀਡਿਸਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਔਰ ਇਟੀਓਲੋਜੀ ਸਪੈਸੀਫਿਕ ਨਾਟ ਓਨਲੀ ਇਨ ਅਨਐਕਸਪਲੇਨਡ ਸਡਨ ਕਾਰਡੀਅਕ ਡੈਥਸ ਅਪਾਰਟ ਬਿਕੋਜ਼ ਅਪਾਰਟ ਫਰਮ ਕਾਰਡੀਓਮਾਇਓਪੈਥੀਜ਼ ਐਂਡ ਚੈਨਲੋਪੈਥੀਜ਼ ਅਦਰ ਕਾਜ਼ਸ ਸਡਨਲੀ ਯੂ ਗੈਟ ਅ ਰਿਪੋਰਟ ਵੇਅਰ ਯੂ ਐਂਟੀਸਿਪੇਟ ਦੈਟ ਦਿਸ ਵੁੱਡ ਬੀ ਚੈਨਲੋਪੈਥੀ ਔਰ ਹਾਈਪਰਟ੍ਰੋਫਿਕ ਕਾਰਡੀਓਮਾਇਓਪੈਥੀ ਐਂਡ ਦਿਸ ਇਸ ਆਟੋਪੈਥੀ ਦਿਸ ਇਸ ਪ੍ਰੀਮੈਚਿਓਰ ਕੈਟ ਐਂਡ ਦਿਸ ਇਸ ਵਾਲਿਓਲਰ ਕਾਜ਼ ਦਿਸ ਇਸ ਥ੍ਰੋਮਬੋਇਮਬੋਲਿਜ਼ਮ ਐਂਡ ਸਡਨ ਫਾਈਂਡਿੰਗ ਔਨ ਅ ਜੈਨੈਟਿਕ ਰਿਪੋਰਟ ਐਂਡ ਯੂ ਹੈਵ ਟੋਲਡ ਆਲਰੇਡੀ ਦੈਟ ਪੇਸ਼ੈਂਟ ਦੀ ਚੈਨਲੋਪੈਥੀ ਹੋ ਸਕਦਾ ਐਸਾ ਤਾਂ ਹੋਤਾ ਐਸੇ ਸੈਡੀ ਯੂ ਨੋ ਸੋ ਵਾਟ ਵਾਟ ਆਮ ਟ੍ਰਾਈਂਗ ਟੂ ਸੇ ਦੈਟ ਯੂ ਹੈਵ ਟੂ ਆਲਵੇਜ਼ ਯੂ ਹੈਵ ਟੂ ਟ੍ਰਾਈ ਐਂਡ ਅੰਡਰਸਟੈਂਡ ਆਲ ਜੈਨੈਟਿਕ ਕਾਜ਼ਸ ਇਨ ਸਡਨ ਕਾਰਡੀਅਕ ਡੈਥ ਐਂਡ ਨਾਟ ਓਨਲੀ ਅਨਐਕਸਪਲੇਨਡ ਸਡਨ ਕਾਰਡੀਅਕ ਡੈਥ ਐਂਡ ਯੂ ਵਾਂਟ ਟੂ ਗੈਟ ਸਮਥਿੰਗ ਆਊਟ ਆਫ ਦ ਜੈਨੈਟਿਕ ਰਿਪੋਰਟ ਰੋਲ ਆਫ ਆਟੋਪਸੀ ਇਜ਼ ਸੋ ਵੈਰੀ ਇੰਪੋਰਟੈਂਟ ਐਸ ਐਸ ਆਈ ਹੈਵ ਸ਼ੋਡ ਇਨ ਦ ਫਰਸਟ ਸਲਾਈਡਸ ਦੈਟ ਈਵਨ ਇਫ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਟ੍ਰਾਈਂਗ ਟੂ ਗੈਟ ਟੂ ਦ ਮੋਲੀਕੂਲਰ ਡਿਟੇਲਸ ਵੀ ਹੈਵ ਟੂ ਰਾਈਟ ਸਟਾਰਟ ਅਵੇ ਫਰਮ ਦ ਕਲੀਨਿਕਲ ਡਿਟੇਲਸ ਕਲੀਨਿਸ਼ੀਅਨਸ ਟ੍ਰੰਪ ਯੂ نو ਕਲੀਨਿਕਲ ਡਾਇਗਨੋਸਿਸ ਟ੍ਰੰਪਸ ਇਨ ਇਨ ਲੈਬੋਰੇਟਰੀ ਡਾਇਗਨੋਸਿਸ ਸੋ ਕਲੀਨਿਸ਼ੀਅਨਸ ਰੋਲ ਇਜ਼ ਸੋ ਵੈਰੀ ਇੰਪੋਰਟੈਂਟ ਐਂਡ ਗੇਨਿੰਗ ਮੋਰ ਇੰਪੋਰਟੈਂਟ ਈਵਨ ਇਫ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਅਹੈਡ ਵਿਦ ਐਡਵਾਂਸ ਰਿਪੋਰਟਿੰਗ ਆਰ ਐਡਵਾਂਸ ਡਾਇਗਨੋਸਟਿਕਸ ਐਡਵਾਂਸ ਟ੍ਰੀਟਮੈਂਟਸ ਸੋ ਇਟ ਪ੍ਰੋਵਾਈਡਸ ਸੁਪੀਰੀਅਰ ਇਨਫੋਰਮੇਸ਼ਨ ਮਿਨਿਮਲ ਇਨਵੈਸਿਵ ਟੈਕਨਿਕਸ ਇਮੇਜਿੰਗ ਟੈਕਨਿਕਸ ਕੈਨ ਨਾਟ ਰਿਪਲੇਸ ਵੈਲਿਊਏਬਲ ਇਨਫੋਰਮੇਸ਼ਨ ਗਿਵਨ ਬਾਈ ਆਟੋਪਸੀ ਐਂਡ ਈਵਨ ਇਫ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਨਾਟ ਏਬਲ ਟੂ ਡੂ ਆਟੋਪਸੀ ਇਨ ਮੈਨੀ ਆਫ ਆਵਰ ਪੇਸ਼ੈਂਟਸ ਬਿਕੋਜ਼ ਆਫ ਇਮੋਸ਼ਨਲ ਰੀਜ਼ਨਸ ਬਿਕੋਜ਼ ਆਫ ਅਨਅਵੇਲੇਬਿਲਿਟੀ ਇਨ ਪ੍ਰਾਈਵੇਟ ਹਸਪੀਟਲਸ ਵੀ ਟ੍ਰਾਈ ਐਂਡ ਟ੍ਰਾਈ ਟੂ ਕਮ ਟੂਗੇਦਰ ਐਂਡ Uh, place you know autopsy data of some patients against their genetic molecular histopathology detail this would go a long way to interpret our patients and if some few cardiologists cardiac centers try doing it i think it would give a uh, lot many details because not every genetic problem or mutation leads to morphological disorder 40% of scds under 35 years of age are associated with a negative biopsy cardiac channelopathies are prime suspects in this cases and we are nowhere if we don't have any autopsy findings so combining morphological examination techniques autopsy histological examination toxicology analysis genetic analysis if we can try and get collaboration with various institutes would definitely give us a better data in indian patients so types of testing in genetics is diagnostic testing predictive testing predispositional testing and pharmacogenetic testing all of these apply in adults very well in pediatrics only first two so diagnostic testing is the test which explains your disease predictive testing is performing test in a person who is at risk of developing a genetic disorders like pre symptomatic family member predispositional testing even if scientific community is not very far, very much in favor soon everybody will you know land up getting over the counter reporting of predispositional it's, it's already in the market health uh, companies are giving predispositional risk of query thyroid disease cardiac disease and they are coming to us if whether this report means anything so predispositional testing and pharmacogenetic testing would also be compulsory in many of uh, patients when it comes to a specific pharmacological use so before we consider genetic testing we should know what to expect from a genetic test what would be the medical impact for the patient for the family what would be the psychological impact for the family and the patient informed consent is a must because this is a personal uh, we, we are we, you know uh, the data bills personal data are getting rolled out in many countries and dna information uh, it's very personal every laboratory is uh, providing the form but um, uh, clinicians also can have the, at their end in, informed consent because dna is stored once you send it to the laboratory dna is stored may be used for research so informed consent are very important pre test counseling interpretation of the report should be known by the person who is advised otherwise otherwise you know, advising such an uh, such a uh, costly test would matter you know pa- patient would ask all the questions to the doctor who has advised the test so better he knows how to interpret the report
we have 42 genes. So there are 42 different phenotypes of Brugada syndrome. So uh, what I'm trying to say that even if you start getting reports, you start discussing cases on your forums, please try and get acquainted with such platforms, which will help you understanding those genetic disorders and your patient also, because these are freely available, can be used by doctors and patients, so better doctor get uh, acquainted. And there are the, like this, there are many genetic resources which are freely available. So genetic evaluation, let us take an example of cardiomyopathy because it, which is well studied. Cardiomyopathy and genetics. This is a paper by American College of Medical Genetics Genomics recent genetic evaluation in cardiology, uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, what are the clinical practice guidelines? And they have said that genetic testing is indicated for cardiomyopathy to assist patient care and management of at-risk family members. So we have to be clear whether this genetic testing will help only to the patient only to the family members or both. And if it is helping to the management, we will go straight ahead with it. If it is not helping for the patient who has died, but it is going to help for the family member, we will go ahead with it. It is just for our interest that we want to know whether there is a genetic cause, be cautious about it. Because if just doctor wants to explore the cause of this, the disease in the patient, be cautious about it because you may land up in problems in the reports if you're not clear about the aim of the testing in the patient. So cardiomyopathy is as this, this would be discussed in your meetings or you know about it. So the rationale to identify genetic risk is so compelling to find out in not only cardiomyopathy but many other disease that if the patient is found to be at risk can undergo interval screening. So even in Indian patients, I think cardiology societies have to define if they are going to be going ahead with genetic applications, what would be the standard recommendation for at risk members, for family members, for patients uh, where there is genetic mutation identified so that they can plan out uh, the screening and they can slowly, this guidelines go into health checkup, right? So cardiology societies have to come up, uh, come ahead with their own genetic uh, screening guidelines for patients and family members. Uh, at risk, affected but asymptomatic. So what are the applications apart from patients? The patient is at risk, affected. Affected meaning some symptoms may be found on health screening, checkup, or some mild symptomatology, but still asymptomatic for the disease in a large way. Clinically unaffected but may have implications, say, detected in family members. So you have clinically unaffected person coming with you. So what are the implications? And in those patients, it is very important that you have to do a clinical phenotype which, which is very defined. So say cardiac, so in cardiomyopathy you have hypertrophic, you have dilated, you have arrhythmogenic, you have restrictive. Why this is so important? You have to put these terms into your genetic databases. You just can't put cardiomyopathy and genetics. Neither mate khup sare genes yetat. Khup sare genetics report may be, you know, there, there are so many variants detected, you are confused. So you have to define the terminology. They are very specific. Nowadays it is called as HPO. You have human phenotype ontogenicity where you have a database you have to put these terms give it to the laboratory which are put it into com computer and the report is generated so the terminology specifications are very important that is phenotype definitions whom to test when to test how to test uh, obtain, so before that, you have to obtain a family history. We, have, we usually draw three generation pedigrees to see if any, there is any family member. Uh, phenotypic screening of cardiomyopathy in at-risk family members, which includes serial phenotype screening rep recommendations, types of testing by cardiomyopathy uh, phenotype. I have just taken this example. You can apply to any example, any disease in cardiology where genetic testing is applicable. Then refer, to pa refer the patients if to expert centers if needed. Genetic counseling of patients and families before the reporting and what are the implications before you send the report and whether there is any therapy based on the phenotype, whether this genetic report will help you in therapy modifications, management, drug devices or any special clinical recommendation by that gene. This is also available now that this is the gene, this is the mutation and this would be specific therapy recommended for these patients and we welcome these data from many cardiologists, they co collaborate with us. That if we try and find out genes and how these therapies helped in our Indian patients would be a good recommendation on our patients. And these are the cautions. Cautions after genetic reports. I would quickly go with those, gen <laughs> I don't have time. Caution, variant interpretation should be very thoughtful, rigorous, and uh, updated. These are, the re these are all the resources uh, which are freely available and go on and see it. Uh, so if you, can, if you can take two examples, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, these are the core genes which are causative of hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy. But 
diagnostic yield is 30 to 60 percent and in dilated it 10 to 40 percent. So we are still not able to diagnose rest of the patients because research is not complete in, from the genetic perspective point of view or there may not be correlation. So that should be very important. And secondary, that in the report there may be secondary, second gene reported. These are the secondary findings which are associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and high probability and that is very reported. And you should also uh, keep in mind metabolic causes, mitochondrial disorders if your gene reports get, get uh, are negative. So this is this should be kept in mind. Uh, just to have to, you know, how you know how we do uh, genetics and basics of it. We are all made up of uh, cells which contain chromosomes, which have DNA. DNA has ATGC, that is um, nucleotides. And the gene is made up of exons, introns, exons, introns. And the exons make, make up mRNA, which mRNA has a coding region which is exons and mRNA makes a protein. So mRNA makes a protein, this is all our second year microbiology. And these are the terms exactly which are used in the report that codon and you know this is a mRNA spliced and this is, this, this is the, this, the, so I will show you one report also. And these are the terminologies, these are all terminologies put in that genetic report which will come to your table that the genes, alleles, uh, phenotype, genotype. So if there is a gene which is always present in pair, the, the, the form of gene is allele. So if you have two unlike alleles, different alleles, this is heterozygous form. If the two alleles are same, it is homozygous. So if one heterozygous meaning one may be mutated, one may be normal. So that is also heterozygous. Homozygous, both normal can be there, both mutated can, can be there. So this is a genotype and this is a phenotype. So if phenotype say normal wings, you can same, uh, same way you can apply in disease, normal wings to uh, deformed wings. So this is genotype which is normal to abnormal in for that particular disease. So these are the terminologies that phenotype is the expression of characters of the genotype and genotype is the description of the, that particular gene at that particular locus. And why we get variations? Because 99% of human DNA of all of us is same, but 1% which differs gives us variations. So that is why we are variable. We have same organs, same pathophysiology. Disease is also same in same patients if it comes to cardiomyopathy. But we'll, we are still different. Presentations are different in each person. Drugs are different. Manifestations are different. One person of cardiomyopathy may not have sudden cardiac death. Suddenly, other person gets a sudden cardiac death. Suddenly, some patient, you know, may be normal till 60, 70 years old. And that is what answers genomics. You know, cardiologists, everybody wants from genomics. That why the, the difference, like in corona, one person is behaving milder, one person behaving suddenly land up, landing up in ICU. So that is what is uh, the change, that is variation. So we have variations and in any of the alleles and these variations can be benign or pathogenic. So we nowadays call mutation as pathogenic variant. So nowadays every report mentions pathogenic variant. We don't mention mutations, it is pathogenic variant. So if it is a pathogenic variant, it is causative of the disease. And uh, genes, of course, you know, if change, these are the etiologies which I'll skip, genetic variant. Uh, some genetic variants are harmful, which give right to disease. The, some, sometimes it may not be sufficient enough to cause the disease, and sometimes it may be completely benign. So if <clears throat> this, this, is a, uh, this is a screenshot from a report, that if there is this, this, this terminology we should be aware of, this is what you have to explain to the patient, because the report comes out, you send it to the laboratory, and you are at the receiving end and end at the patient's table that you have to explain this report. So homozygous, four base pair deletion in exon six in that and that particular gene. So what it means, uh, if this is a normal mRNA, and if protein is forming because of some mutation, protein chain terminates, and that is why protein is abnormal, and that is why your protein is abnormal, and that is why the disease is there. So this is how you can explain the reports. These are the panels available. You will re read on reports, targeted panels, exome sequencing, genome sequencing. We are fast moving from uh, gene panels to whole exome sequencing. Uh, most of these patients are nowadays doing whole exome because costs are very low, and now soon we will go ahead and do whole genome sequencing, and that is being very very commonly done by uh, pediatricians, obstetricians. We are directly getting reports. Even geneticists are now not prescribing tests. We are getting the reports if they are difficult. Otherwise, the tests are very being rapidly done in many specialties. So what is the targeted gene panel? We, show, we saw that there is exo, exon, intron, exon, intron. So if there is targeted panel for that particular disease, the yield is high. If we are saying all the exons 
from our 20,000 genes, it is whole exome. And if we have studied whole 20,000 genes with exon intron, it is whole genome. So whole exome is entire portion of genome consisting of protein coding sequences that is exons. And genome is sum total of all the genetic component in that cell of that organism. So if this is the genetic sequence ATGC, ATGC normal at particular locus, and you see if there is one single base pair change that is mutation. So this is how it is read in exome sequencing. So the laboratory has to read a lot of data and that is why clinician, if it is specific, can give, uh, laboratory can give you the specific report. Can I get few more minutes, finish it up here? Neither direct last jump karte, if I can get two, three minutes more. Okay, and then this is few base pair deletions. So that is what the report was mentioning, that there are few base pair deletions in exon 6. So that is how it looks like for that laboratory for, to give this data. These are various panels available, single variant in a gene, targeted gene panels, cardiomyopathy panels, whole exome sequencing, and techniques and benefits. You may get uh, this in uh, the recent publications. I'm skipping on it. And variant of unknown significance. This is written in the report, back pages of the report. What is pathogenic? What is likely pathogenic? What is benign variant of uncertain significance? So any laboratory report, you pick it up, and the last two pages will give the information how to explain it to the patient. This is how it looks like, that the gene is given, the location of that mutation or variation is given. In certain uh, population, like, you know, the um, uh, athletes or some gym goes, whether we can have health checkup plans suggesting this in the reports. And they may come to then cardiologists, physicians, or geneticists for further recommendations. So whether some for some population we can apply it. So benefits in recommendation for general population could be hyperlipidemia is very high risk of mutation carriers in our population and in Western also. In Western, some of the data they have found out one in 200 people carrying some of the other gene for hyperlipidemias. So identifying high risk in general health checkups and family member skin. So they've definitely these can be put up as an uh, for the population uh, factors and population studies. So to start, summarize, uh, we have genetic tests in defined phenotype to be pursued, not a problem. Uh, history, clinical details, autopsy details are very important, especially when it comes to SCD. Specification of phenotype gives a better yield and confidence of the physician or cardiologist to explain the report. Choosing genes in that particular phenotype and discussing it with the laboratory or geneticist is very important. And interpretation, you know, you should be confident, pre- and post test counseling, and collaboration of study. I mean, I'm, we are open at topology genomics also and medgenome laboratory I'm working with them. So anybody who wants to do studies in CAD, studies in SCD, studies in channelopathies, we are open to do collaborative studies in multiple centers so that we can have our own data uh, and want to go be confident uh, about how to go ahead with our patients. Because we are still struggling to uh, convince our families and patients for CPR. So we would be struggling more for genetics. So before that, let us get confident if we collaborate our study and data. Thank you. Thank you for giving me more time. Thank you, madam, for elaborating on this unusual aspect of the study of the disease. And the last slide, Raila Mazo. The last slide, we can't go ahead with, you know, you have to solve a puzzle in every genetics and every SCD. So unless somebody holds cardiologists, physicians, our pathologists, our genetic laboratory, everybody has to hold, put that puzzle out, and then form the report that hey, SCD and hey, genetics. Yes, madam, thank you, sir. clinicians are all aware that all non-communicable diseases have some genetic background, but we are not trained. Thank you for taking us to the, all this course of genetic background. I think we all need a training in this particular aspect. Thank you, thank you. This is one question. In a family, suppose you have one patient who has got, say, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You have genotype and phenotype, both are there. His brother is genotype positive, but phenotype negative. So, so this stratification for sudden death uh, is still on cards, which I would say there is recent paper which I didn't quote because of the time limit. So what we can do is, uh, as I've said, that if the patient is affected, have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and has a genotype, definitely has a risk stratification more for SCDs, right? And there is, I think, risk uh, up to 40 to 60% in some papers. For asymptomatic member with 
uh, genotype, as you said, right? Asymptomatic member with gene mutation. So that is where I was saying in the last few slides that if we can come up with the screening, like we are doing in breast cancers now. So what we are doing in breast ovarian cancers, that definitely genetic testing is warranted in every breast cancer woman for BRCA1, BRCA2, and other hereditary cancers. And we will provide a plan of screening every year or six months, depending on the obstetrician or a uh, oncologist, as to what to screen, like mammography or other testing. So similarly, in those genotype positive patients, we should come up with a screening plan. And depending on the screening, then your risk gets added. Like we are doing now in CAD polygenic risk. Polygenic risk, genotype, if you have other risk factors adding, then we can stratify the risk and give the report to the patient. Stratify such patients further. हाँ मंजे मत क्या ला तुम्हें स्क्रीनिंग ला पढ़ होना रहा नहीं स्क्रीनिंग में दे तुमसे रिस्क फैक्टर ऐड होना रहा लाइक वे सेम वे आर डूइंग इन कैंसर्स सो स्लोली इट इस कमिंग इनटू कार्डियोवेस्कुलर जीनोमिक्स आल्सो सो एन एक्सटेंशन टू हिस क्वेश्चन ओनली एस आई अंडरस्टैंड दैट जेनेटिक टेस्टिंग higher cardiac arrest risk. Yes. So in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we have entire gene panel. Do you know a gene in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which puts them to a higher risk of sudden cardiac arrest? Yes, sir. I didn't uh, focus on that for the time limits, but there, I had listed few genes in that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which are causative. Core, core genes. Yeah. Core genes... Uh, uh, आले तर तेला रिस्क मंजे तेला स्क्रीनिंग ला ठेवाय चल सो इफ सो एवरी जीन हैज दैट हैज एंड जीन स्पेसिफिक थेरेपी आल्सो रिपोर्ट्स आर अवेलेबल जीन स्पेसिफिक स्क्रीनिंग इज आल्सो अवेलेबल एंड यू कैन डेफिनेटली टेल देम या या सो कॉजिटिव जीन आई अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट वी वांट सी नो मेनी मेनी फैमिलीज हैव हाइपरट्रोफिक कार्डियोमायोपैथी मेनी फैमिलीज हैव डायलेटेड कार्डियोमायोपैथी कोरोनरी डिजीज but to be able to have a gene which can in the family tell that you are at a higher risk of sudden cardiac death is what our question is. So, so you have... We have a phenotype. We know it's hypertrophy. Is he going to die suddenly? So you want to, you want to differentiate he is anyway high risk for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but whether he is also high risk for sudden cardiac that's death. Right. So, that, right. so that threshold, sir, we have to study with more reports. And that is why I... I, I, I put a last summary as collaboration of the data. So if we start doing these genes, these many genotype positive or symptomatic family members, and these many were put in our screening plans, and these many had a sudden cardiac death. So few reports have already come out in Western countries. We should have our own data for it. So, so educate me a little more about, because you know, these are terms which we hear. Uh, SNPs, now, you know, good SNPs and bad SNPs, and, one of the reasons why many people uh, with coronary artery disease, I mean, we, you know, the sudden cardiac death does not occur in every patient who has a myocardial infarction. It occurs in only select few people. The others are spared. They, they have sufficient angina, they have sufficient time to go to the hospital and report. Whereas there are these unfortunate people who have a sudden cardiac arrest and it's believed that they have unfavorable SNP. So what is this unfavorable SNP or a detrimental SNP and can the SNP be tested? So this summarizes your question also, sir, because as you said that we have to differentiate hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and sudden cardiac death. And in our patients, you have also other confounding factors like CAD, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, obesity, diabetes. So this, how this comes as, and then how will you predict sudden cardiac death? So you have to have research where we can have threshold for cardiomyopathy and sudden cardiac death. And that is where this slide comes, which I had shown you, that these are single nucleotide SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. So what is single nucleotide polymorphism is? Changes in the DNA sequence are called genetic variants. And majority of the time, genetic variants have no effect at all. Like we have studied in COVID genome. Some of the COVID viruses had some variation, which are benign and viruses are still, but when it became pathogenic, it came as a pandemic. So this is the variation in this person, where C nucleotide cytosine is replaced by a genomic variation by thymine. So this is single nucleotide polymorphism, polymorphism meaning many forms in different individuals, which are at the single nucleotide base, which may be present in general population, and that is why they are giving variations. When this variation becomes 
comes to a stage when it causes disease we call it as pathogenic variation so single nucleotide polymorphism are being studied so that is why clusters of sudden cardiac death so clusters of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are studied and then you stratify which are the polymorphisms we have got on analysis which are putting them high risk in sudden cardiac death by numbers statistically then you call them as bad if those polymorphisms are not putting statistically, that is that the first slides are in cell, the report, the paper is very nice, where they have studied transcriptone. Okay, this polymorphism, this variation, is it causing gene expression in that particular septum causing this and that is why putting that person in high risk. So that is what is transcriptome analysis. Transcriptome means um, uh, gene to mRNA to protein. So what they are doing is they are studying mRNA profile of this uh, produced from these genes. So whatever transcriptome comes, if it is abnormal and only causing disease, that is what is we are now up to. So we have to now find why this polymorphism in bad in only some patients and why this polymorphism is good in why, why some patients. So if there are any confounding factors like obesity, CAD, we have to remove and it is a correlation. So I, a, I think a long we way to go for here. some genes. Uh, thank you so much thank for you, the you, excellent talk. Sir, first line that is why no literacy in cardiovascular gene. You know, there is much to go, much to go ahead about. Thank you. Thank you all. Relevant, but uh, maybe a little less discussed topic. And when Dr. Bhagwat wanted to have this theme for the KBCon 2023 after a gap of two years, uh, it was a welcome thing. So, uh, there are different aspects of sudden cardiac death that you will probably get a chance to hear today. And uh, my uh, focus will be on kind of uh, uh, trying to read the ECG better <clears throat> and suspect who is at risk of sudden cardiac death. A few remarks on echocardiogram and I'll tell you why few. There is a lot of imaging that also will come in play, but that is, I leave it for the other speakers. It's well planned for others. And uh, what is probably <clears throat> my core uh, work is about EP studies. So whether that has any role today uh, or what is the role of EP study in stratifying somebody who is at risk of sudden cardiac death. Can we move this? Back. Backwards. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I think in the first talk you must have heard <coughs> a lot about this. Usually, so my top talk was about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. How does the ECG and echo help and what is the role of EP study? So, obviously uh, reduced ejection fraction is associated with these common etiologies. Uh, cardiomyopathy, ischemic or non-ischemic variety and then uh, Cardiomyopathy is like hypertrophic and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which are less frequently uh, seen, but not rare. So I think, uh, and then uh, something that must be rare in a physician's, uh, uncommon in a physician's practice is to see adults with operated congenital heart disease, which is also going to be more and more in the coming years because of a lot of pediatric cardiac surgeries being done these days. So we might, so just a few passing remarks on that. Now, when one talks of uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, uh, it is not much of a. It is. It is. It should be a common understanding that once somebody has a cardiac arrest or a VT, then these people are obviously at risk for a next event coming sooner than later, maybe in a year's time. So you need to urgently plan in these patients what to do ahead. But what needs to become a common knowledge is regarding this so-called stable heart failure patient. So people with reduced ejection fractions who are actually many of them follow up in your, following up in your practice and you keep calling them stable, uh, one day you may hear the bad news because of sudden cardiac death. So <clears throat> you as much as physicians need to be sensitized because then only will they raise this discussion in their outpatients as to what is sudden cardiac death prevention in these group of patients. 
so actually that is the real crux and uh, sometimes people are not known at all with any heart disease and a great number of them have a sudden cardiac arrest events and obviously this is still difficult to restratify but when you read the ecgs you may actually think about that also <clears throat> So I think once again, this might have already been discussed in uh, uh, preceding talks. Primary prevention. So secondary prevention is uh, simple, straightforward, and uh, unless there is a good reason not to take steps towards it, like somebody is already end of life in heart failure or has a malignancy or a bad other organ disease or is mentally impaired, you would always plan a ICD in a person who is a survivor of a cardiac arrest or has had a VT, irrespective of whether that VT was hemodynamically stable or unstable. Because this event may have been hemodynamically stable VT, but the next one may not be. So secondary prevention is actually not much of a discussion. Primary prevention is where you have to anticipate who is at a risk of sudden cardiac death and suggest ICD in these patients to prevent uh, sudden cardiac death. So ICD, I think... Uh, is implantable cardioverter defibrillator or it is also called as AICD, automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator and this is uh, quite a proven therapy so uh, we used to in fact even say ahead of its times because we didn't have firm understanding of who should get it or who all should get it or who selectively should get it but the device was a very effective way to prevent sudden cardiac death. So now talking of ECG, obviously first thing is to obtain an ECG during the event and uh, read that ECG carefully as being VT and how to handle that again. The second thing is to read the ECG in your office and uh, in your clinic and uh, in a patient, for example, who has palpitations or syncope and has heart failure with reduced rejection fraction and try to judge the risk in that patient. And then you may have to do something more... Uh, uh, searching in terms of either recording a spontaneous uh, non-sustained VT event, for example, by doing a long-term ECG monitoring, and there are more and more methods of that available in the current days, like your patch recorders, which were not there some years back, <clears throat> or exercise treadmill, which is uh, generally underused because most of us believe, or most of the most popular belief is that stress test is done to rule out ischemia. Although it's a lesser uh, investigation for inducing a VT, but still if you can, then the positive predictive value or a induced VT on a treadmill is as good as a spontaneous VT. So, so ECG comes into play in, uh, in these situations. Again, uh, ventricular arrhythmias is obviously the most common cause of sudden cardiac arrest rather than any bradyarrhythmia. And uh, that could be in various forms, and we should recognize them differently is because sustained monomorphic VT is usually a scar VT, and patients with heart failure with reduced, reduced ejection fraction may have scars for different reasons. The most common, obviously, is a post-infarct scar, but it could be also a condition like sarcoidosis, which leaves behind scars. And then they could have other arrhythmias, like uh, uh, torsades, a polymorphic VT and ventricular fibrillation, most of the time a shock is required to convert. What form of shock, again, if you are reading the ECG correctly, then you can only synchronize the shock to the R wave if the ventricular arrhythmia is well formed like this. <clears throat> we are mainly talking of monomorphic VT where you do DC cardioversion, that is, it's a synchronized shock, whereas if your ventricular arrhythmia event is uh, like VF then uh, or poly torsades, then you will probably defibrillate. That is, you would remove the synchronization from your shock. Otherwise, that shock will never come and restore sinus rhythm. So ECG reading there. And the device is actually very, very uh, efficient in doing that. So that's a picture of an ICD implanted. And then you can see that if it is VF, the device doesn't wait. <clears throat> or if it is a polymorphic VT, the device shocks and restores. So this is a shock, restores sinus rhythm, whereas there, if it's a VT, it will pace, try to terminate. If it doesn't terminate by pacing, then it will shock and terminate. So the device is very effective, and that's the whole reason why we must read the ECGs and the echo carefully, because we do not want sudden cardiac arrests in heart failure patients, which could have been preventable. So secondary prevention is uh, 
usually very clear once you record a VT, there is, as I already said, I think, earlier that this hemodynamically tolerated, I think, doesn't hold true. Whether it is ischemic heart disease or dilated cardiomyopathy, whatever be the etiology, the guidelines, the recent ones, are very clear that in an ischemic heart disease patient, you may rule out the need for revascularization and do it appropriately, but scar VT is not necessarily coming from ischemia, so it doesn't mean treating ischemia will take care of your VT recurrence. It may be independently required to improve the survival, but so far. And in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, if it is newly diagnosed, you may, in the present era, definitely wait for optimizing the medical therapy and then, uh, say, three months or so, and then bring in the discussion of uh, primary prevention. But secondary prevention is always due. <clears throat> Unless in this case there is something like a sarcoidosis which is active and you want to treat with immunosuppression first and then consider, but you cannot avoid ICD in most instances in this secondary prevention scenario. Coming to the primary prevention, look at the ECG carefully for QRS width, configuration, and voltage. Obviously, when you're talking of ventricular arrhythmias, your focus is on the QRS. So width, configuration, and voltage are to be looked at carefully. Width comes from any of these. Either there is a bundle branch block or there is a scar in the ventricle which delays the conduction in the ventricle or there is a hypertrophy or the ventricle is dilated. Any of these things, should you should be able to pick up, suspect on the ECG and pick up further on imaging starting from echo to whatever more we'll discuss in through the day, MRIs and FDG PETs. But this is important to take home that your wide QRS should immediately raise a red flag in your mind that the ventricle must be diseased. Then see the configuration carefully, what form it is. Predominantly, a left bundle branch block is today interesting in heart failure patients because it leads to better heart failure therapies. And in a post-infarct patient, look at the extent of the Q waves, how many leads have QRS, uh, how many leads have Q waves or suggestive of a previous infarct that would tell you how large the infarct may be and then subsequently larger the scar, more the chance of getting a ventricular arrhythmia. <clears throat> and a fragmented QRS is probably the only sign which has uh, been a predictor of sudden cardiac arrest. So uh, a fractionated QRS is important to uh, read. For example, here you have a large anterior, old anterior infarct Q in almost all the precordial leads and here you have a large inferior one in fact. So the extent of notching, extent of the Q waves, how many leads have, gives you a fair idea of how big the scar may be and therefore a risk of uh, sudden cardiac death. And this is how a fractionated QRS, <clears throat> so it is basically multiple deflections of the QRS along with increasing the width of the QRS. So if you look at these leads, this is, this would, suggests to me that this patient is at a higher risk of sudden cardiac arrest. So fractionated QRS is important to uh, note. And then uh, the QRS voltage, a low voltage QRS means there is a loss of myocardium significantly. And that obviously means a large scar and a lesser ejection fraction. So once again to recap, the width of the QRS and the configuration of the QRS for example, post anterior wall MI, if the QRS has a configuration of QRBBB, then it's a proximal LED related infarct, so it should be large and it should be lead to a great amount of LV systolic dysfunction and subsequently a higher sudden cardiac death risk. Sometimes you forget that the right ventricle may be also responsible for <coughs> sudden cardiac arrest and there are two etiologies that are important. One is arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy and post tetralogy of fallow repair. This classical sign of epsilon wave in ARVC, the, the right bundle branch like looking, is important but it is uncommon. More common is to see the mid precordial T wave inversions. An echo will immediately tell you that the RV is dilated and at least then you must correlate that this ECG is suggesting a arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, <coughs> which if it is along with the left ventricular involvement, then the sudden cardiac arrest risk is higher. So echo helps you to refine that, uh, that risk stratification. And tetralogy of fallow, the width of the QRS, say more than 160, 180 milliseconds, 
and the extent of PR and the extent of RV dysfunction. But the first step is to see the width of the QRS in a post tetralogy of fallow repair patient. And that tells you that who may be at a higher risk. So actually, if you look at the recommendations of ICD and CRT, they clearly go by the ejection fraction. Once the etiology is diagnosed, the ejection fraction and the NYHA class tells you the primary prevention indication. So actually, uh, so if the ejection fraction is less than 35% and the NYHA class is 2 or 3, it's a ICD indication of the highest degree. And somewhat still a class 1 indication is LVAF less than 30% and even uh, mild or no symptoms. So actually the ejection fraction seems to dictate the need for an ICD and the level of indication is probably by the NYHA class. <clears throat> so uh, it seems uh, that the echo is important, but only as far as the estimating the ejection fraction is concerned. Therefore, my remarks are a little in passing because if you are to practice primary prevention, then the game is set, who gets ICD and who not. But this doesn't get very practical all the time because there is something called as number needed to treat and you would have to implant ICDs in a large number of patients for the benefit of preventing sudden cardiac arrest and that may be cost-wise unmanageable and therefore we will restratify these patients further <coughs> what happened by doing imaging which I think will be outlined more in some of the future uh, talks yeah thanks but uh, so therefore primary prevention indication is Almost in everybody with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction if it is less than 30 to 35%. So are we going to do this or are we going to, I call it taking the bait, meaning you ask carefully for symptoms suggestive of tachyarrhythmia, palpitations, pre-syncope, syncope, or a single non-sustained VT event or a small scar in MRI. Will these immediately become ICD indication and therefore whether we can stop at ECG and echo and some inclination of symptoms being of arrhythmic etiology and decide ICD or will we need to do an EP study? That's probably the last leg of my talk. So EP in whom is probably where your symptoms are suggestive of an arrhythmia like a syncope or non-sustained VT. But for example, the LV function is not that bad, it is 40 or 45 percent, then your ejection fraction is not strongly dictating, but your symptoms are suggestive and there is a scar and there is some extent of uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and symptoms thereof. So if you look at the various guidelines, it is actually the same what I said. In ischemic cardiomyopathy, if somebody has had a syncope and the ejection fraction is more than 35 percent then you may need to do EP studies because less than 35 percent the guidelines tell you to put an ICD and syncope makes you a little more sensitized to the indication for ICD but the difficulty comes if somebody has a, either a suspicious symptom a suspicious of an arrhythmic cause of syncope or the LV ejection fraction is not too low then you are a little bit in two minds and Maybe the EP study will help you if there is an inducible sustained monomorphic VT, it becomes a kind of a, a, a indication for sure to consider an ICD and same probably with dilated cardiomyopathy that in these clinical scenario where the ejection fraction is not too bad and the symptoms are suggestive of an arrhythmic syncope, you may have to bring in an EP study to help you restratify better. <clears throat> EP study is done in a very peculiar way. Uh, it is the ventricle is stimulated from two sides with two drive cycle lengths, maximal three extra stimuli, and sometimes with even isoprenine. So EP study. So I want you to actually concentrate on this rather than this. Is this is the ventricular induction protocol, and you should induce a monomorphic VT like this. Then that is more specific to say that there was a arrhythmic ventricular arrhythmic etiology of that can explain the symptoms or that can portend the risk of sudden cardiac arrest. We do some more things in the EPs. We can do certain more things in the VT to estimate the extent of scar, 
but uh, then this is not a routinely done thing <clears throat> the interpretation of the ep study is the is the same that polymorphic vt and vf is a less specific finding you if you induce a sustained monomorphic vt the one that i showed you here like this then it is specific and a, a positive ep study and helps to restratify but ep study is uncommonly done why is because a heart failure patient with less than ejection fraction 35% has actually a direct primary prevention indication so you can actually go over with the discussion with the patient and find out his side of the story as to how keen <coughs> he is to uh, get an icd done so doing an ep study really uh, doesn't add much unless you want to clarify the symptoms or the ejection fraction is less so it is not necessarily routinely done again the yield of the ep study becomes another issue so while you induce a sustained monomorphic vt and you can say that somebody is at a risk of sudden cardiac arrest but if you don't induce a vt in a patient with significant structural heart disease low ejection fraction then the negative predictive value <coughs> is not that great so you don't use it to tell somebody that you are not at risk you only strengthen your indication by icd or for the icd by doing a ep study so it's not that it's a screening tool for deciding icd <clears throat> and again there is a difference in how easily you can induce an uh, induce in a vt in some of the most common etiologies ischemic heart disease versus non ischemic cardiomyopathy in non ischemic cardiomyopathy the chance of inducing is much lesser and therefore you will probably go by the ejection fraction in the correct circumstances vt inducible is equal to a spontaneous vt in ischemic cardiomyopathy so moral is that ischemic cardiomyopathy patient with doubtful or suspicious symptoms makes more sense to do a ep study in dilated cardiomyopathy the inducibility is a little lesser and therefore <coughs> may not be helpful and you may better go by the ejection fraction if you are are convinced that sudden cardiac arrest uh, sudden cardiac death prevention indication is good enough switching gears from the most common indications of ischemic and non ischemic cardiomyopathy to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and arvc there are all these different phenotypes and just maybe two more minutes is that in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy there is a this risk calculator which is free for all you can always download it from your from the net and you fill in these numbers and you get a risk for sudden cardiac arrest in next 5 years and uh, more than 5% is a definite indication but whenever you are in doubt also it is more a matter of uh, assessing these things and deciding whether a indication is there or not ep study is not at all recommended in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients to restratify for sudden cardiac arrest death the same is not true when you are discuss uh, when you are discussing Uh, the risk with a arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy patient there is also a risk calculator for arvc and a recent study as recent as last year showed that if you do a ep study then it adds value on top of <coughs> this risk calculator to give a idea of the risk estimation for 1 to 5 years so ep study is definitely recommended in a arvc patient because it adds value to your or uh, discussing the sudden cardiac arrest risk so that is a little difference between these two cardiomyopathies i think i'll skip this and cardiac sarcoidosis again uh, ep study is value but not in an acute inflammatory setting where immunosuppression should be done first but again not valuable when you clearly have a sudden cardiac arrest survivor ejection fraction less than 35% always icd indication but where the ejection fraction is more than 35% you if there is a value to doing a ep study and if you induce a sustained monomorphic vt and icd is indicated so in cardiac sarcoidosis there is a value in addition to the fact that you may proceed even to ablation for those ventricular arrhythmias in cardiac sarcoidosis in congenital heart disease also ep study is reasonable in fact uh, it goes to the extent that if somebody is a intracardiac post intracardiac repair for tof and now has a severe pr and needs a resurgery then uh, there is an advice to do a ep study before the resurgery 
and if there is a inducible VT, then these patients will post-operatively get an ICD. So once again, in post intracardiac repair of patients, there is a role for ICD. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy probably is the only place where it is strictly no-no. In others, you have to balance it based on the ejection fraction, arrhythmic symptoms, need to clarify them as to whether you will do EP study. If you do a EP study, a monomorphic VT is specific. Polymorphic VT and VF induced are considered as not specific. So very limited and a very, uh, very uh, clearly, uh, uh, with a clear reason, you should uh, do a EP study to re stratify uh, sudden cardiac arrest in patient, uh, sudden cardiac arrest risk in a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patient because most of the time the indication would be based on the NYHA class of symptoms and the uh, the extent of drop in ejection fraction. I think I will stop here and uh, maybe questions or now or later. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Yeah, uh, during uh, my talk I had mentioned that uh, it, it is seen that people with a better ejection fraction, say 30, 35, 40 range, the incidence of sudden death is higher in those patients as compared to those in patients who have got worse ejection fraction, Yeah, like 15, 20 percent. Now, what are its, the, the implications of this fact when you take decisions about putting in an ICD in these patients as, say, as for, for primary prevention? Yeah, so basically ejection fraction is uh, not a uh, is not a categorical cutoff <coughs> in sudden cardiac arrest risk estimation. So just like Dr. Bhagwat says that you can get a sudden cardiac arrest in a patient with ejection fraction of 40 percent, that is not untrue. And the risk is higher in a person who has a risk of 20, ejection fraction of 20 percent. So there's a graded risk from 20 to 45 is uh, one lesson to learn. And uh, it is not that uh, uh, that 40, 45 percent ejection fraction patients with heart failure with ejection fraction are not are not at risk. They are also at risk, but and probably more deaths happen in these patients. But if you understand as to how many with 20 ejection, 20 percent ejection fraction died, that number would be still higher. So uh, therefore, it is a ejection fraction based risk stratification. People who have better ejection fractions, you would re stratify if they have symptoms suggestive of arrhythmic etiology. So, that is your palpitations or pre syncope or syncope. And if you do a holter in them, if they have a non sustained VT, then you would re stratify them further. And today, uh, with the MRI and uh, MRI is probably helping you to understand the extent of the scar and therefore you may have to uh, think differently because uh, extent of the scar and uh, eje so ejection fraction drop is only a risk stratification in ischemic and dilated cardiomyopathy whereas some other forms of cardiomyopathies for example HCM there is no drop in ejection fraction so with other cardiomyopathy or infiltrative cardiomyopathy like sarcoidosis. It's not always the ejection fraction, but the extent of the scar. So there comes also the role of MRI as to how much is the extent of scar and that also decides the risk stratification. So uh, you will refine the risk stratification uh, more so with more imaging when people have uh, ejection fraction that is not below 35 percent. Yeah, so I think it's a clinical dilemma. We know very well about patients with uh, low ejection fraction less than 35 percent, but we don't know much about those with ejection fraction 35 to 55 percent. And many of them, I mean, in the population study, you will find larger number in that group having sudden death as opposed to uh, the lesser than 35 percent. So I think, as Ashish said, that in that group of people, we need more risk stratification. Over a period of time, we'll understand better. So imaging, uh, artificial intelligence, and genetics. I think these are the things which will probably guide us that in a preserved ejection fraction who are at higher risk of yeah. sudden cardiac death. Ashish, one comment and I need to uh, get your feedback is that, you know, uh, when we put in these devices, ICDs, uh, for prevention of uh, cardiac arrest and sudden death, uh, 
generally now the heart failure treatment has become better and better and the four pillars in terms of RNA, SGLT2 inhibitors, mm -hmm. the MRA and the beta blockers are being used and one would put devices when you have optimized your optimal medical therapy and then come to a then an understanding as to where, where the ejection fraction stands. Now, while we are optimizing the medical therapy, it often takes a couple of months. So generally, a broad number given is at least one should wait two to three months right. in attempt to optimize the medical therapy and then consider an ICD if it falls in that bracket as a primary prevention tool. I want your comment. I think that in this group of people where we are wanting to optimize medical therapy for their heart failure and LV ejection fraction, that is where the role of EP study probably becomes relevant because EP study in this group, while you are waiting, if it induces a monomorphic VT, you are certain that he will benefit from ICD despite his improvement in ejection fraction with the optimal medical therapy. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So I think uh, talking of ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, or post-infarct, those uh, <clears throat> one, one and a half months period when... Uh, so basically, if somebody gets a VT event in the first 48 hours, then obviously it is called as a primary uh, VT-VF and uh, you expect these patients not to get uh, again or the recurrence risk will be very low. Uh, and therefore, you don't immediately recommend uh, you treat the ischemia. Uh, people who get or have standard indication for ICD after one and a half months following the infarct are again uh, not much of a debate. The people who get VT in the first six weeks uh, can be a consideration as to how to deal with it and obviously it's a grey zone. Uh, if they get a sustained monomorphic VT after say 48 hours and the ischemia is well treated and it was a real sustained VT, not non-sustained events, then uh, you should overall estimate what the ejection fraction was, what, what was the, what is the overall uh, clinical status of the patient. And then you have two approaches here. One is either to uh, uh, consider an ICD still because he is a young patient, has been completely revascularized, the infarct scar is large, it was a late presentation for uh, at the acute MI scenario, the primary angioplasty was late or the result was suboptimal. All that you have to put in place and he was not on inotropes when he got the VT. All those facts have to be put in place before recommending ICD in this so-called moratorium period. And uh, uh, we, while we don't have much, but in uh, United States, they are able to put the life vest and uh, this uh, this uh, variable ICD, sorry, that helps us to uh, take care of this period when they may be at risk in the initial times. And then uh, if he gets a shock in this time or then you can recommend uh, ICD even before the time. And if he does not, then you may re-stratify after six weeks by the standard uh, criteria. So this... Uh, Initial period is uh, obviously you would optimize uh, uh, the treatment. Probably that is more valid in the newly diagnosed dilated cardiomyopathy where all the uh, medicines that we talked of, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, the, the RNEs and the HGLT2 inhibitors have all to be put in place and the ejection fractions re-evaluated because uh, whatever risks we talk of are usually long-term risks unless the person has a VTVF, sustained amount of VTVF, I immediately, or that is the presentation or the diagnosis in the first three months, then it again becomes a little issue. But primary prevention indication you need not practice in first three months because of newly diagnosing a cardiomyopathy because uh, it's the long-term risk that you're talking of. So in the short term, it is best to have optimized all the uh, anti-failure therapy and re-evaluated the ejection fraction and seen the extent of scar and then go by that criteria after three months uh, period. So I think just to add to Ola's point is that one important medical point is that before you start Yeah, I think we can take that. So even if it's a patient who is for a 
ICD or CRT, you please give their own ACL because many times they are doing drugs. They fit into the criteria for device therapy. Instead of doing that, if you are able to shift, maybe at least one third or even one fourth of your patients may come down. So that is the primary point on that. One small point. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, with the stress test, now underutilization is of course in the patient whose ejection fraction is more than 35 uh, percent. Only in those patients. Yes. Anything which is less than 35 percent, there is no question of subjecting them to a treadmill test. Now, in those patients whom we are likely to, because they have come with some palpitations, maybe a doubtful syncope and other things, and you want to find out whether he has any arrhythmogenicity and you are trying to induce this arrhythmogenicity by doing a stress, stress test. Stress. Now, this will have to be done with a lot of mm -hmm. caution because the patient is already on a heart failure yeah, treatment. Now, this uh, consequence of uh, no, such a treatment. test, how has been evaluated at the risk of your patient? So, uh, basically, uh, what you are trying to clarify in the HEFREF stable patient who has symptoms suggestive of uh, arrhythmogenic origin like palpitations or pre is that you are trying to clarify whether it has been a VT event. Now, stress test is not necessarily a uh, usually sensitive test to detect a VT as the cause of those symptoms, but still it is something that is simply done. And having a monomorphic VT on a stress test would be uh, quite uh, uh, equivalent to a clinical VT. And if you in a ischemic cardiomyopathy induce a polymorphic VT, your thoughts may be towards treating the ischemia still better. Uh, secondly, what you said important is that yes, when you do stress test for ischemia evaluation, I think uh, everybody calls it a safe uh, test and you can easily do it in uh, even self-standing diagnostic centers, which is, uh, but when you are doing with a VT indication, my practice has been strictly to do it in a hospital setting because your indication itself is to see if a VT is inducible and uh, then uh, it is better to do it at a well-equipped place. Right, so in a hospital setting. Yes. That would be the desirable thing. Yes, yes. So of course, the important point which you stressed about uh, analysis, ECG analysis still becomes very important initially is about the fractionated Q waves yeah. analysis. Yes. In a routine ECG, that I think is a very important oh. yeah. aspect when you think about, especially in patients with very much heart failure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, now we switch to online mode and connect with Dr. Shantanu Sen Gupta from Nagpur for some issues pertaining to the sudden cardiac death risk. Amit Over to you. Amit Vora, sir, a short comment, uh, Dr. Amit, that you uh, wanted to correlate AI genetics and clinical. But uh, clinical and genetics Switch data correct. correlation will go slowly into AI. That's the future. That then online? you get AI apps which correlate this. Oh. Yeah, I'm not. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, good. Thank you. So let me first thank uh, Dr. Ashish Nagar and Dr. Bhagwat uh, for having me here. So my task has been, uh, I mean, this topic is really interesting. Uh, how to identify uh, uh, patients of sudden cardiac uh, death, uh, risk patients on, uh, on an echo and how does it look? So that was really interesting. So uh, a lot of cases to show. Uh, so this was, I'm just going to give a very brief uh, history and show you more of images. Uh, this was a 50 years old a male a patient had chest pain since last three days uh, and you start getting this kind of uh, images. So once you uh, find uh, uh, an image, uh, you start looking at the LV, a very distorted septum, distal septum, couple of more images. And as, as you can see, there was uh, uh, this patient had a, a, a defect, a VSR, uh, which was, which was uh, picked up a uh, uh, couple of more images. So as I could uh, listen to Dr. Nabar's presentation that any patient who has an uh, uh, LVEF, which is poorer, uh, becomes a high risk for sudden cardiac death, of course, by, because of arrhythmias. But 
if you get this kind of entity, then uh, the immediate treatment is to go for a surgical correction. Uh, the second case, uh, again, an elderly, 60 years old male patient coming uh, with heart failure symptoms and why say class 3, class 4 symptoms. And once we understand that this is a dilated LV, uh, and you start uh, behaving, uh, uh, you can see that this is a patient of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But the important part is you start identifying this uh, uh, problematic entity. Now, uh, the most important thing is uh, for everyone uh, to understand that this is nothing but a, a lot because so you can see areas of central uh, clearing. Uh, uh, but once you see a clot, uh, just don't be happy that uh, you are seeing a clot and you have diagnosed, but you have to start identifying uh, is there any evidence of myocardial dissection? Because uh, if you start seeing blackish area here, just beyond the clot, then there may be an entity of myocardial dissection with an underlying clot in a patient of, uh, of severe LV dysfunction. Because this kind of substrate of patients uh, have very high arrhythmogenic component and or a sudden cardiac death. So there are, they, they can die because of an arrhythmia or they can have a sudden cardiac, uh, uh, sudden ventricular asystole because of LV dysfunction and or else this can rupture uh, and, and can cause problems. Uh, to, to zoom it up, you can see, so this, if you have underlying uh, blackness beyond the, uh, the, uh, this place, then you start and, and use of contrast can help. So I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is an entity called myocardial dissection with underlying uh, hematoma, a very important entity. A uh, couple of more cases. Uh, uh, so this was a case, uh, 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 I'm just uh, showing you uh, uh, the entity. Again, came with chest pain. Uh, remember, uh, it has been a dictum that whenever you are seeing a patient with chest pain and uh, ECG changes, even before taking him or her for an angiogram uh, or a PAMI or, or a, a thrombolysis, whatever you are trying to do it, please look at the aorta because aortic dissection is one of the biggest problems. Clinically, you have to look at the peripheral pulses and you can start looking at the dissection, dissecting part. Uh, of the aorta. So this is uh, 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 acute, uh, this is aortic dissection. Uh, and remember, you have a true lumen and a false lumen. So the, the largest one uh, lumen is generally the false lumen, and the smaller one becomes the true lumen in a patient of, uh, of uh, acute uh, aortic dissection. Uh, the extent of aortic dissection should be sought out by looking at all the parasternal and the apical views, but then we should also go at the uh, at the suprasternal and look at the arch. And if you're now here in this patient, you are seeing the aortic flow reversal, suggesting that this patient must be having severe AR. Normally, the flow is forward, which is blue in color, but if you're seeing a red color flow, that means the flow is going back, causing aortic regurgitation. Uh, and uh, you, we will have to always look at the subcostal view to look at the extent of the images. Uh, here, this is the descending abdominal aorta, and you can see the flap extending. So this, these are uh, immediate candidates. Uh, if not uh, treated by surgery, uh, they are surely going to die. So the window period is, is very minimal. So make it dictum that we should always should do an echo uh, imaging a screening before any patient of chest pain comes up and and has has an evaluation before either he's taking for a for a cath procedure and or a thrombolysis because if you, if you have a dissection that can be catastrophic. Uh, Ashish did Dr. Nabar did suggest that uh, one of the entity of uh, this, uh, uh, sudden cardiac death is HCM hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and we do know that there are many variants. And this is a classical case of HCM. I just wanted to show that uh, whenever you are diagnosing HCM, please, apart from looking at the uh, the uh, uh, gradient uh, at the LVOT, it is mandatory to screen at the RV output tract also. Because 10 percent, around 8 to 12 percent of patients of HCM will have an RV output tract obstruction. And these patients uh, cannot be sent for septal ablation 
uh, they are a candidate for cardiac transplant because looking at uh, going to the RV side becomes problematic. Uh, and, and this, as the RV obstruction, if it is present, the chances of uh, risk of uh, uh, arrhythmias are, are even higher. Uh, as you can see, the, the RV produced a gradient of as high as 75. So this is an important entity should be identified in all patients who are going uh, who, who have an HCM component. Uh, now this is another interesting case. Uh, we have been discussing about ARVC. So this patient, uh, a young male, uh, had already an ICD. You can see implanted, uh, which is there, but. Uh, let me tell you uh, some key points about ARVC is that uh, uh, on echo it can be diagnosed even before you can send the patient for an, uh, for an MR or a CT. Is you do have a dilated RARV and the second important thing is at RV outflow tract, so in parasitical short axis view, the RV outflow tract, the pulmonary arteries should be normal size. So, if you have RARV dilated and if the there is uh, the pulmonary artery are larger in size, then you start thinking of the other differentials, like it can be an ASD component or, or a pulmonary hypertension because of any cause, or pulmonary anything. But the classical of ARVD, uh, ARVC is you should have an RARV dilated with a normal pulmonary arteries. And then you start looking at the apex to see for the out pouches, or which are also called microaneurysms. And as you can see, there are multiple microaneurysms this patient had. And this is the classical case of AR, ARVC. A uh, couple of more key, uh, motor images. This, this has already been discussed. These are the classical uh, epsilon waves. But uh, as, as, as an MR, uh, as you can see, this, these are the I will, I will try to freeze it at one frame uh, just to show you that these are the uh, the classical microaneurysms which are seen uh, in the RV outflow outpouch. But if you see, the pulmonary artery size is always has to be normal. But if you are seeing pulmonary artery dilated or, or for, for that age and uh, sex specific, then you start thinking of pulmonary hypertension. So that may be uh, may not be an ARVC. So two points on an echo: RARV RV dilated uh, with the normal pul uh, pulmonary arteries, uh, but and micro aneurysms or uh, out pouches which are seen, and of course ECG is going to help. So these are the out pouch pouches uh, which are seen on an MR. Uh, uh, another case. Uh, uh, so this was a may. So I mean, I I showed you all the classical cases of sudden cardiac patients who are at risk of sudden cardiac death, but we should also identify this entity. So this was a lady uh, who was pregnant and uh, she had come in in pregnancy with uh, with labor pains uh, and delivered a baby uh, which, uh, uh, which is all comfortable. But suddenly next one hour she uh, was, she uh, had breathlessness, had, was in heart failure, uh, subtle STD changes uh, which was not there. She was a young lady. And, you, and we see this kind of entity. So this was, uh, uh, we start thinking of peripartum cardiomyopathy uh, as, a, as a component, but a serial echo is, is needed uh, in this case, in this patient. We did, we saw that the pro BNP was higher, which dropped where, where relatively less. So this is another important thing where the pro BNP goes very high and the drops are relatively lesser uh, managed. And uh, this is nothing but uh, 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 Takasuko cardiomyopathy, 48 hours, the LV improved completely. Now, remember, Takasuko cardiomyopathy, is, it is not necessarily benign. And these are the reports uh, uh, that uh, they all present as acute coronary event. And you can have an in the hospital mortality as high as 8%. So remember, uh, as compared to STEMI, uh, uh, Takasuko has a higher elevation of BNP as compared to the CHOP. And, and these are the triggering factors. So uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy uh, 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 is, is one of the entity, but acusable pregnancy has also been reported. And this was one patient who has come with, uh, presented with, with cardiac arrest uh, during time of pregnancy and has to, uh, there's a report which has been there. So this entity has to be identified uh, uh, about uh, uh, about Takasubu in pregnant in pregnancy. Uh, another uh, similar example uh, who came to me: two patients back to back in 15 days had come with attempted hanging, 
uh, and uh, uh, when we did the echo, and as you can see, uh, uh, there was uh, a dilated LV, uh, and the base was not contracting, the apex was contracting. So this was a patient of uh, uh, inverted Takasubo, uh, in a case who had hanging. So uh, this this entity we have started identifying last last ten years. Uh, you can see the apex is contracting, well, the, but the base is is is, is ballooned out. And uh, uh, again, the pro BNP were very high. I'm just looking at the echo pictures. And the fourth day, uh, she regained consciousness and the LB improved completely. So, uh, uh, remember that apical ballooning uh, has been reported, but we reported uh, this was a patient who came one month later uh, with, uh, uh, with this entity. And this is inverted Takasubo. Again, a subset of, of uh, uh, patient coming with arrest in the ICU. And you, this was the circulation paper which showed that stress cardiomyopathy can have apical ballooning, isolated midventricular ballooning, you can have basal ballooning, you can have global hypokinesia. But they generally recover pretty fast uh, within two to three weeks uh, and has to be uh, has to be identified. Another case, uh, 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 this was a patient uh, uh, who had uh, 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 dengue fever, as you can see, this no, this was H one N one positive patient, uh, uh, and 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 as, as you can see, uh, the LV LV has been dilated. I don't know why this is not working, but they also recover uh, recovered pretty well after uh, four to five days after the, LV, uh, after the treatment was uh, given for H one N one. So uh, an important case. Uh, in a patient uh, who had heart failure symptoms with normal coronaries and uh, completely investigated. Uh, and Ashish did uh, mention this about, uh, so this was a case who had an aneurysm uh, in the LV. Uh, and, and aneurysm, this is the aneurysm, which you can see. Uh, you, you can see the ventricular aneurysm. So this patient was uh, uh, had an MR, had aneurysm and parahyalin inflows went ahead to get an aneurysectomy and this came out to be a case of sarcoid. So cardiac sarcoid uh, uh, has a classical feature, either can present with ventricular aneurysms or they can come, come out with uh, basal uh, septal uh, uh, thinness so as has been reported and can and should be identified. Uh, these are the presentations of sarcoid, a very important entity and should be picked up uh, in, in every patient who is coming with an aneurysm defect when, when the other uh, CAG and everything is ruled out. More images on cardiac MR, I will not be going uh, because I think uh, uh, Dr. Chudgar is going to tell about the things. So generally they have uh, the predictors of mortality in the sarcoid is basically uh, cases of sustained VT or LV dilatation. And LV dilatation with aneurysm or basal septal uh, uh, thinness are, are can, can help us in identifying that this is an entity. So there is a big list of uh, 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 cases. Uh, I mean, I've shown six, seven of them about the routinely which we see, but uh, a strong sense uh, uh, sense of uh, suspicion with a good ECG should should help us in identifying this uh, entity where uh, 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 echo uh, does help in and in prognosticating. Uh, in, uh, about this this risk factor, but remember that we have to go for a serial echo. Uh, once echo itself doesn't uh, identify because something like myocardial dissection or, or septal rupture or tracheostomy uh, cardiomyopathy can only be identified on a bedside by a good echo uh, diagnosis. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to have any questions. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sengupta. Are there any questions on echo? This is a because every, almost you know so many physicians do echoes these days. So if you have any questions, any doubts, you can ask. Them. It was an excellent lecture by him, illustrating some very useful cases which uh, can predict sudden death, which are associated with sudden death. Um, my, I have one question. 
kind of impatience with uh, sudden death or you know, patients who had uh, resuscitation from sudden death. How often uh, you see a completely normal echo? Yeah, so I think I think it's a it's a very important thing. Uh, so we do already do an echo. Do we try to do an echo uh, during resuscitation if if everything is possible? Uh, many times during resuscitation, uh, if we see a VSR or a ventricular septal rupture going for a, a, a peri, uh, new, uh, I mean peri, peri uh, I mean uh, pneumopericardium or uh, uh, blood in the pericardium then we can always understand that these patients are not going to come back or uh, that this, this is a P4 prognosis. But as I showed that if the patient has a condition like tachycardiomyopathy, then I think they do pretty well uh, if, if treated properly because this is a reversible condition and should be identified. The key is that uh, elevated anti-pro BNP more than elevation of troponin. So if you are seeing uh, severe LV dysfunction of any form and you are suspecting, you are getting a drop in a you have to be very uh, vigilant and saying that if this patient has an arrest and if we revive him or her adequately properly, then they can have a pretty good uh, reversal. I, I just need to uh, ask uh, the, a lot of the uh, uh, EP guys, I can see Dr. Vora and Ashish and Dr. Yesh also here. So, what is the role of uh, uh, doing an EP study and or an ICD in Takasuru cardiomyopathy? I mean, what is the updated guidelines? I, I have no idea about this. Anybody? I can see Dr. Vora uh, there. Updated guidelines on cardiomyopathy? Even? I mean, for in Takasuru cardiomyopathy, I mean, what do you, what do you feel? that it's a reversible condition so for it to have a long-term LV dysfunction uh, is not uh, very common and therefore uh, we rarely ever consider doing an EP study or uh, an implant in these patients but yes there are sometimes uh, cardiomyopathy patients who are stable and then they have these acute emotional stress which leads to uh, additional apical ballooning and they may have a residual EF which is continuing to remain poor and in those patients one might consider. Correct. Yeah. I have one question. I mean, after CPR, say a prolonged CPR, patient comes back, he is found to have LV dysfunction. Many, you don't know what the previous LV function was. Many, quite often this is attributed to shocks, prolonged CPR, acidosis, uh, which occurred at that time. I mean, how often do you see this and how important it is and, and what's your take on that? Yeah, I think uh, post CPR, uh, uh, if the patient is alive and is coming back, mandatory is to correct all the lactates and all all those reversible things. Get an angiogram and do a serial uh, uh, follow-up echo, uh, and to have a guideline-directed medical management. Because I think if we identify the cause, then we can always have a prognostication as as to what is happening. But you are right. If if the problem is let's say because of sepsis. And if you revive and, and you control all of them, uh, they do pretty well. Unfortunately, I have never seen a normal LVEF post CPR in a let's say in a patient who is in ischemic heart or something. There is always a, some kind of residual damage. But if you are if you are young, if the angiograms are normal, if you are uh, if you have Takasubu kind of component, then we should always follow them up for maximum maybe six months and try to have because they do pretty well over a period of time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your succinct uh, answers to those questions. We'll go go with the next talk. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. There is a small announcement uh, before we go to the next talk. So those who had accommodation with us, uh, the delegates are requested to check out as check out time is uh, 12 p.m. Thank you. So now we go to the next talk uh, by Dr. Priya Chodkar. Uh, it's on cardiac MRI the parametric mapping to risk stratify the uh, HCM and ARVC. We'll uh, start our video first and then we can uh, get her, uh, her comments afterwards.
can start the recording. Uh, yeah, we are starting. Just a minute. normal range by scanning 25 to 30 healthy male and female volunteers and after obtaining these gender specific values anything above plus or minus 2 standard deviation should be considered as abnormal you can either use our global values while assessing for the cardiomyopathy and regional values when especially myocarditis or miloca is suspected Native T1 mapping, multiple short axis slices obtained before contrast uh, administration. After giving gadolinium, wait for 10 minutes and obtain another set that will be a post contrast T1 mapping. Using these two sets along with serum hematocrit on the same day and having an ROI blood pool and using the right software can give an assessment for ECV. T2 mapping assessment is also always free contrast. Again, it is important to obtain your center specific values by scanning healthy volunteers and anything plus or minus 2 standard deviation will be considered abnormal. Again, global but regional values will be more important while assessing for the myocarditis. T2 star mapping is used mainly for the iron overload, mainly useful for thalassemia patients. T1 and T2 mapping give an assessment of fibrosis and edema. So they actually serve as a non-invasive way to myocardial biopsy. Pixel-wise, color-coded map, which can be quantified. So it is it is like a Hounsfield unit you will use in CT scan. Actually, first slide was missed by us. So it can... Sorry for the inconvenience. Hello. Thank you, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. My topic for today is the role of parametric mapping to re-stratify HCM and ARVC. So this beautiful cardiac MR images have got paradigm shift in management of different cardiomyopathies. The role is just not limited to diagnosis uh, but also for prognostication, planning of treatment and follow-up. And all this is possible because of technological advances. Cine images of cardiac MR give morphologic and functional assessment. Tissue characterization is possible with clear cadmium enhancement. Adenosine stress perfusion MR give an assessment for ischemia. And finally, parametric mapping. That is the new kid on the block. That is our version 4.0. But unlike an iPhone series, it does not replace the previous version. Rather, it is complementary to them. So, parametric mapping always has to be used in conjunction with CNA, LG and perfusion set of images. So, today in this presentation, I will cover a few basic concepts and show a few cases in which parametric mapping definitely added value. So, please note that T1 mapping is used for fibrosis. There are no normal fixed values for T1 mapping. Every center should obtain their own normal range by scanning 25 to 30 healthy male and female volunteers and after obtaining these center specific values anything above plus or minus 2 standard deviation should be considered as abnormal. You can either use global values while assessing for the cardiomyopathy 
and regional values when especially myocarditis or meloca is suspected. Latent T1 mapping, multiple short axis slices obtained before contrast uh, administration. After giving gadolinium, wait for 10 minutes and obtain another set that will be your post contrast T1 mapping. Using these two sets along with serum hematocrit on the same day and having an ROI blood pool and using the right software can give an assessment for ECV. T2 mapping assessment is also always free contrast. Again, it is important to obtain your center specific values by scanning healthy volunteers and anything plus or minus 2 standard deviation will be considered abnormal. Again, global but regional values will be more important while assessing for the myocarditis. T2 star mapping is used mainly for the iron overload, mainly useful for thalassemia patients. T1 and T2 mapping give an assessment of fibrosis and edema. So they actually serve as a non-invasive way to myocardial biopsy. Pixel-wise color-coded map which can be quantified. So it is where, it is like a Hounsford unit you will use in CT scan. So it can help uh, to track the disease progression and also to uh, monitor the response to therapy. But however, there are lot of challenges and limitations mainly related to standardization. Availability is still limited. There are lot of quality control factors which need to be uh, taken care of and also there is uh, multi-center and multi-vendor uh, validation is still needed. T2 mapping has revolutionized the way we look at myocarditis. So this updated Lake Lewis criteria, main criteria is based on T1 and T2 mapping. T2 star mapping is actually decision making for myocardial iron overload and it has saved lives in thalassemia patients by significant reduction of cardiac mortality and morbidity. Few other important points that not all myocardial stars are same. So this is a transmural scar, ischemic transmural scar in the left ventricle. And this is patchy mid-myocardial scar and again in the left ventricle. But this scar is more prone for arrhythmia because whenever there is a healthy tissue in between the scar tissue, there are more chances of re-entering tachycardia. Also, depending on the primary pathology, the risk for arrhythmia will be different. So this is a smooth epicardial late gardenium enhancement in genetic dilated cardiomyopathy while this is patchy mid myocardial late gardenium enhancement. So depending on the primary pathology, the risk for the arrhythmia and the clinical outcome will be different. Now coming to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So as we all know, this is autosomal dominant characterized by LV wall hypertrophy more than 15 millimeter. So this is a short axis image which shows significant hypertrophy. Cardiac MR can also help to assess for the LVOT obstruction. As seen in this case, there is presence of sand and dephasing jet in the LVOT, suggestive of LVOT obstruction. Sudden cardiac death risk stratification on cardiac MR is based on multiple factors especially with the LV wall thickness more than 3 cm, LV apical aneurysm as you see in this case uh, dyskinetic thinned out LV apex which is suggestive of apical aneurysm. Cardiac MR can also add value by uh, checking LA diameter and uh, noting the level of obstruction. Apart from that late gallium enhancement gives a fibrosis estimation. So all HCMs classically have this patchy mid myocardial late gallium enhancement and putting an ROI in the normal myocardium and quantifying the fibrosis can give us give us a percentage, how much percentage of LV myocardium is involved. And there are various studies which have postulated that anything above 15% there is twofold increase in sudden cardiac death. But it is important that this much LGE is very common occurrence and treatment decision should not be based only on the LGE. Because what you see actually is just tip of the iceberg. See in this case, this is replacement fibrosis and parametric mapping, T1 mapping assessment for interstitial fibrosis. So this can be an important tool for con 
identification of diffuse fibrosis and can help for prognostication in few cases. More interstitial fibrosis, there is more susceptibility to ventricular arrhythmia and hence sudden cardiac death. Importantly to understand that there are various uh, pathologic uh, presentations of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. All HCM are not same. There are few presentations which present more with LVOT obstruction and less late radial enhancement. In these cases, definitely mapping would have value. So here, there is no late delirium enhancement. But as you see over here, because of uh, significant sand, there is uh, presence of LVOT obstruction. ECB can also be additional value. See in these two patients, similar looking myocardium, but difference in uh, ECB and you get significant amount of fibrosis is seen. ECV has a stronger predictive effectiveness compared to late volume enhancement. So, this can also be considered as strong imaging marker for predicting adverse clinical outcome. Please note, currently there are no definite T1 mapping or ECV values that above which it is considered abnormal. But whenever in this HCM patients, suspected HCM patients, you do not see any late volume enhancement and you see some focal areas of T1 and ECV values which are increased, you should consider the possibility of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Another important area to differentiate borderline hypertrophy from athletic remodeling. In athlete's heart, there is basically myocyte hypertrophy. So there is no fibrosis. So here the ECV values will reduce contrary to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, ECV elevation would occur earlier than development of LGE and hence uh, it can also help to differentiate various uh, cardiomyopathies. Let us look at a case. So, this was a 60 year old male hypertensive who presented with ventricular tachycardia in emergency room. Uh, he was cardioverted, cath NGO was normal and hence further workup was done. So, these are uh, Echocardiography images, borderline LV1 hypertrophy, and because of clinical presentation and echo abnormality of hypertrophy, CMR was performed. So these are uh, cine short axis images which show LV1 hypertrophy, definitely more than 15 millimeter. These are long axis cine images. Using the same cine images and feature tracking method, we can also obtain global longitudinal strain. There was no significant enhancement or late gardenum enhancement. But T1 mapping showed some regional patchy areas of increased value. So this is a pre-contrast and here is the post-contrast T1 mapping which shows presence of fibrosis. So though in spite of less fibrosis, less than 15%, uh, clinical presentation like VT, genetic testing showed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it just proves that HCM is a disease with versatile clinical and different radiological presentation. And combining all clinical imaging data is more important. It is not just numbers of LGE or numbers of T1 and T2 mapping values. But parametric mapping can add value in with other, along with other imaging parameters to help to differentiate it uh, and risk stratify this HCM patients. Now moving on to arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. It is also genetically determined uh, cardiomyopathy uh, when characterized by fibrofatty replacement of myocardium. So as we see, it affects both right ventricle and left ventricle and multiple genes are uh, responsible for it. Diagnostic uh, Diagnosis is based on modified task force criteria. Along with uh, MR and ECHO, it also takes into consideration ECG, Walter, family history and all the other assessment. CMR diagnosis is mainly based on the regional RV or kinesia or dystinesia along with RV uh, enlargement that is uh, end diastolic volume and ejection fraction assessment. Using this major and minor criteria, we can obtain definite borderline or possible diagnosis of ARVC. But now concepts are changing and it is known that uh, it is not just right ventricle which is involved. It is not uncommon to have uh, biventricular or LV, predominant LV involvement. 
and that is why we should look for this morphofunctional abnormality and LV criteria. Depending on using this criteria and getting whether it is major or minor criteria, you can actually uh, diagnose uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. It has few challenges because development of signs and symptoms occur over time. It has variable penetrance and unfortunately sudden cardiac death can be first presenting symptoms. No single test is gold standard and you it is very uh, and there is no objective criteria. You require a very uh, qualitative component of the study. So because of that uh, there are often misdiagnosis or misdiagnosis. So this was a patient uh, who presented the middle-aged mother. Son had collapsed while playing in badminton and he was in ICU. Uh, because of his sudden presentation and uh, echo abnormality, uh, son underwent genetic testing and it was detected to be PKP2 positive. Study was, uh, workup was done for the mother and other family relatives. Mother and sister also genetic studies came positive. So mother when she came for cardiac MR, there was no significant RV enlargement. But there were just focal segmental dyskinesia. So this could be that she is harboring the gene, but it is not clinically dominant now. So hence, this was the patient in which uh, variable penetrance. So basically, the symptoms and signs over time can happen in ARVC. So it is important that you are aware of all the diagnostic criteria and identify major and minor variables for perfect diagnosis of ARVC. Because it is not uncommon that uh, whenever the patient comes for second opinion, as seen in this study, uh, most of the patients who were seen with fat in the myocardium, none of them actually had ARVC. It is important to be aware about normal variant and pitfalls uh, so that you do not uh, over diagnose ARVC. There are a lot of emerging new concepts, especially with the left ventricular involvement. And because LV involvement has more arrhythmic risk, uh, they have more chances of VT and sudden cardiac death. So this is the study which has shown that compared to RV, when there is biventricular or LV involvement, there are uh, LV involvement, LV dominant disease is more arrhythmogenic. So this is another patient who presented, young patient who presented with uh, repeated chest pain. Uh, elevated troponins and hence catheter angiography workup was done which was normal. Cardiac MR showed ring-like epicardial late tendon enhancement. Clinical presentations with myocarditis, normal LV function and this kind of multiple episodes of myocardial injury. Final genetic testing showed best no plaque in cardiomyopathy. So it is important that these patients actually fit into this hot phase of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So it is more common in young and pediatric population. It can be exercise induced as we have seen in that badminton player. Multiple gene mutations can cause this and these are the patients who clinically present with myocarditis but lead to this electrical instability and cause arrhythmia. So it is important and K2 mapping values will definitely add value as in this case uh, epicardial LG along with elevated T2 mapping so you know that this is uh, uh, something like myocarditis or a hot phase of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy either it can be right dominant or a left dominant disease. Right dominant will be with task force criteria easily diagnosed when RV will be abnormal, it will be enlarged, it will show some segmented dyskinesia. LV involvement can also occur with presence of fat and some apicolateral fat bite. These are more common with PKP2 mutations and uh, here right-sided disease drives clinical outcome. Left dominant has more arrhythmic risk, more commonly associated with plaque in cardiomyopathy and it has classical subepicardial late cardiomyopathy enhancement. These patients may be missed on task force criteria because RV will be normal, LV function also will be normal, clinical presentation will be like myocarditis. So it is important to be aware of this.
Magst du es helfen, dass Important to be aware of this uh, uh, various presentations. Uh, moving on to the case, uh, this was a 58-year-old male uh, hypertensive, non-diabetic, cardiac uh, catheter angiography workup was normal. So these are uh, short axis scene images, and which shows that there is uh, RV segmented dystinesia, crenated appearance of the free wall of right ventricle. These are long axis scene images. Again, it confirms uh, RV dystinetic dystinesia. And also note there is some altered signal within the interventricular septum and the lateral wall. So this signal abnormality seen in four chamber in the septum and the lateral wall is like a picolateral fat bite. So. And these are the RV views, dedicated RV views, RV ejection fraction was also reduced and there are micro aneurysms and the crenated appearance of uh, right ventricular free wall. No specific late cardiac enhancement, parametric mapping confirmed the presence of fat in the interventricular septum. So this was a case of arrhythmogenic biventricular cardiomyopathy. RV segmented dyskinesia with uh, reduced function and LV involvement in form of fat in the interventricular septum and the lateral valve. So this is how uh, T1 mapping can give uh, assessment, non-invasive assessment for myocardial fibrosis and the edema. So as we see that how it has progressed, it has certain limitations because of low availability and lack of standardization. But it, as you see this, that as compared to intervention radiologists with multiple catheters and surgical tool, every tool, cardiac MRO has also different tools, but it has to be used judiciously, right uh, technique at right time uh, will definitely add value. Parametric mapping is here to stay. Definitely there are certain challenges. But technical advances and standardization will help to solve these changes. And beyond CNA and LG images, it can definitely add value in advanced tissue characterization. Assessment of extracellular metrics with ECB can serve as a prognostic marker, especially in amyloid cardiomyopathy. Uh, prognostication and follow-up with uh, ECB is definitely considered as uh, one of the uh, very important uh, uh, clinically relevant uh, marker. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you for a very, very, uh, it was an excellent lecture, very practical. Um, you gave very important messages. <clears throat> I'm Dr. Bhagwat. Uh, it looks like uh, in cardiac MR is cardiac structure, cardiac function, cardiac histopathology, and myocardial perfusion, all packed into one. This looks, our regular echo look pretty crude, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it looks like every patient of sudden death, regardless of his presentation, probably deserves a cardiac MR. Uh, am, I, am I right in saying this? Uh, that is my first question. Uh, and second question is, um, how, how often I mean, if you look at, say, 100 patients of a sudden death, how often you find some kind of abnormality which is of significance on cardiac MR? Yes. Sir, so in our institute, uh, we have been doing cardiac MR for all the patients with arrhythmia and who have just survived an attack of uh, ventricular tachycardia. And we have found some big surprises. Uh, it could be myocardial tuberculosis, it could be myocarditis, like 
so many different presentations so i would definitely make uh, issue that any question this session definitely should be given a uh, uh, should be worth the tally kana and uh, i think percentage wise probably 80 to 85% definitely we have found some abnormality and uh, still the technology is evolving like with parametric mapping there are a lot of challenges uh, software implementations a uh, lot of training among the images it is required whether they use the right tool at right time and whether the study is perfect but uh, if done correctly it can definitely give uh, uh, very good clinical inputs is uh, really substandard and uh, confusing and does not help in uh, making a useful clinical uh, you know therapeutic so be aware where you get your cardiac mr done from and it would be good for the clinician to be in touch with the radiologist discuss in details about the uh, you know what information you want and what information they can give before you can uh, help the patient I totally agree with that, sir. Clinical uh, correlation is essential, and uh, it has to be done in a dedicated cardiac imaging center because there is lot of uh, learning which goes to learn about uh, different cardiology conditions. Yes, I completely agree, sir. Yes, sir. So now we uh, will move to the next talk by Dr. Vikram Lele. Uh, from uh, just low hospital about the cardiac pet imaging the diagnostic and prognostic role in sarcoid myocarditis and amyloidosis or to dr Lili. we actually will be playing his video first and then we'll uh, take some questions Good afternoon. I will be talking today about the role of cardiac PET in the diagnosis and prognosis of sarcoidosis, myocarditis, and amyloidosis. As we all know, amyloidosis, uh, sarcoidosis, is a granulomatous, non-caseating granulomatous systemic inflammatory condition, often accompanied by fibrosis. which involves almost every organ of the body and the heart is involved in almost 70% of the time by this disease and the involvement of the heart is the major factor which causes mortality of uh, this uh, condition almost every organ is involved by this uh, uh, systemic disease and the cardiac involvement can vary from having absolutely no symptoms to conduction abnormalities cardiac failure arrhythmias and uh, valvular disorders sudden cardiac death and also involvement of the pericardium in the form of pericarditis the diagnosis of the cardiac involvement can be challenging because the symptoms are fairly non specific therefore we now have two criteria two systems of uh, uh, which clinical diagnosis of uh, sarcoidosis one is the japanese ministry of health and welfare system which was updated in 2017 and the heart rhythm society uh, criteria which are illustrated in this uh, slide which basically take the histological diagnosis as the gold standard from the myocardial tissue but the histology is a very very insensitive method with a sensitivity of only 25% because sarcoidosis of the heart can be a very patchy 
disease and to hit the exact point of inflammation can be a very challenging thing. That's why the sensitivity of a histological diagnosis from the heart, the biopsy of the heart is quite low. Therefore, they had to modify these criteria to say that there could be a histological diagnosis from a other site, non-cardiac site, uh, which shows the presence of sarcoid and there can be one of the following uh, criteria like a unexplained reduced LVEF, unexplained ventricular tachycardia, cardiomyopathy or AV block responsive to immunosuppressive treatment, second or third degree heart block. And very importantly now, emerging criteria are considered important in the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid, such as patchy fluorodeoxyglucose uptake on cardiac PET, which is consistent with cardiac sarcoidosis and the late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MR consistent with cardiac sarcoidosis. So now imaging has become an integral part of the diagnostic criteria and we will discuss now what the nuclear imaging uh, has to offer in this uh, situation. The tracers which we have used in uh, nuclear medicine, we began with gallium citrate which was in the beginning, the main tracer available to us for imaging cardiac sarcoidosis, gallium citrate is not a PET tracer. It is a SPECT tracer. It goes to, uh, it is attached to, when you inject it into the blood, it gets attached to transferrin and it goes to all the inflammation and infection sites. Macrophages pick up. There are receptors on the macrophages for gallium 67. And this was the mainstay in the diagnosis of any active infection, inflammation or neoplasm in the past. Gallium 67 is no longer available. Uh, it is available with great difficulty, so we don't use it anymore. The main advantage of gallium 67 that was that it does not go to the normal myocardium. So any uptake in the myocardium would be abnormal. So recently we now have fluorodeoxyglucose or 18-FDG, which all of you know. Now, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose is a glucose analog. Glucose, as you know, is sugar. We make this sugar radioactive and inject into the body. And on the right side, you can see it's a normal FDG whole body PET scan. You can see the dark areas is where the glucose has gone maximum. Now, glucose is a fuel for everything. The brain utilizes glucose intensely, so the brain is looking hot. The heart is a very voracious organ. It takes, it utilizes anything which is available for its uh, metabolism. If glucose is available, it laps up glucose. If ketone bodies are available, it picks them up. If amino acids are available and mainly free fatty acids. So these are all the substrates which a normal myocardium uses for its energy consumption. So in a normal person, you get intense uptake of FTG in the heart. So how are you going to diagnose any inflammation of the heart when the normal uptake is already so much? So that is one major problem of diagnosing inflammation of the heart using FDG. You have other tracers like gallium 68. Gallium 67 was not a PET tracer, but gallium 68 is a PET tracer. And that we can combine with an agent called dotatate and see the, which uh, basically labels somatostatin receptors. Now, somatostatin receptors are expressed on lymphocytes. They are expressed on macrophages. So wherever there is infection or inflammation, lymphocytes and macrophages accumulate and they start, they express this SS somatostatin receptor type 2 and we can image these receptors. So wherever there is a aggregation of macrophages, whether they are in a form of a granuloma, we can image it with the help of gallium 68 dotatate. Again, the advantage of gallium 68 dotatate is that it does not go to normal myocardium. So that's why it goes, uh, if it's seen in the myocardium, it is abnormal. So we will, that's why the major problem, you can see here, uh, the one of the first earlier studies which we were doing was with gallium 67. You can see that there is no uptake in the myocardium at all. And here is on the right hand side is a case of a myocarditis, acute myocarditis. You can see the intense uptake of gallium in the heart. There is no doubt that this person has myocarditis. There is no other differential. So it was life was fairly easy 
but gallium, as I said, is no longer available. So now we have to do with FDG, and we have to somehow find a method for suppressing the normal physiological uptake of FDG in the normal myocardium. As I told you, the normal myocardium grabs uh, glucose, so we have to starve the normal myocardium of glucose, which means we have to keep the patient fasting, prolong fasting, don't allow any carbohydrates to enter his body and the heart will be forced to use alternative substrates for energy. So prolonged fasting for up to 18 hours, it can be quite challenging, it can cause hypoglycemia and the patients who are having sarcoid are not really very healthy patients. So, but that is one of the ways but in spite of prolonged 18 hours fasting, about 38% of patients will still have the physiological uptake because the heart still will grab whatever in the radioactive glucose you are going to inject uh, the next day. So in order to have a further reduction in the glucose uptake apart from starving the heart, we do a dietary manipulation. What we give is a very high fat, 35 grams and zero carbohydrates the previous night. The, uh, the, the need for giving high fat is that the free fatty acids are the alternative substrate for the heart. So a high fat diet will give the heart a lot of free fatty acids which it will pick up. It will not pick up the glucose, so we'll have no uptake of glucose in the myocardium. In spite of combining prolonged fast and dietary manipulation, still 20% of people will have some physiological uptake especially in the inferolateral portion of the left ventricle. So we now add intravenous heparin, 50 international international unit per kilogram of unfractionated heparin is given IV 15 minutes before the FDG injection. Now this heparin causes lipolysis and it increases the free fatty acids in the blood. And so the heart is flooded with fatty acids, so it will pick up the fatty acids and it will not uh, pick up the glucose which is circulating in the body. So then this will, all these three measures when combined together uh, result in a almost 91% of the patients will have an excellent uh, separation of the uh, uptake in the myocardium. So, uh, but it's a very meticulous process. We have to be sure that uh, the patient is really following the diet and you have such a result. You can see here excellent suppression of the uptake in the myocardium. All you are seeing in this uh, left hand side is just a blood pool. There is nothing has gone into the myocardium. So it's an excellent suppression. So here whatever abnormal uptake in the myocardium is all inflammation. Here is a moderately successful suppression. You can see there are some areas in the myocardium which are still showing uptakes. You can see that this is an inferolateral wall of the heart. Normally, this is physiological uptake. But you are also seeing some uptake in the septum here. So this is where the problem comes. Is it physiological because of poor preparation? And the third case is an absolute poor suppression. The heart is gobbling up the FDG. The whole, there is a diffuse uptake of FDG all over the heart. This means that this is a poor preparation. Patient has not adhered to the dietary manipulation. So this study has to be repeated with a good dietary control. So you can understand that it's not very easy uh, to do this study. We have to be very careful about the quality before we start diagnosing. Once you've got a fairly good uh, quality uh, uh, suppression, then we what we do is we do two studies. We do a resting perfusion scan with, you know, technetium tetrophosphine or technetium mibi, which we use for our uh, uh, ischemic heart disease. So we do a resting perfusion scan and then we inject the, uh, acquire the image and then we inject the FDG. So the diagnosis of sarcoidosis is done by a combination of a perfusion scan with technetium system mibi and a PET scan with FDG. And we get several patterns. If you have a normal perfusion, and you have no uptake at all of FDG in the myocardium because of a very good preparation. This is a normal study. There is no inflammation going on in the myocardium and there is no cardiac sarcoidosis. You may get a normal perfusion and you may get a diffuse uptake all over the myocardium. This is a usually a non-specific uptake. 
sarcoidosis of the heart is a patchy uh, pathology it does not involve the heart so diffusely so if you get such a diffuse uptake you suspect that this is likely to be a physiological thing and not pathological so when both these patterns are concerned as normal perfusion and metabolism then you start getting abnormality you have a normal perfusion but the metabolism you can see there is a small area in the anterior wall which is showing focal increase of dg uptake now this indicates that there is a early inflammation going on in this part of the heart this is an abnormal study indicates early affection of by cardiac sarcoid but you also start getting an abnormal perfusion you have a perfusion defect there and in the same area you are getting a focal increase of take of fdg so this is a mismatch pattern this is definitely there is an inflammation going on mind you you have to be careful that there is no ischemic heart disease in this patient that is coronaries are fine and there is no recent infarct which has happened so when you get when you have excluded is in fact there then this combination of a reduced perfusion and increased metabolism is indicated that there is an active inflammation going on then you get the third pattern where you get an abnormal perfusion and you get an abnormal metabolism also you can see here the perfusion is abnormal in the septum and in inferior wall but the metabolism is abnormal in the anterior wall so you are getting different areas of abnormal metabolism and perfusion that means some of these areas have now become fibrosed because of the sarcoidosis and scar has appeared and there are some areas which are still actively inflamed and inflammation is going on and when you have a abnormal myocardial perfusion and a completely negative no uptake is there on the fdg study this means it's all scar tissue it's a burnt out sarcoid disease so you can see how these various patterns are going to be there here i'm showing you a case of a extensive sarcoidosis you can see almost every organ is involved you are finding the lungs you are finding the joints you are finding lymph nodes everywhere the heart is involved is lymph nodes in the abdomen the kidneys the liver so this is a very diffuse systemic sarcoid so with a pet scan you also come to know the extra cardiac affection of the uh, sarcoid you can take a biopsy from one of these areas and you can see the pool sensitivity and specificity of fdg is 84% and 83% fairly high sensitivity and specificity once you are sure that you have got a good uh, preparation so we can also quantify the amount of uptake uh, in the myocardium with the, uh, what is called as standardized uptake value suv and you can then get a sort of a uh, fair idea about the intensity of the inflammation and the extent of the inflammation and you can use it for follow up so what is the prognostic literature we have now blankenstein evaluated 118 patients with known or suspected cardiac sarcoid and over a 1.5 years follow up patients with abnormal cardiac perfusion and metabolism had a four fold increase in annual rate of ventricular tachycardia death compared to those with normal scan so an individual with focal right ventricular uptake had an extremely high event rate and a uh, left ventricular ejection fraction by itself is a strong independent predictor of mortality 10 year survival is more than 80% for those with lvf more than 50 to, and compared to 19% for those with lvf less than 30 and other uh, studies are there had musal et al studied 20 patients with cardiac sarcoid and ventricular tachycardia who underwent cardiac uh, catheter ablation and serial fdg pet and lack of reduction in myocardial inflammation by suv on serial imaging was associated with almost 20 fold increase in the risk of major adverse cardiac events including death cardiac transplantation heart failure hospitalization so uh, uptake of fdg not going down on your therapy is a bad prognostic sign and you can see here long term follow up studies normal perfusion and fdg has excellent prognosis in cardiac uh, uh, sarcoid and abnormal perfusion or abnormal fdg and both fdg and abnormal perfusion has the worst uh, prognosis where the event rate is uh, fairly high 
and we can also use to assess treatment response. You can see Osborne followed 27 patients with serial FDG PET. A quantitative reduction in the intensity and amount of inflammation was associated with improvement in the left ventricular ejection fraction. And PET-guided therapy may help to choose anti-inflammatory agents and doses which are effective and working. And nowadays, apart from steroids, azathioprine, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, infliximab, and rituximab, are being used. So we can use PET to see whether these various combinations are working or not. Two recent trials are coming up. Just Chasm trial using prednisolone versus prednisone alone uh, plus methotrexate and the MAGIC R trial using uh, interleukin-1 antagonist. And they are, both these trials are using FDG PET as a follow-up to see whether the patient is responding or not. And you can see the examples of response to therapy. You have a baseline, a lot of uptake in the heart, and after treatment, the uptake does not go down at all. It is still there, as opposed to another person who's got extensive uptake, in not only in the heart, but extensive uptake in multiple lymph nodes. And after treatment, all these lesions are gone. So this is an excellent response. So you can see who is responding, who is not responding, and you can change your treatment so that patient's response will be there with an alternative treatment and a, a different dose. So as I said, because the FDG normally goes to the heart and we have to have a lot of preparation, efforts are on to look at tracers which don't go normally to the heart. So their uptake will be very easy to diagnose uh, sarcoid uh, doses. And there are many such tracers, as I told you already about gallium dota tape, there are radio label thymidine analogs like FLT, F choline, F meso, and gallium pentexaphor. All these are available now, and a lot of studies are being done using them to try to uh, see whether you can pick up the inflammation. Here I'm showing you a paste case uh, comparison with uh, CMR, cardiac magnetic resonance. You can see here focal, multifocal, and diffuse involvement of the myocardium and here you are using uh, uh, gallium dotatate which uh, measures the somatostatin receptor. You can see there is focal and diffuse uptake of somatostatin receptors in this patient with focal and diffuse involvement of heart with the myocardial sarcoidosis. So normally it does not go. So this tracer is very exciting. The studies are uh, coming more and more. So with this tracer, there is no need at all for any dietary intervention because normally it doesn't go to the heart. And we are uh, quite going to, this tracer is going to be useful much in the future. FLT is another tracer which doesn't go to the heart. You can see here, you are getting intense uptake in the myocardium and you can diagnose. So this, in a nutshell, is how we diagnose sarcoidosis with myocardial tracers. Another uh, myocarditis is also another inflammation. Acute myocarditis, the same problem. You can suppress the uptake in the myocardium with a diet. And the final thing is amyloidosis. Now, we do not have a PET tracer for amyloidosis uh, currently available. There is a tracer called Flor Beta Peer, which can give you amyloidosis of the heart images, whether it is AL or ATTR. But right now, we have a SPECT tracer for cardiac ATTR amyloidosis, which is called pyrophosphate. And technician pyrophosphate is routinely used and very much available all over the country, where you can use for diagnosing cardiac amyloid. We just inject it into the blood and take an image at one hour, and we compare the uptake with the ribs. If the uptake is equal to or more than the ribs, of the tracer, it is a diagnostic for ATTR cardiac amyloid. If there is no uptake at all in the heart, the uptake is less than the rate, then it is not cardiac ATTR amyloid. This tracer is cheap, it costs around seven and a half thousand, and it gives you a very specific diagnosis of ATTR cardiac amyloid. It does not, the uptake is not there in AL cardiac amyloid. So, what you have to do is first you have to do the blood test and immunofixation of urine and blood to rule out AL cardiac amyloid in a patient who is suspected to have cardiac amyloid and then do a type technician pyrophosphate scan. If it is negative, you have excluded ATTR cardiac amyloid. If it is positive in the grade 2 and 3, then you have confirmed the diagnosis of cardiac amyloid. So this is available everywhere and uh, I thank you for your kind attention.
Thank you, Dr. Lele. Uh, any questions, any comments in the audience? In the interest of time, I'm just a short and I have only one question for him. Looks like the, the toughest competitor for your imaging modality is cardiac MR. Uh, so, in terms of uh, understanding myocardial structure and function, uh, do you think it's complementary or do you think one imaging modality is superior to other in certain areas? Would you like to uh, comment on that? Well, nowadays we are going to have cardiac uh, uh, MR PET, which is coming up. We already have three machines installed in the country. And this combination of MR uh, PET is going to be the best diagnostic modality because it will combine all the strong features of MR and the ability of the PET to detect active inflammation. So, till that comes, it is the matter of availability. Now, PET is available everywhere, so is cardiac MR. So, it all depends on the availability of the local expertise uh, and the interpretation of the various studies. PET has an advantage that it is a very physiological thing. It will give you the active inflammation. And MR is likely to remain positive for a while, even when the uh, inflammation has subsided, where the PET will disappear. The activity of FDG will disappear when the inflammation subsides. So for tracking the myocarditis and uh, active uh, sarcoid uh, inflammation, PET will have a physiological advantage. But uh, both modalities are fairly strong in their ability to diagnose uh, uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. And as I said, with the advent of dotatate, we are quite uh, excited because that makes us uh, the, the great problem of preparing the patient very significantly, okay, um, making the patient fast for uh, 12 to 18 hours and give him the various dietary manipulations. That will be avoided with the uh, uh, with the gallium rotate tracers. Thank you very much uh, for your talk and your comments. Any other? Question, comment. Okay, th thank you, Dr. Lele. Uh, yes, there is one question. By our, our nuclear uh, physician, Dr. Prathamesh. Good afternoon, sir. So I am happy to Hi. listen to my teacher's talk here. And uh, rather than question, it is a comment regarding uh, Dr. Ajit sir's question. The strength of nuclear medicine is subjectivity is very less. So for radiological imaging of ECO and MR, we are seeing that the subjectivity varies according to the expertise for that particular disease. In nuclear medicine, when we say there is uptake or no uptake, even when you get the images, our interpretations match better as compared to radiological imaging. That's what I think. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Dr. Lele. Uh, we are actually slightly postponing our lunch and uh, we'll get uh, in touch with Dr. Hegriv Rao. Uh, Dr. Rao is Director, Division of Pacing and Epidemiology uh, at Kim's Group of Hospitals, Hyderabad. He is Founder Editor, IJCC. Uh, he has uh, over uh, 2,000 radio frequency ablations, so vast experience in the field of electrophysiology. So we now uh, go to his talk where he will guide us about how to determine the SCD risk in an young patient with syncope and normal ECG. So over to you, Dr. Hegriv Rao, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. Uh, the, I think the host has to enable me to part, uh, share my screen, please. I'm trying to share my screen. Could you help me? Yeah. Yeah, coming up. Okay. Are you able to see my slides? We can see now. You see? Yeah, you can see my slides. Thank you very much. Uh, very warm set. I am uh, elated and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajit Bhagwat and Ashish Nabar for uh, uh, inviting me to this meeting. I would have really love to be physically there and uh, see you, but unfortunately I could not. So thanks once again for letting me present like this. Uh, a very uh, uh, interesting and important topic, uh, which is a really hot topic, I should say, because uh, in the young uh, people dying in India is a big problem uh, right now. 
So I try to see what are the different things that are responsible for the deaths in the young people in this country. Um, thing is, uh, when we see a patient with syncope, the most important thing we should realize is that, uh, as one of the cardiology textbooks says, death and syncope are similar. If you wake up, it is syncope. If you don't wake up, it is death. This is nothing more true than uh, the things that we are going to talk about today. Now, I um, the expectation uh, of a topic like this is to talk a lot about the inherited syndromes of sudden death and all these things, but let me talk about a much more common thing. So, in the young, I assume that anybody uh, around 40 or 45 is young in this country. It is not just the children. So, one of the important uh, reasons why people die suddenly and uh, for unknown reasons is a silent myocardial infarction or a scar. Now, there are patients who have an MI and then they never realize it. And that's particularly because the MI is small, the scar is small. So, echocardiogram may actually show a reasonably normal LV function. Unless one is a very good echocardiographer, may not be able to pick up anything different. So, it's a practically normal echocardiogram, a small scar. And the patient doesn't have any great symptoms and he is doing his work normally, not no breathlessness, nothing at all. Then, one fine morning, he has a ventricular tachycardia like this because of a re-entry circuit around a scar and uh, a patient can die. And 60% of the MIs, I was shocked to see data, 60% uh, of the MI is silent, associated with other risk of SCD. And particularly what happens is they have SCD on physical exertion. So a 45-year-old guy running on a treadmill or doing gym suddenly dies. One of the possible things is, a, now how do you pick up these people? That is the issue. Now we know that, now one of the things is to have a normal, a regular ECGs. Now, the patient with a small inferior wall MI, you can see the QAs in ECG. Now what happens is, Many people actually never get their ECGs done. In my practice, uh, patients, uh, when we ask them, they never got the ECGs done. And those who get their ECGs done are not clearly reported by experts. So small cures are sometimes missed, thinking that they are physiological, especially because patient doesn't have any symptoms and the echo is normal. So these cures, you know, when you have a patient with sudden cardiac arrest or death, if you look at their ECGs, you will find some of the, one of the important markers is the cures. So in other words, forget about the VT. If you have a patient with syncope, and the ECG shows a small QA, please think it is a cardiac arrest and a very dangerous cardiac arrest. Now, apart from this, there are specific ECG findings which are very dangerous in real life. Which again, which are not seriously taken up because we are looking for ST depressions and other things. Now, fragmented QRS. Now, this is all a topic by itself, but I would like to just point out. So, if you see an ECG like this, as all the ECGs have multi-fractionated signals like this, or a small RSR, or a notched QRS, a notched RSR. See, see any of these things. All these indicate uh, patients who have a scar, small scars on this one. This actually was studied in a uh, Finland genetic study where they uh, actually looked up more than 5,000 patients with, who had a sudden cardiac arrest. <coughs> it was an autopsy study, and then they looked back, and they looked back at the ECGs and found these ECGs. So retrospectively, if they had seen these ECGs in real life, they would have suspected this is young people <coughs> are at risk of sudden death. So this is very important finding, which is just simple ECG would tell us rather than complex investigation. So this is important to read ECGs well. Now, now let us look at this one. A good editorial written in a, from a Macbeth looks like an innocent flower, but there is a serpent hidden in between, in the, beneath. This is what he said of a ECG like this. You see ECGs like this. Now, you can see there is a short PR interval and delta wave. Some of them are asymptomatic. Few of them have some palpitations. But the important thing is to know that some of these can lead to sudden death. That is what uh, uh, the uh, interesting uh, quotation says. Now, who are the people who with this ECGs? A pre-excitation, manifest pre-excitation, as it is called, or a WPW, in case they develop an arrhythmia, who are the going people to die? Now look at this patient. The same patient was actually having a syncope. He was brought to the ER, 40-year-old gentleman. He actually had a head injury. And then they looked at his ECG. He had ECG with a wide QRS irregular, broad QRS complexes, which are irregular, AFib, which is passing through an axillary pathway. So when you have a AFib through an axillary pathway, 
this goes very fast normally afib may not go fast now when the afib conducts to ventricles so the one is to one this af becomes a vf and the patient can die suddenly now the incidence of scd in www syndrome is uh, sometimes as low as 0 and 0.6 lifetime risk of arrhythmia is something like uh, 0.1% and this even the dangerous thing is it can be the first manifestation of this that means a patient never got ecg done die suddenly had a cardiac arrest then you look at his ecg in the er you see a manifest pre excitation so this in 53% of the patients who die suddenly it can be a, a first manifestation that is the most dangerous things about this wb so so what are the people now the interesting thing is this is eminently curable this is a patient who had a ablation in the ep lab you can see 1 2 3 4 complexes showing the pre excitation and the radio frequency burn started here and by the fourth complex the pre excitation is gone there is a normal pr interval and a qrs complex and this is a curative that means it is gone for life so that is the important thing about this kind of sudden death where you know you can actually cure or prevent the sudden death totally if you identify these patients correctly and ablate them now patients with uh, scd and pre excitation who are the patients 30 years less than male structural heart disease septal local it means patients who are posterior septal pathways or anterior septal pathways these are the people i'm not going into the details about the risk stratification how it was in 1970s 80s because of the want of time but i'm summarize the important things that you should know if you see a wbw syndrome in a patient young people less than 30 years septal localization and then these patients these days should be subjected to ep studies on the ep table we look at the anti grade refractory periods and loss of pre excitation during the pacing and anti grade refractory periods less than 250 what it means is suppose you have you induce one to one pacing from the atria to ventricles and until a heart rate of 250 or uh, 270 or so it is able to conduct one to one uh, that means that it is a dangerous pathway that means tomorrow it can conduct a af also at the same rate and cause a vf that's what it says so if you have an af which is very fast in these patients these are the patients who are at risk of sudden death so anybody who has an avnr avrt induced or multiple axillary pathways these are the indication for sudden death so previously what they used to do was they used to do a treadmill and those patients who were on treadmill the www disappeared thought were thought to have a low risk subsequently patients who had intermittent pre excitation that means who had pre excitation some ecg some don't they are thought to have less risk but now uh, by and large it is decided that Uh, by all the world authorities that you need to have an ep study to see how fast the axillary pathway can transmit now syncope and scd without cure this is very important now suppose you have a patients who have ventricular fibrillation and a, a, without a long qt and with qt let us see how they are 8 year old child recurrent seizures this often happens children with seizures are taken to the neurologist and this patient was on anti epileptics for a long time Now what you can see clearly is that the ecg was never done because patients who are fits they never get ecg done particularly children they directly are put on anti epileptics and fits and ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest resemble each other now what you see is the patient having a qtc 466 not very long but definitely long for a child so a long qtc it gives an indicator this patient has a risk of seizures and sudden death and the patient was put on elr for one week and during one episode of seizures this is exactly what the child had the ventricular fibrillation showing that this is a patient who has a long qt leading to ventricular fibrillation and sudden cardiac death now this is exactly what happens to patients you see this is another patient who has a very long qt this is a qnt so much so that the p wave and the q wave the the next p wave is uh, actually adjoining the t wave so the long qt syndrome and this patient can have a polymorphic qt and a sudden death So long QT is an important thing that needs to be recognized. Now congenital long QT syndrome. Generally, you should look for a QT which is more than 500 in risk of sudden death. Although the example I showed was 460, it is long, no doubt. But if you have more than 500, high risk of sudden death. If there is a recent syncope in a children, adults, and young adult, increase the likelihood of sudden death by 10 to 20 fold. So if you have a long QT, asymptomatic, that's fine. But if the child has a syncope, like the topic of today is. the risk of death increased to 10 to 24 even a remote syncope that means you have long qt ask the history patient had a syncope remotely risk of death during childhood boys especially lqt1 are at risk and a second decade women with lqt2 are at risk so the gender difference is there based on the age now let us talk about another thing now one of the 
important things in exercise induced syncope or exercise induced sudden death is a catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia related to catecholamines. It's the most important common presentation of CPVT is a CD, is a young people, 3 to 16 years of age. And what actually happens is these people undergo swimming or a physical activity like they're playing a game or something, they fall unconscious. And actually what happens is during the running or exertion, they develop a polymorphic VT and this is stimulated by a catecholamines and that is why it is called as a catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So they develop, how do you identify them on exercise? Sometimes you uh, see that ventricular ectopy develops. Now, this is a patient on uh, such a patient who has a normal ECG at rest. That is the important thing. If you take an ECG for them on a normal person, they'll be absolutely normal. They'll be like this. Now, this is a patient on exertion. They start developing ventricular ectopy. The important thing is they develop ventricular ectopy approximately at the same heart rates. Like, for example, a person is prone to develop at 110, he starts developing at 110. And so, ventricular ectopics frequently at the same morphology or multiple morphology related to polymorphic VT and sudden death. It's a very important risk factor and there's a candidate for young people, candidates for ICD. Second question is sometimes you see patients with syncope. They just come to an ECG, show some VPCs. Now, can, what about what to do about them? Are VPCs dangerous to be going uh, seriously take about all VPCs? So one such example. This is a patient who was in a normal ECG but developed a ventricular uh, ectopic and that led to a rhythm like this, a ventricular fibrillation, and this patient was losing consciousness repeatedly. Young lady, uh, unconscious time many times. Now, this occurs because this concept is called as a late couple VPC. Now, what actually happens is a VPC by itself, every VPC is not harmful. We see VPC is very common. But some of the VPCs which are late, that means they come very late, they fall on the T waves and they trigger the, and they follow the, cardiac cycle at a vulnerable period and they lead to a ventricular fibrillation like this and sudden death. So it is the late couple VPCs. About, uh, these are the ones which are harmful and they should be, especially if they are syncopal, one should definitely think about them. This is a patient, uh, just to show the uh, measurements, I am giving you a tracing of this patient in the EP lab. Same patient which I showed the previous ECGs, a normal sinus rhythm, normal beat, normal beat, normal beat, then leads to a ventricular ectopy at a cycle length of, uh, at a, sorry, a coupling interval of 371 milliseconds and then this leads to a ventricular fibrillation and this is non-sustained but uh, can be sustained and cause sudden death. Now, I'm just uh, giving one more, uh, uh, this is completely changing gears of the inhibited syndromes. Now, these are the ECGs one should be particularly looking for. A patient with syncope, right bundle branch block, ST elevation, especially in the V1, and these patients, if they have a syncope, you should take it very seriously. These come under the category of inherited syndromes of sudden death. The, um, as you can see on a magnified screen, the ST elevation in V2 and V1, and is a peculiar ST elevation. This is not like the myocardial infarction ST elevation. They're very peculiar, but these are a little uh, rare, so it's difficult to remember them and always, but they occur in young people. And this was described as a Brugada syndrome, what I showed you. It was discovered in 1992 by the Brugada brothers, Joseph, Pedro and Raman. And they uh, described paper where they said, high sudden cardiac death in patients presenting with syncope and spontaneously appearing type 1 ECG. So these are different types of ECGs. Some of them are induced, some of them are spontaneous. So what is now understood by the cardiology community is that patients who have a spontaneous Brugada kind of pattern and syncope, these are the patients who are at high risk of death. Now, why is it spontaneous? Because there are some conditions which can induce a Brugada pattern. One is a fever. In fact, uh, many of the children who are actually picked up on ECG, abnormal ECGs of Brugada are during fever. They have high fever and somebody takes an ECG for palpitations and they re realize that there is a Brugada pattern. Once the fever subsides, they are uh, also subsides. Now, actually, temperature-related Brugada is very important because infusion of hot saline, warm saline during the cardiac cath lab is a way to induce the Brugada pattern. So temperature is an important thing. Other things like class 1 antiarrhythmic drugs, flaconide, enconide, some drugs like lithium, tricyclic antidepressants, antihistamines, okay, all this induce Brugada. So in this case, the induced Brugada, the, the risk is supposed to be or thought to be less than a spontaneous Brugada and syncope. Now, 
completely changing gears just because this uh, may not occur in the young people, but somebody needs to know is uh, sometimes we see patients with LBVB and RBVB. Now, there are some situations where in the same ECG you see a bundle branch block which is alternating one to other. Now, these are very dangerous kind of uh, rhythm if you see. The reason is this. Now, what it means is the left bundle is diseased. That's why patient is having left bundle branch block. Sorry. The right bundle is diseased. So, there is a right bundle branch block. So, both the bundles are diseased. So, that means, imagine if the person has both the bundles blocks at one day, then what will happen is, he will not just have a complete heart block, but he will have a systole or a flat line. So, that is why it is important to realize that these are one of the dangerous things, but I think one should remember. Now, this is another condition where one should realize on the, when pick up on the ECG. At the end of the QRS, you can see what is called as uh, a special a late waves. These are the epsilon waves. These indicate... Uh, one of the conditions which is called as uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And uh, this is a subtle finding. And uh, this is because of a fibrous uh, infiltration of the fatty tissue into the RV. And sometimes uh, this particular ECG, there is a VT, patient present with the VT, RV, OT, VT kind of morphology. Subtle changes in the ECG, they are not as gross as I showed in the previous ECG. But they these should suspect one to have an ARVD. The diagnosis is because basically on an MRI, you can see a dilatation of the an outpoaching of the right ventricle. And then you can also see scarring or late gadolinium enhancement of the RV uh, inflow especially. And the important thing is they may misquander as a simple RV OTVT and patient may be taken up for ablation, for a curative ablation. But uh, one should be very uh, careful in looking, picking up these patients because these are candidates for risk of sudden death. Whereas a typical RVOTVT is not a risk, has doesn't have much of risk of sudden death, and they are ablatable and curable. Now, so coming to the end of the talk, uh, syncope can be a warning sign for occurrence of SCD. This is a very important thing one must remember. Now, having said that, please remember the commonest syncope in this world is a vasovagal syncope, which has a normal ECG, but uh, and a normal echo. That's the commonest cause of uh, vasovagal, but. Vasovagal syncope doesn't cause death, sudden death, mostly. It is a benign condition, unless it causes a head injury. Uh, on the other hand, there are some case, case of syncope which can be warning self occurrence. They are rare, they are less common, but one should be vigilant because one cannot miss these things, especially in the young people. The ECG may offer specific clues as I have shown in different conditions from coronary artery disease to inherited syndrome of sudden death. The subtle ECG count and ECG is an expensive investigation and must be certainly taken for all patients with syncope. Now, this is really a word of warning. Many patients with seizures undergo a complete neurological evaluation, expensive neurological evaluation, but never have an ECG. So, I think everybody with a seizure or syncope, either of them must have an ECG. Inherited syndromes of SCD, they are very rare. Needs to be identified, lakes a specialized training, but should be identified. So, these are the conditions which I look for. Brugada, LQTS, CPVT, idiopathic VF, ARVD, all these things I showed examples of sudden death. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to talk to you. I agree, as usual, it was uh, wonderful listening to you. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, when we have uh, syncope patients, we know that in young uh, people having syncope, vast majority of them might turn out to be uh, benign in nature, vasovagal or neurocardiogenic syncope. And uh, the other extreme is that they can be very, very malignant and uh, be a precursor to sudden cardiac death. And uh, often at a first glance, uh, the ECG uh, taken is uh, appears near normal. Now, what all do you do uh, in terms of ECG in a young person who otherwise is structurally functionally normal heart? And we are trying to essentially identify channelopathies. Uh, 
in terms of ECG uh, pickup. So you've covered most of them, but I think, you know, when you have subtle pre-excitation, uh, it becomes often challenging for the physician to pick up. And even in terms of Brugada, uh, there is a suspicion that it is abnormal. Uh, then we ask them to take uh, the precordial leads one space higher and trying to bring out the Brugada pattern. Uh, in case of long QT, we then sometimes ask them to do a stress test and see whether the QT, which is borderline looking, whether that uh, stress test will help us to identify clearly whether the QT is prolonged. So how would you approach these situations? Dr. Amit, and uh, I know by not coming to Arangad, who I missed? Seeing you for a long time. Sir, see, the thing is, uh, you, you actually uh, asked the question and brought out a lot of uh, pointers yourself. Now, a patient who comes uh, with uh, an ECG, which is normal, and a syncope, I think the most important thing you should go before the ECG is history. Uh, because that a, a detailed history, a repeated history of uh, the patients who witness syncope is extremely important. Because during Brugada, I did mention about some of the precipitants that occur uh, in real life, like a fever and other things. So many times you ask the a detailed history, you come with a very coincidental thing that whenever the child has a fever, there is something happening in the uh, child or uh, something which precipitated by fever. That is one thing that gives you a, a lot of uh, inputs. And that is the same thing, what you said. The long QT, as you know, there are some specific histories. Like, you know, some patients, there are some long QTs where the sound, the, uh, during Diwali, crackers, patient has a syncope and all these things. Swimming is one of the triggers. So there are specific triggers for all these uh, things. I think uh, rather than ECG alone, the pre before the ECG, which will give us a lot of clues as to which inherited syndrome we are going to look for. Now, having said that, then, of course, then there are provocative tests, which you are uh, wrong to ask. They are, uh, we use class 1 antiarrhythmics, flecainide, certainly use to bring out the Brugada pattern in uh, these uh, people who are, who are prone to the Brugada pattern. I think, uh, and if you are uh, very, WPW, the subtle pre-excitation then, you know, you, the, and palpitations, certainly there is no harm in doing an EP study to look at the pathways because external holter will certainly bring out, in some case, this is a new thing that we have, we can easily do a two-week holter, four-week holter, that gives a lot of information about the ECGs which are intermittent pre-excitation we miss, and of course, the final thing is an EP study to bring out a uh, axillary pathways in WPW. I think there's something. Having said that, I did answer, but I agree with you that uh, uh, at the bottom after 20 years, I feel that it is a challenging thing if you don't find anything. I'll be happy uh, to hear if uh, Ashish or you have any more things that I have missed. Hi, Greg. One question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, many, uh, and it may be relevant uh, to a lot of practicing guys as to asymptomatic pre-excitation. Uh, incidentally recorded ECGs for, and that happens more abroad also and maybe here also for school clinics or whatever, uh, or for younger people when they join the job, they have to undergo some kind of fitness. So you record a asymptomatic, uh, you record a WPW and uh, patient has no symptoms. So what is the current take on how do you go about it? Hey, uh question that has been uh, as asked in this uh, kind of fora for the last 15 years with different answers, as you also will agree with me. Now, the thing is, uh, I feel like this, in the pre-ablation, uh, let me talk about this way, the pre-ablation era, the way to distinguish this was to do two things. One thing is those patients who had intermittent pre-excitation were thought to have less risk and so left alone. Similarly, patients who are put on a treadmill, and if the treadmill, the uh, uh, WPW pre-excitation disappeared, they are again thought to be less stressed. Again, clearly the subsequent large studies, Caponi and others, have shown that this is not true. And also because the success rates, the EP studies uh, risk has become so low that doing a diagnostic EP study, the risk is very low. And so has the success rates of ablation. 25% plus and the risks have been less than 1%. So all this have made uh, also objective data like refractory periods of the axillary pathways and uh, the finding of uh, the 
the conduction between the atrial ventricle through the axillary process, what rate they are able to conduct. These factors have led to the EP stratification of these patients with asymptomatic WW. Particularly people who are working and high-risk professions uh, and young people, all these people, certainly these are very important. So what happens is if you had go to the EP lab and you are pacing the atria and it is conducting through the X-ray pathway at 270 beats per minute or faster, that means that the X-ray pathway is at a risk of conducting to VF. And another way is if you induce AF, if you see the fastest uh, or the shortest RR interval or the fastest uh, conduction of the AF, again, that would, similarly to these uh, rates, would tell you that a VF would also conduct so fast. And I think, uh, bottom line, uh, to answer your question, I think you should take up these patients asymptomatic for a EP study for a risk stratification. That is what the literature says at the current point in time. Thank you, uh, Ajit. Dr. Rao, for your what? excellent talk. What? Uh, we have very little time. Last question. Just last question. Uh, in a symptomatic patient who was detected to have LG, LGL syndrome, what is the risk of sudden cardiac death or any arrhythmia occurring? See, uh, to my knowledge, literature-wise, it, it, uh, this is, uh, uh, it is so rare, lane gonang levine syndrome so rare. I think I um, offhand not, do not have any particular uh, uh, data to uh, tell you what is the exact risk of sudden death, but in general, these things are less than 0.1%. Uh, in the long run. So that is what the risk is. Thank you, Dr. Rao, for your excellent talk. Now we go to the uh, next talk. I make one announcement here. Because of some logistic compulsions, we uh, are we are supposed to have lunch at this point in time, but we have one lecture followed by lunch. So please uh, put up with us. This lecture will be by Dr. Narasimhan, who is uh, one of the senior most, most experienced uh, electrophysiologist of the country. Uh, I, I don't have to uh, tell much about him. Most of you may be knowing about him. Being in Hyderabad, he's, uh, he's, he's closely connected with, with Aurangabad. So he, we're going to interrupt this uh, uh, train of uh, uh, the topics because his topic is related to ICDs. So the topic will be a little different from this theme right now. With little interruption, but nevertheless, We'll go ahead and listen to uh, Dr. Narsimha. Thank you very much, uh, Ajit, for this uh, kind invitation. I'm sorry I'm not able to be with my friends uh, Amit, uh, Shish, and you. Uh, pardon me for that. Uh, I was tasked to talk about the how to manage ICD shocks. So if you take patients, the ICD shocks are not benign. They significantly increase the mobility as well as the mortality following a shock, whatever the cause of the shock. Now, why do patients with ICD develop a shock? ICD is supposed to prevent sudden death and sudden death is predominantly because of VT or VF. So this is an analysis of all the ICD patients who came with shocks. And they found that 60% of these patients had appropriate shocks for ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. This is what the ICD is supposed to do. It has done its job very well. But in the next other 40% of the patients, there were lead-related problems. The device thought there was a VTBF when there was none. It was a noise from the lead, it's an oversensing, so on and so forth. That happened in about 13%. And supraventricular tachycardia like atrial flutter, fibrillation, those things were mistakenly treated as VT or VF by the device because the rates were too fast and the device gave the shock. And a small percentage of these patients had VTs which would have spontaneously terminated had we just waited for a second longer but the device gave the shock. They are non-sustained VTs. So let us see how to manage this. So first of all, we need to understand whether the shock was necessary, whether it was unnecessary for a non-sustained VT or an inappropriate programming, or whether it was inappropriate due to false sensing by the device or a supraventricular tachycardia being mistaken as VT. 
and how often does it occur approximately over 5 years period of time a third of our patients will develop shocks one way or the other and uh, uh, 50% of them are likely to be inappropriate so what are the causes of icd shocks so when a patient comes to you with an icd shock first and foremost to understand why he got a shock go back and look at the device to understand whether the shock is because of ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation or whether it was a short lasting non sustained bt where it almost terminated but the device went on because it's committed it gave a shock or it was a tolerated bt well tolerated bt at a rate of 150 and uh, which could have been terminated without a shock by adp but the device was wrongly programmed inappropriate shocks could be because of supraventricular tachycardia in a young person this often is running when the patient runs and the heart rate goes up sinus tachycardia this is seen in patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy very often or supraventricular tachycardia like avrt or atrial flutter fibrillation or it's a signal misinterpretation uh, where it's due to a t wave being over sensed as an r wave or a far field atrial electrogram being sensed by the ventricle so on and so forth or where there is a leak in the circuit and the extraneous noise like a electrical wall plug the 60 hertz noise from the uh, ac mains was sensed by the device and it thought it was bf and gave a shock occasionally just like you hear about phantom limb in an amputated patient patients who have experienced one shock can have a panic and come with a recurrent shock like feeling but the device will not show any shocks it will show that everything was normal they are called phantom shocks so when you interrogate the device you may find a heart rate that is rapid either due to a ventricular rhythm or a supraventricular rhythm very rarely A rapid supraventricular tachycardia can trigger a VT or VF, so you can have a dual tachycardia. So device interrogation will help you to ascertain what is going on. When you find there is no tachycardia, but the device was sensing an intracardiac signal twice, a P wave that was sensed again and again. One P wave was sensed twice. and that can okay. lead on to double coagulation i have a talked in our pv lower sensing double counting of waves can occur or there's some noise coming up from the hall let me just uh, go mute it so am i audible now Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Okay. Am I audible? So diagnosis of um, the problem. is mainly from like any other clinical story by history ecg if you see a running flutter or fibrillation on the resting ecg it will tell you what is going on if you suspect a leak fracture a chest x ray or fluoroscopy can tell us what's going on and then the other ancillary investigations for example as you would see any other patient was it an electrolyte disorder long qt which was causing drug induced proarrhythmia evaluate the patient excuse me sir then unable to see your yes am i audible yes okay so device may have to be reprogrammed if it's a very short detection window non sustained vts may like and be 12 beats shouldn't be sensed as vt and vf doctor, doctor. and inappropriate triggering of a therapy should not occur so you prolong the detection can you 
Can you can you hear? And me? yes, uh, you are. Uh, we are not able to see your slide. Are you sharing your screen? I'll reshare. How about now? Yes, yes. Okay. So to first troubleshoot. Like any other patient with history, ECG, and device interrogation, if you suspect a knee fracture or fluoroscopy, and prolong the detection, you should be keep a very aggressive detection. We'll show you the data why this is important. In elderly persons, when your foot is causing a problem, you can have device discriminators to differentiate A foot versus BP and uh, tell the device not to give a shock if there is a lot of RR variability. Or sudden onset will tell you that it's VT versus sinus tachycardia will be very gradual. So the mode of onset will help the device to withhold therapy if it is due to sinus tachycardia. So these things can be done. If a person has rapid atrial tachycardia or fibrillation, you can increase the dose of digoxin or AV nodal blocking agents. Add other amiodarone or sotal. Remember, all these patients, when you optimize atrial, I mean heart failure, arrhythmia episodes come down. So, if the device is giving therapy in a person with uh, uncontrolled heart failure, control the heart failure. If it's recurrent angina, you can use angina. I mean, medications for angina and some sedatives so that the patient doesn't panic once there is a shock. There is a non-drug management is also. Advisable when the device uh, fails to give a shock, an external shock can be given, and we will uh, look at the role of RF ablation in these patients. Sympathetic blockade is another option. So whenever a person comes to us, you understand what the problem is. If the problem is a recurrent VT which is triggering shock, optimize therapy for heart failure using Arni, Aldactone, and optimize beta blockade. Add amiodarone or mexiltine as a combination so that you can suppress the arrhythmia. But beware that high dose of amiodarone is only for short term. If your dose escalation is required to control the VT, you need to consider VT ablation in these patients. So again, to look at the inappropriate ICD shocks for SVTs, it can be because of atrial fibrillation, where the device looks at irregular RR but rapid, and here reprogramming the device may help. You can look at the variability can be switched on so that it withholds therapy for atrial fibrillation. Mode of onset will be gradual in sinus tachycardia. That can be switched on and the device can withhold therapy for sinus tachycardia. So AF look at stability and morphology discrimination. Morphology discrimination that is the template. It takes the template of the QRS during sinus and compares it during BT, so-called BT. And if it's identical, it can withhold therapy. And as I told you, it looks at the way the RR interval accelerates. If it's very abrupt from 80 beats, suddenly it has become 170 beats the next beat. Then it will consider it as VT and give therapy. But if the heart rate is rising from 80, 90, 100, 110, it will uh, diagnose it as uh, sinus tachycardia and it will withhold therapy. Again, other measures to prevent ICD shocks. Rate control with beta blocker and amiodarone, rhythm control if possible with cardioversion and amiodarone. And for patients who have CRTD or ICD, very elderly people, just AV node ablation is a very useful therapy anyway because they have a device. And curative therapy is simple for atrial flutter, fibrillation, and avian arteries, some of these patients nowadays. At the same time, you need to look at whether the device is inappropriately sensing the P wave in the ventricular channel or T wave in the uh, it will count one R wave and additional T wave and therefore a heart rate of 90 will be misinterpreted as 180. R wave if it's uh, splintered and uh, mm -hmm. say there are double peaks it can mm -hmm. sense it as two R waves. So these things need to be avoided. And uh, if the lead shows very rapid uh, RR intervals in the range of 140, 150, you need to think of lead fracture. Nowadays, several companies give you lead integrity alert to warn you that it's probably lead fracture. You need to take definitive action for this. 
in terms of correcting the set screw or uh, changing a fresh rate sensing lead uh, for these patients. T-way over sensing can be overcome by changing some of the algorithms where there is a differential filter which will uh, suppress the T-wave and amplify the QRS. That will help to overcome the uh, T-wave over sensing. Um, this is a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy, post ICD, two shocks in washroom while having a bath. You can see a very rapid signal both in the atrial and in the ventricular channel at the same time, misinterpreted as VF, and therefore a shock therapy was given. But if you look at it, this degree of rapid uh, uh, cycling, suggests there is an electromagnetic uh, interference either from a wall plug or poorly insulated electrical current from the wall. You need to kind of reprogram the device and ask the patient to make sure that his, all his home appliances are adequately insulated. So, in short, look at uh, the noise in all the channels, EMI, and uh, look at uh, avoiding these uh, uh, poorly insulated circuits. This patient again had uh, uh, this kind of a rapid ventricular sensing in the ventricular electrogram and uh, this again suggests it could be a lead fracture because of uh, very short cycle lengths and uh, whereas the far field shows that it is uh, not picking up the signals. When it's seen only in the near field, not in the far field, it suggests it's a lead integrity issue and you need to correct this by identifying whether it's a fracture or uh, some problem with the lead. T-wave oversensing is more common in smaller ventricles when the lead straddles the, uh, if for example, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the big T-waves, and there are differential algorithms which are now available to suppress the T-wave sensing. So parameters that can be altered in the device, you can, for example, for these slow VTs, you can increase the detection of threshold for non-sustained VT, you can tell the device to ignore short-lasting VTs by increasing the number of intervals for VT. And there are discriminators which you can be strong to differentially, I mean, tell the device to suppress the therapy for sinus tachycardia, atrial flutter infibulation. And as far as possible, 70% of VTs can be terminated by appropriate anti-tachycardia pacing. Please make sure you switch this on before a shock is delivered uh, so that the number of shocks can be minim minimized in most of the patients. And there are several trials now which looked at programming a long detection window uh, so that uh, you can delay the therapy uh, to 2.5 second delay uh, compared to conventional one second delay and uh, having the DVT detection above 180 beats per minute so that it doesn't uh, give therapy for slow VTs. And this kind of programming has shown a benefit in terms of not only reducing the shock, but in maritarity it has shown improvement in mortality also in these patients. So excess shocks, whatever be the reasons, cause problems that they have a direct uh, impact on heart failure as well as uh, uh, increase in total mortality. When everything fails and you are, this is something I want to emphasize. If you go on escalating a combination of therapy to suppress, we lull into a sense of satisfaction that everything is all right. But please remember these patients, they one day during a fever or when they have some other problem, they go to a BT storm. So if there is a need for escalating continuous combination of uh, antiarrhythmic therapy, you need to think of the patient has a concomitant severe heart failure, send them for transplant or LVAD, or for patients with relatively preserved ventricular function, VT ablation is a very uh, uh, definitive therapy which is available for a lot of patients. One common mistake, even in a patient with a small scar, they have multiple exits and multiple VTs can be seen of different morphology. So multiple morphology VT doesn't mean they can't be ablated. The scar sets, lesion set may be very small that is required. If it exits from this, it will show an apical exit, a basal exit, a lateral exit, and a septal exit. 
a small set of lesions around this area will completely eliminate all the VTs in this subset of patients. And this is an initial work we had done. Unfortunately, we couldn't continue, showing that the ablation is quite effective in this subset of patients. For atrial fibrillation, again, when none of the drug therapy is working, especially for heart failure, persistent atrial fibrillation has shown reduction in mortality uh, when you achieve sinus rhythm by non-pharmacological means. So in summary, therapy reduction programming is extremely useful in ICDs, especially implanted for primary prevention that results in less than 30% lower risk of death, mortality reduction, and as well as 50% reduction in inappropriate shocks. And uh, when a person comes with a shock, interrogate the device, understand whether it's appropriate or inappropriate. Medical treatment with beta blocker and antiarrhythmic therapy for appropriate shocks, device programming to extend the detection and suppress the false detection for atrial flutter and SVTs. For drug-resistant uh, patients, consider catheter ablation or uh, transplant as the last option. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Thanks, thanks, Narsiman. Uh, uh, we really missed you here. But uh, that was a great presentation and uh, a good overview as to how to manage because now this is becoming very frequent. ICDs are being implanted frequently. Uh, the physician cardiology community is seeing these patients uh, and when they come up with frequent shock, uh, ICD shocks, we need effective strategies and uh, has been very well summarized. Is there any question from the audience? I think uh, we thank Narsiman for the masterly presentation. Thank you, Narsiman. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Nice seeing you after a long time. You can see the screen, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, you can start. But I can start? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me, Ajit? Yes, yes. Am I audible, Ajit? Well, audible. Okay. So, thank you, Ajit, for this invitation. Uh, unfortunately, I could not make it, but uh, I have been listening to the lectures from the morning time. And uh, it's really a good uh, program that you have set. So, getting to my topic is recurrent polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Uh, why and how is, should the approach be different? And I have to acknowledge the help of my EP fellow, Dr. Yagnik, for preparing this talk. So, polymorphic VT, by definition, is a VT in which the QRS changes from beat to beat. But like atrial flutter, uh, you may, where you may not see an isoelectric baseline in some and you may see an isoelectric baseline in another. Similarly, in polymorphic VT, we have to look at the entire 12 leads. A single monitor strip may fool you and a polymorphic VT may look like a monomorphic VT. That's my first important message. Polymorphic VT by definition is pretty rapid, usually more than 200 per minute. And But there is a clearly defined QRS. And there are two eventualities. Either it terminates spontaneously and if it doesn't, it rapidly degenerates into ventricular fibrillation. So, let's look at this illustrating the two points I made. One, look at the first initial seven or eight beats before it degenerates into what is obviously VF. In the first seven or eight beats, you may be mistaken in thinking this is a rapid monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. But the moment you look at lead AVF, you find from the fourth beat onwards, it's clearly changing morphology. And not only that, if you look at the middle of the screen, what is obviously in lead to a ventricular fibrillation may still look in lead V2 like an organized ventricular rhythm. Therefore, do not be fooled on a single monitor strip as Amit Vora always has taught in an arrhythmia, try to get as many leads as possible. And more important, this also shows you how rapidly a polymorphic VT degenerates into ventricular fibrillation 
and therefore in polymorphic vt don't wait don't react but act luckily many polymorphic vt terminates spontaneously but do not wait on a monitor strip think this is monomorphic and you will try drugs go for the defibrillator d comes before a b c of resuscitation importantly polymorphic vt in different patients can have a totally different approach therefore knowing the underlying substrate or the underlying trigger is very important when one is treating polymorphic vt and why do polymorphic vt is need an individualized approach whether it's any etiology or come to the etiologies of polymorphic vt which are many the ecg may look the same during vt but therapies may be radically different importantly polymorphic vt may herald a vt storm which narsimhan did speak about and most important amiodarone the most widely used and abused intravenous drug may be useful in some polymorphic vts but may be disastrous in other polymorphic vts especially as you all know in the qt prolongation subsets so let's look at the etiologies of polymorphic vt this chart a little busy but encompasses the entire topic of mine so polymorphic vt let's look at the first the long qt syndrome one of long qt syndrome which in adult practice is more commonly what is called what used to be called and is still called an acquired long qt which may be triggered by disease or drugs or a congenital long qt and the treatment again is quite different in congenital and acquired so if it is long qt syndrome then you have the classical torsad which has a typical ecg pattern but in long qt if you do not have long if you so long qt syndrome has torsad but if there is no long qt then you look for structural or organic heart disease if it's present the common subset is ischemia which leads to ischemic we'll see examples of these or something what is called the angry purkinje syndrome purkinje fibers are quite excitable and in disease states whether it is ischemia or inflammation or certain drugs they can cause these purkinje fibers to start firing in a random manner and lead to polymorphic vt now if you do not have long qt if you don't have organic heart disease then we look at congenital or genetic channelopathies or other such etiologies which occur in a structurally normal heart and the commoner ones amongst them are the brugada syndrome which is not as common in india as it is in southeast asia but nonetheless we do see examples of brugada syndrome rarely the short qt syndrome where paradoxically the drug of choice is something that prolongs the qt like quinidine and otherwise we have any do any of these there is an entity called idiopathic ventricular fibrillation we'll see examples of these the early repolarization which is malignant where there gross concave upward st elevation in the inferior and the lateral leads a small subset of these can be dangerous most of the time early repolarization is benign we have the idiopathic rvot vt which we have all seen in young people most of the time it is do it may cause syncope it doesn't cause death however there are some of these which cause polymorphism and i'll show an example and the most common in adult practice for all of us is drug induced polymorphic vt especially in today's day and age of older sicker patients with polypharmacy when you have exercise induced polymorphic vt think first in a young person of catecholaminergic polymorphic vt which may be physical exercise or sometimes even emotional stress then of course the commonest is ischemic we have see examples and incidental polymorphic vt or idiopathic vt which could be exercise induced and don't forget the mimics always we talk about fbi atrial fibrillation pre excitation 
and ICCU artifacts. Please be aware of these. And we see example of this also. So let's look at this polymorphic VT. And you all will make out in lead to the triggering premature complex that causes both the initial non-sustained VT and then the sustained VT occurs actually at the end of the T wave. <laughs> These are what we call as late PVCs. And when it occurs so long after, when the T wave is getting over, you look at the QT interval and this is the classical torsad. This is the way torsad usually initiates. Even another lady who's hypertensive on polypharmacy, recurrent syncope from Cyan Hospital, who came with polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And again, you see the T wave is already over. It's in the downs. After the T wave, the PVC comes and triggers the polymorphic VT. If you look at this lady's ECG, she has not only a very long QT, but very prominent U waves. And she was found to have both hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. Torsad was first described by Desertel. Yes, you have muted yourself. Can you can you hear me? Yes, you are. Am I am I, am I audible now? Uh, yeah, now you are audible. Okay, sorry. So the QT, when there is a heart rate variation, the QT doesn't adapt and doesn't adapt as quickly. That is what causes this short, long, short or long, short sequences to trigger of torsad. And at the cellular level, it involves most of the time what are called early after depolarizations. So look at this example of this middle-aged woman. And look how these episodes of non-sustained polymorphic VT are preceded by a longer RR interval. So this shows you the long shot or the short long shot in some instances initiation. You'll also notice that this is a lady who has complete AV block with a narrow QRS escape rhythm. Now we always think a narrow QRS escape rhythm is benign. But the people who die with narrow QRS complete AV block die more often because of torsad than because of asystole. Please remember that. And treating the bradycardia with a pacemaker not only shortens the QT, but eliminates the ectopics and prevents sudden death. This is a common subset in adult practice. Drug-induced long QT and torsad. But remember that, I mean, many people take azithromycin. I don't want to alarm you. But probably there are some with genetic polymorphisms. And one-third of the people who develop drug-induced torsad on genetic testing have to be have been found to have the genetic defects that are associated and you had a wonderful lecture today on that with with QT prolongation. And here you see a malignant sign and sinus rhythm. If you look at the lead three, you look very nicely at the T wave alternance. Now T wave alternance when it occurs or even in lead one, the alternance doesn't necessarily mean alternance exactly opposite direction, but you have one very large T wave and what smaller T wave is enough to call it T wave alternance. And this is a particularly sinister sign which can trigger cardiac arrest. And sometimes only giving beta blockers if it's congenital long QT is good enough, but sometimes in acquired long QT you have to do the opposite. You have to increase the heart rate by giving isoprene. So therefore knowing the subset is very important. The treatment may be exactly opposite. This is another example of not only polymorphic VT, but later on followed by alternating QRS complexes. And this is what we call bidirectional ventricular tachycardia. This is in a young man with myocarditis and heart failure. That bidirectional VT in the olden days was seen with digoxin toxicity, which we rarely see now because we don't use digoxin much, but we and we know how to use it in a more sensible manner. And rarely can be also seen in other conditions, typically in catecholaminergic VT. 
as seen in this man who has exertional syncope. This is also bidirectional QRS complexes, but this is in a young man without structural heart disease because of catecholaminergic VT. So catecholaminergic VT is a genetic disease, which is usually caused by uh, alterations in the ryanodine gene. And it can be polymorphic, it can be bidirectional, or sometimes even monomorphic. And the common triggers are exercise or emotional stress. And think of this as one of the causes in young people who have exertional syncope. Simple beta blockade saves lives. And in some cases, you may have to use other drugs or even perform cardiac sympathetic denervation. One of the most common subsets, as Amit says, a majority of cardiac arrests in the community are because of coronary artery disease. And this occurs uh, typically because of ischemia, uh, where in this particular patient with an uh, inferior wall myocardial infarction, you can see onset of ventricular fibrillation. And of course, if we look at the arrhythmias in acute MI, then primary ventricular fibrillation, that means the first 24 or even the first 48 hours sometimes, uh, is seen in about 3% of acute MIs. Uh, which come to hospital. Many of those who die at home and, you know, one-third of the acute, in MI, one-third of the deaths occur even before reaching hospital. So, therefore, these, these possibly most likely had primary ventricular fibrillation. And this data has come from those patients who had some recording device when they died out of hospital even before reaching. But if quickly defibrillated, they have a fair prognosis. Polymorphic VT, which soon goes into VF, is also seen in 1-2% to of patients. But the VT, VF, which occurs 48 hours or more after MI, which is called secondary or late VF, has a bad prognosis and is usually associated with left ventricular dysfunction. As opposed to that, monomorphic VT is rare, is rare in acute MI, but if it does occur, it has a bad prognosis. This is a large MI in which the large area of infarct conducts slowly and electrically behaves like a scar. This is a polymorphic VDT degenerating very soon into VF, which had occurred during the recovery phase of a stress test. The patient complained of severe angina in stage 1. The stress test was stopped. You can see remarkable ST elevation, depression, remarkable ST depression, which is downsloping in lead two, slight widening of the QRS complex, ST elevation in AVR and AVL, this patient had a very proximal LAD disease and degenerated into VTVF, fortunately was immediately defibrillated. Then that aconite content can be high and can produce life-threatening arrhythmias of all types, including AV blocks. Now, this is a patient who is at present admitted with us in the ICU of Holy Family. A man with an old, young man with an old anterior MI, severe left ventricular dysfunction and old LAD angioplasty. He's had scar VT in the past and has a single chamber ICD. Unfortunately, he had come with a limb ischemia because of embolism possibly from the left ventricle, though there was no thrombus found on echo. It must have been a fresh thrombus which which embolized. There was no atrial fibrillation. He, he, he unfortunately underwent a left above knee amputation a few weeks ago. And now he's come in VT storm. Now look at this. The, the VT on the left is a, is a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. But the VT on the right is a it's multiple forms. You can call it pleomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And sometimes in the second in the second strip, it also shows polymorphic. In the same strip, it keeps changing. So all, all types of ventricular arrhythmias can occur during a ventricular tachycardia storm. He had multiple, multiple shocks from the defibrillator. We had to put a magnet, silence it, give him external shocks. He was given all possible antiarrhythmic drugs. He's on, he was on a combination of amiodarone, beta blockers, lignocaine, 
which was later changed to mexilatine, but he had drug refractory VT storms, electrolytes normal, QTE normal. In desperation, though he was on antiplatelets, we had tried a he was an anticoagulant because of the limb ischemia, but we had to omit one dose and do an emergency stellate ganglion block uh, in the in the ICU. And that did seem to work for 12 hours, but then the VT storm again started. Finally, we had to re we had to intubate him, paralyze him. That seemed to at least reduce the number of VTs. He again went into a VT storm, and then we had to perform a, we had two options, either do a radio frequency ablation, but then he already had one iliac artery blocked and the other already had a little thrombus. So we couldn't afford to risk that. So we did a sympathectomy. Our surgeon did a video assisted thoracoscopic uh, denervation of T1 to T4 bilaterally. At least five days have uh, gone. Last four days he's completely VT free. He's been extubated. Uh, starting to get mobilized. So you have to do a lot of things sometimes in a VT storm. Don't give up. Messages do not give up. This is a patient who has no heart disease. She's a woman who gets syncope. And she's found, luckily, the cause of syncope was found on this, monit on this ECG trace. You can see these recurring episodes of polymorphic VT typically have a short, long, short sequence. This is a particular danger, but here there is no QT prolongation. No QT prolongation and yet polymorphic VT. This is another woman with a structurally normal heart, young. Look at the ECG, look at lead one, the QT is normal, nothing echocardiogram normal, QRS narrow, who gets recurrent, she's had more than 100 episodes of short coupled torsad. So as opposed to the previous torsad which I showed you where the ectopic would come after a long T wave, here it comes pretty close to the QRS complex. In this type of patient who she had received ICD and multiple shocks, what dramatically, what dramatically relieved her was quinine. And the reason why we gave quinine is we did not have quinidine. Sadly, a drug manufactured in India but not available here. We finally with grit because with quinine she was relieved of the heart. But in two weeks she got synchronism with help from Dr. One of our colleagues in Israel. He, he sent quinidine from Israel and she's getting quinidine and is relieved for the last three months, not had a single episode of ventricular fibrillation. Otherwise all other anti arrhythmic drugs had failed. This is another woman who had come with recurrent syncope. She had right ventricular outflow tract ectopics, a normal echo. She also undergone MRI and angiogram. They were normal. There was no family history of sudden death. And you can see the ectopics. They look benign in the long strip, single couplet. But then if you look later on, you get a polymorphic VT, better seen in lead V5, clearly a polymorphic VT in V5 and V6. So sometimes these right ventricular outflow tract VTs can be nasty. Fortunately, 90% of them are benign. And if you look in this lady in different times, sometimes she has a very rapid monomorphic VT, but if you look at the bottom strip, she clearly has a polymorphic VT. And, and fortunately, all these were a sick as Dr. Narsiman says, sometimes it's a single focus. So here was a single focus in the right ventricular outflow tract, which was ablated, and she has been VT free after that. And I'd like to end with this example. Uh, this is a, a, a man with a structurally normal heart who was admitted for syncope. And the resident in the ICU uh, was panicky because they saw this pattern on the monitor and this was a, a 12 lead actually a 12 lead uh, holter going on in this patient which picked this up is this really is this really ventricular fibrillation and a couple of clues one is look at the last two complexes they are normal and if this really was ventricular fibrillation 
you would find a pause, a pause between the end of the ventricular fibrillation and the normal beat. But here there's no pause. And then in the middle of the ventricular fibrillation in leads V3, V4 and V5, you see the same looking QRS complex. And if you then look carefully, you might, you do see a couple others. So this is, and look at the baseline completely wavy. So the, look at the patient, look at the pulse oximeter. Luckily, this patient was in the ICU being monitored and you say this is not VF, this is an artifact. But if this patient comes with a holter, very often artifacts, unless you look carefully, can be easily misdiagnosed as serious ventricular arrhythmias. And therefore, we always say that, you know, the, no matter what Sundar Pichai says, that they look at your eye in Google and tell you all about your, your body. Finally, medicine is still, a lot of it is an art, although it should be backed by science. Thank you. Thank you, Yash, for an excellent talk on polymorphic weeting. I have one question. Um, I have some experience, and you tell me whether it, that's correct or not, but I've seen that people, patients, who present after myocardial infarction, they come from outside, they have, they have, been, they have been thrombolized, and they have received shock for uh, probably malignant ventricular arrhythmia. Many times it's hard to know when the patients come from outside what arrhythmia they had. But when we do their angiography, when they have this, probably they have polymorphic VT in acute phase. And when you do their angiography, large number of patients turn out to have a flowing artery uh, with a good flow. Um, many of these patients are young and they are smokers. Um, I mean, is this, that arrhythmia is related to reperfusion or it's because of ischemia? I assume that you're saying that there is an underlying plaque or a little thrombus. It's not a normal angiogram. There is no question about that. Yes. So they, I think in, I think in the uh, Ajit and this pattern that you're describing, we have seen more during the post-COVID era, and clearly thrombogenicity and vasospasm, uh, these two may produce VF and. Uh, if they, if they are fortunate enough to have recanalized, then you may not find any significant underlying lesion. And uh, we know that smoking does provoke vasospasm also. But I, I, I agree with you, and I, I am distinctly of the opinion that this has become significantly more during the COVID era. Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, I, I can recall one patient. You know, most of the patients which I have seen of Torsad. Um, you know, this, this arrhythmia occurs in like short bursts, like, you know, 10 beats, 12 beats, again, normal sinus, again, 10, 10 beats, 12 beats. So, uh, how often you see a very, very sustained polymorphic VT which requires uh, shock and which is caused by some reversible agent like hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia? Is this yes. more often a short-lasting arrhythmia which recurs very frequently? In, if we take the congenital long QT syndrome, you will find that very rarely the first manifestation will be sudden death. So that correlates with what you said, that more majority of the torsad in congenital long QT syndrome are self-limiting because they are so rapid they probably die out. And that is also one of the reasons why defibrillators actually despite defibrillators in some of these genetic conditions, especially like catecholaminergic polymorphic VT. In fact, with defibrillators, there was no reduction and possibly an increase, an increase in mortality. Because what happens? That the shock, many of these VTs would have terminated spontaneously, but the defibrillator intervenes before that and delivers a shock. The, the stress of the shock causes such a catecholaminergic surge, such a anxiety, such a panic, that the long QT or the catecholaminergic VT recurs and the defibrillator will give six shocks. Most defibrillators will give six shocks for VF and then stop for some time. And that's what actually perpetuates VT and VF and can cause mortality. And the second corollary is therefore that long QT if, if a child dies of long QT, then it's probably sad 
because the previous they have been, it has been preceded by multiple episodes of near syncope or syncope which have been missed amit will recall he had a patient who was a doctor's child who had gone to some of the premier institutes of india and was on anti epileptics but as hygrief said nobody did a ecg and it was found to be long qt even in, in now coming to hypokalemia the acquired long qt ajit they are this is my impression and amit uh, or uh, others can uh, can uh, give their opinions in them the torsad often goes into vf much more than uh, in congenital long qt Rajesh here. Uh, so yeah, Rajesh. Yeah, Rajesh. Another thing is about the long QT. We've at least in the last decade and a half we've seen almost four elderly females presenting with recurrent syncopes and ill-sustained long QT, and all metabolic parameters being normal. And therapeutically, obviously, the finance is being issues. We have put in just a simple AI pacing with a fast rate as we normally do because of the dispersion of whatever the mechanisms we are talking about. What is your experience on that? That is, we are seeing it quite a bit, but we don't have any genetic data or anything to prove in those patients. Other than that, they are doing very well over years, and just atrial pacing without anything else and beta blockers, they are doing very well. I think, uh, Rajesh, I would tend to. Uh... i would like to explain for the physicians what you said and it's a very important point that the qt interval if you pace the ventricle you produce a wide qrs you don't significantly shorten the qt but if you pace the atrium with a narrow qrs you prevent bradycardia the first thing in the elderly who get uh, torsad or polymorphic vt they have some bradycardia some ectopic and a borderline qt interval some drug they take maybe a little diuretic or something else antidepressant and they land up in torsad or some antibiotic and there if you pace the atrium if you pace the atrium you not only prevent bradycardia but you shorten the qt you prevent the ectopy and by these multiple mechanisms it can be life saving so we also have several times used the uh, only an atrial based pacemaker in such patients uh, uh, with good results yeah i well, will take the last question then we'll we'll move to the next stop uh, if you see polymorphic vt or, or torsad or particularly uh, the teaching has been you replace potassium replace magnesium pace and look at the prescription uh, what drug, drugs the patient is getting and ask for if he is taking any other um, medication Uh, is it true that for a, for a general physician who is treating this are these four things uh, good enough i mean would would you recommend this in every patient who is getting recurrent torsad in if yeah if it's a, if it's a, if it's if it's an a torsad or a polymorphic vt in 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 an adult Uh, you are not thinking of congenital long qt then what you said is true even if the potassium or the magnesium levels are normal and we are not going to wait for them it is it is in the guidelines that you you go ahead and give potassium and magnesium and you may even want to increase the heart rate by isoprenaline or temporary pacing or sometimes even atropin and yeah you should give potassium and magnesium for the adult and the elderly who come with uh, long qt having said that if there is azotemia if there is azotemia or bradycardia or prolonged pr then you should not give magnesium or and potassium otherwise you should go ahead and give it yeah i yeah, agree Thank you very much and we will move to the next talk. Thank you Yash. Thank you. So we uh, move to the offline mode now. We will have next lecture by Pramit Hora sir uh, on recurrent sustained monomorphic VT.